Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Today's seminar will begin in about five minutes. We would like to invite everyone to please take your seats and please remember to put your mobile phone on silent mode. Simultaneous interpretation service is available throughout today's seminar. You can find the interpretation devices at the reception desk outside and please select channel one for Chinese and channel two for English. Thank you. 各位现场的贵宾，大家早安！提醒大家，我们今天的研讨会呢，将在大概五分钟后正式开始。那么邀请大家可以开始就坐，并且记得将您的手机调整为静音模式。另外也提醒大家，我们的研讨会在正式开始之后呢，会主要以英语进行。那我们今天有提供中英同步口译的服务，如果需要使用同步口译的设备的话呢，请凭身份证件到场外租借。中文请选第一频道，谢谢。
Ladies and gentlemen, today's seminar will begin in a couple of minutes, and we would like to take this time to remind everyone that simultaneous interpretation service is available in today's conference. So if you need to use the device, uh, it is available at the reception desk outside, and channel one is for Chinese, channel two is for English. Thank you. 啊，各位贵宾，我们今天的研讨会会在大概几分钟之后正式开始。那请大家可以开始就座。我们今天的研讨会正式开始之后呢，将主要以英语进行。那我们的研讨会全程备有中英同步口译的服务。如果需要使用口译设备的话，可以凭身份证件到场外租借。中文请选第一频道，谢谢。Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Welcome to the seminar on digital trade, supply chains, and economic security. Perspectives from Taipei and Washington. Today's forum is co-hosted by Taiwan WTO and RTA Center under CIER, as well as the Center for Strategic and International Studies (CSIS), with the support from the International Trade Administration under the Ministry of Economic Affairs, as well as the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. This seminar brings together officials, policymakers, and experts to discuss issues important both to Taiwan and the U.S., including the new frontiers trade and digital economy, building resilient supply chains, as well as preparing for and guarding against economic coercion. To kick off today's seminar, first we would like to invite President Jun Xianye of CIER for his welcome remarks. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome President Ye.
thank you. So, uh, Mr. Lee, uh, Deputy, uh, Deputy Minister of the Ministry of uh, uh, Digital Affairs, uh, Ms. Irene Murphy, and our colleague from CSIS, and distinguished guests, and ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Uh, on behalf of CIER, I uh, welcome you to today's uh, seminar with the title Digital Trade, Supply Chain, and uh, Economic Security perspectives from Taipei and Washington. And this seminar jointly organized by CIER and CSIS uh, will be covering three important topics, including digital trade, supply chain resilience, and economic securities. The objective of this seminar is to explore options to enhance collaborations between Taiwan and the United States and particularly in response to the challenges uh, posed by the current geopolitical situation and technology competitions. So let me, for, uh, let me briefly review the current status of Taiwan-US uh, corporations. So I would like to start with uh, uh, Taiwan-US trade relations. And since uh, President Biden assumed our office in 2021, and we have uh, uh, witnessed uh, significant progress being achieved in uh, deepening uh, economy and trade inter interactions between Taiwan and the United States. And the Taiwan-US bilateral relationship is not only considered a, a vital component of President Biden's strategy of Indo-Pacific uh, Region Alliance, but also reflects a shared visions and uh, a commitment to regional and global stabilities. In June, 20, uh, in, in June 2022, Taiwan and the United States initiate negotiations for the uh, 21st Century Trade Initiative, uh, marking a historic milestone in our economic and trade relationship. And we signed the first set of agreements uh, on June 1st this year, and uh, signifying an important step forward since the launch of uh, uh, trade negotiation between Taiwan and the United States. The agreement could serve as a uh, solid basis to facilitate our further collaborations in topics addressed address today. So uh, with these solid uh, foundations, um, it is time for Taiwan and the US to open up uh, policy discussions on issues that are equally important for the next decade. This is the background uh, we, we decided to pick up the themes of today's seminar. So the first topic of today's seminar uh, concerns digital trade. And it is also an, an issue that will be discussed in the following ne negotiating uh, rounds under the uh, 21st Century Trade Initiatives. And digital trade is definitely a driving force for the next generation uh, technology and economic development. So the key question is how Taiwan can enhance the cooperation with the U.S. Uh, with the U.S. and the context in the context of the trade initiatives and and the in Indo-Pacific economic frameworks and towards achieving uh, common goals among like-minded uh, partners in the digital era. So we look forward to discussing the uh, prospects for uh, deeper digital cooperation in the seminars. For such purpose, in the first section, we will focus on the themes of uh, enhancing the digital economics, uh, Indo-Pacific economic framework, and the Taiwan-US uh, 21st uh, century trade initiative. And we invite experts from both sides and to share views on what frameworks can be approached uh, for the enhanced cooperation in the area of digital trade. And what are the uh, opportunity and challenges? And we expect deeper discussions on the promotion of digital economic cooperation. So next on us, Next on the supply chain issue, the importance to Taiwan and the United States is well understood. And over the past three years, we have uh, uh, witnessed the impact 
of supply chain disruption because of the COVID-19 pandemic and uh, Russia invasion of uh, Ukraine and, and uh, the geopolitical tensions. So these developments uh, have not only dramatically affect global economic activity, but also reshape the geopolitical dynamics in the Indo-Pacific region, and which is currently a hotspot of a rivalry between China and the United States. And against this background, uh, only considering efficiency and, and low cost uh, through international division of labor and uh, specialization among nations is not, uh, is not enough anymore. It is also important to strike a balance between uh, efficiency and resilience in supply chains. And such uh, deliberations uh, has largely been pursued between uh, like-minded nations to enhance their economic security and resilience. The U.S. government uh, has also initiated the uh, French shoring strategy advocating a uh, multinational business to relocate their supply chain networks in countries and regarded as political and economic alliance uh, for the U.S. To mitigate uh, risk associated with uh, dependency on adversarial nations. And as implied by the Biden admi administration, French sharing strategy has not only been increasingly realized among Indo-Pacific nations uh, through, through the Indo-Pacific economic framework, but also uh, in Taiwan with the uh, presence of uh, uh, 21st century trade initiatives. And in the second section, we will focus on the theme of uh, uh, diversification and building up uh, resilience supply chain. And during this discussion, we expect to address how global supply chain can benefit from Taiwan's participation and what role Taiwan could play in the process of supply chain reconfiguration. And even though Taiwan is not yet a member of the supply chain agreement of the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, how can Taiwan support or essentially participate in this agreement? And we look forward to having a deeper discussions on Taiwan po uh, positions and its support in the global uh, supply chains. And this le uh, last section uh, will focus on themes of uh, addressing economic threats. This topic uh, bears, bears a particular interest and significance for Taiwan, which has been uh, confronted with uh, uh, economic coercion from China. And recently, China conducted a trade barrier investigation against Taiwan, and which uh, many people believed um, it, it is uh, political motivated uh, rather, rather than purely economic consideration. And in, o in order to interfere with Taiwan's uh, upcoming presidential elections. And in this, in this section, uh, we will focus on themes such as uh, what kind of uh, instrument uh, countries uh, may have to counter China economic co coercion and how like-minded uh, countries can collaborate uh, or to launch a mechanism to mitigate the adverse effect of uh, China e uh, economy uh, coercion. And this discussion aims to uh, present uh, strategies for the international community and to respond to China's economic threats effectively. So in conclusion, uh, we are here today uh, not only to explore critical issues in digital trade, uh, supply chain, and economic security, but also to focusing on uh, uh, strategic uh, importance of uh, cooperation and alliance between Taiwan and the uh, United States. And we look forward to jointly investigating uh, solutions in this seminar and promo uh, promoting uh, cooperation and development between Taiwan and the United States. 
and equally important as this is the first ever cooperation between CIER and CSIS. And I hope such kind of a cooperation can be made regularly. And uh, for sure, uh, we will uh, come up with a meaningful recommendation to make contribution to stability and uh, prosperity in the Indo-Pacific region and the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, President Ye. President Ye, please take your seat. And thank you to President Ye for giving us an overview on the three very important topics that we will address in today's seminar. Next, we would like to call to the stage uh, Ms. Erin Murphy, Deputy Director at CSIS, to say a few words. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ms. Murphy. Good morning, everyone. And to our online audience, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and thank you for joining us. President Ye, thank you for those remarks. Uh, Deputy Minister Lee, thank you for joining us this morning. So first, I have to start off with many thank yous um, because this could not come together and we could not have this great audience without uh, the help of a lot of folks. So the first is a big thank you to Kupang, who without their generous support, we would not be able to do this. They have provided CSIS with uh, generous funding for us to be able to host a series of dialogues around the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, but also recognize the importance of having a dialogue around trade and economic security issues in Taiwan to bring together scholars, business persons, and people and policymakers that are thinking about these issues in a, an economy of importance to bring it here to show Taiwan for Taiwan's sake. So I want to thank them for their support and for coming up with the idea of holding this conference here. I also want to give a big thanks to CIER for their partnership um, their above and beyond professionalism and their scholarly thinking. We could not have done this without them. They've been a wonderful partner, and we hope this is the first among many. Um, and we're happy to host you in Washington, D.C. Um, you know, I, I, coming here is great, frankly, but uh, we'll also be happy to host you here. I also want to thank uh, the U.S. participants who have flown all the way over here. Um, I think a lot of us in this post-COVID world, um, or current COVID world, depending, um, our muscle memory for jet lag, for packing, for traveling is quite weak. So I appreciate everyone for trying to reinvigorate that muscle. Um, I know I forgot a lot of things in my bag, and I am still falling asleep at 2 p.m. So anyway, thank you for coming here. And to our audience, thank you so much for joining us today for this topic. Uh, we have a lot to discuss. This is certainly, these topics that we're discussing today are really of critical importance, and we're going to hear a lot more about it. For those of us that are, or pretend to be economists, I think that this is finally our time, where we have been saying economics is part and parcel of foreign policy of national security, and that the issues that we're discussing, it's not just military. And when we're talking about security in Taiwan and security in supply chains, it's not just about military, it's about so much more. And that's what we're really looking to address today. So for foreign policy practitioners, for economists, or those who pretend to be economists like myself, for students of national security, and even our own personal lives, I think in the last couple of years, with COVID and for us just seeing the news unfurl in front of us and even from our own personal experiences, we've really understood what supply chain issues are, what digital trade actually means, what economic coercion actually means, even if we didn't know what the definition of the terms are, we actually know what it is. Who knew that we'd be, be talking about supply chain issues? We talk about it all the time where my family in New Hampshire talks about the issues around what happened with toilet paper, what happened with, uh, now we all know what semiconductors are, that chips and semiconductors are actually the same thing. When the war on Ukraine started, there were conversations in towns across America about the concern about food security and the prices of food, that these everyday topics are not in some part of a big foreign policy world that doesn't touch your daily lives, but what happens out there happens in your own home. Inflation, war, this happens to us all, and that's why these topics 
and the decisions and the recommendations that we make in rooms like this actually matter. So COVID, tensions with Russia, they have all revealed how they impact our daily lives and what we're gonna be talking about today. There were also concerns about the rapidly advancing and evolving digital economy and how we respond. Right now it's with fear, but there's also a lot of excitement. I think what COVID also revealed was that the digital economy is important to our daily lives and that those that were connected to the digital economy, those that were connected to the internet, thrived. Those that were connected to the internet were able to continue their education, had access to telehealth, had access to a social cohesion, and weren't as lonely as they could be. But what we were finding when I was with the Development Finance Corporation was that small and medium-sized enterprises in developing economies were the ones that were able to survive the COVID pandemic and were the bedrock for economic recovery post-COVID. And that's a good thing. That's something that we can think about. But then we have threats and consideration about the free flow of data, tariffs, data protection, localization. These are all efforts that are going to take time. We need to start thinking about the future of the economy, and it is around digital. Whether we know what that definition is or not. There's AI, which is a big discussion. Uh, last night, uh, we had a dinner um, with the participants here. Sorry, you weren't all invited. Um, but we talked about AI and the good things and the bad things about it, what ChatGPT could do. It could write your cover letter, it could write your talking points, but it could also lead you astray in making up fake resources, and that's a problem. And if you, you know, read some pundits and what they are saying, it could also take over the world, which I don't know if we want that. But to ensure that we encourage growth, we also have to ensure protection and what policymakers are going to have to, con to consider and what educated voters are gonna to have to consider is how do we encourage that growth and not overdo it on protection. On supply chains, this is something I think that all of us are more aware of than we ever wanted to be. And it is something of a concern, whether it's because of a war in Ukraine and when it has issues on food security, on healthcare supplies. I think COVID brought that home more readily than we ever wanted to. Um, one thing was on you know, the healthcare supply chain. Now we're really talking about, probably today, on the semiconductor supply chain and other critical technologies, but it's on basic goods and services as well, which is what COVID really brought home. And when you had boats stuck in canals, oh no, now what are we gonna do? But these are things that we need to think about. Is global, globalism, globalization still working? Do we need a hub and spoke system? How are we going to do this where we can make sure that we have access to critical technologies that matter to our daily lives, but still make sure that the economies are efficient, but we don't lose access to these materials that we need? It doesn't make sense for us all to produce all of the things all of the time, but what do we do when we lose access to that critical technology? And then of course there's economic coercion. Taiwan obviously has been a victim of that. Um, just a quick plug for CSIS, we had an economic coercion report out in March, um, and we'll have a panel three that will be focused on that as well. But there's been plenty of case studies where the PRC has used economic coercion both in successful cases and not so successful cases um, and they'll only continue to use this, but there are other ways to use economic coercion as well. It's not just on trade of goods, but sanctions, export controls, and it's something that other countries can use as well. So what do we do in those cases? But these are the challenges of our time, and they're economics. Military as well, diplomatic, but economics more and more, and they're less understood and be undertaken by folks that don't necessarily understand what the ramifications of some of their actions are. For example, in export controls, we put them in place with an intended goal of protecting data and privacy and critical technologies, and we end up angering our allies, the very ones that we want to work with. So how do we make sure that we limit and mitigate the unintended consequences of some of these policies? And that's where we come in. And that's where discussions like these are important that the conclusions that we come up with are important, that we have the time that policymakers don't, that sometimes businesses don't, to take on these big questions and think about it. 
So for those that are jet lagged that are here to think about it and those that are less than jet lagged but are very busy, um, I appreciate you being here. And for our online audience, these are questions for you to consider as well. And I very much appreciate you being here. So thank you all. I look forward to the discussion. Unfortunately for you all, you'll be hearing more from me throughout the day. So thank you all. Thank you very much, Ms. Uri Murphy. Please take your seats and thank you for those wonderful remarks. Thank you. We will now proceed to the keynote speech today, and we are very honored to have Deputy Minister Wairen Li of Digital Affairs as our keynote speaker. Deputy Minister Li has assisted with policy drafting and analysis in the fields of information and communication, 5G, AIoT, open data, big data, smart city, government digital transformation and development, digital payment, and internet-only bank. He was also involved in the planning and uh, coordinating the establishment of several groundbreaking systems in Taiwan, including the real name mask rationing system, the triple stimulus voucher system, and the SMS contact tracing system during the COVID-19 pandemic. And today, Deputy Minister Li is going to share with us the ministry's views on and expectations of Taiwan-U.S. digital trade relations. So without further ado, let us put our hands together to welcome Deputy Minister Li. Uh, Distinguished guests, our host, um, the head of CIER, President Ye, as well as Director Erin Murphy. Good morning. I'm Li Huairen. I'm the Deputy Minister of Digital Affairs. I'm very happy to be here to share with all of you many of our uh, measures concerning um, economic security, resilience of the supply chain, as well as the promotion of digital um, trade. So here in the following, I would like to share with you um, our thoughts and our practices here in Taipei. So following the lead of the World Economic Forum, as well as OECD and APEC, we see that many organizations and countries are um, prioritizing re the issue of resilience. We were founded last August, the Ministry of Digital Affairs, but we understand that this is a very important area, digital resilience. So here, I think um, trust is a very important issue. A lot of the future services in economic and trade, in supply chain resilience, um, science, as well as technologies plays a very important um, force. And also, as uh, mentioned, by our um, speaker and also in our discussion last night, we talked about AI, we talked about the different technologies, we talked about how um, to build trust, um, how to use these um, trustworthy technologies. Trust technology becomes an important key. So under this framework, here in the following, I would like to share with you a few, few concepts. Um, in the digital trade, both Taiwan and the U.S. support the free flow of information and comprehensive protection for personal data. Under such a, um, a goal, how do we ensure the free flow of information? How do we implement thorough protection? It is important to have a good foundation. And the foundation, um, one of it is electronic authentication and electronic signature. So. Last um, August, since we were founded um, under the leadership of our minister, um, electronic authentication became a very important area for us. And we're very grateful to AmCham's support. Starting from um, last November, we have collected a lot of public opinions um, from the foreign investors, from e-commerce companies, from the industries. We have gathered a lot of feedbacks, and we are aiming um, in the fourth quarter this year, we will be announcing the revised version of the Electronic Signature Act. Um, we have also published a government um, circular 
So in this um, government circular, we're already talking about um, the electronic signatures um, for Japan, for U.S. Um, it is easier to authenticate these electronic records under this Electronic Signature Act. Another area is the protection for online consumers. This is a very important area. How do we safeguard online consumers, online businesses? This is another area that many countries are trying to advance in. So in terms of payment system, in terms of electronic payment system, we have the third party payment service providers that are under the regulation of my ministry. So here we have established this registration system for third-party payment service providers. So the service providers are asked to provide a statement declaring regulatory compliance with our act. Um, it also has to comply with KYC compliance, know your customer. We also want to make sure that the third-party payment service providers, they are um, complied with Money Laundering Control Act, for example. So under this mechanism, um, we invite the third-party payment service providers to register in our system so that we can make it to the public um, the trustworthy, the reliable payment service providers. And for these payment providers, um, they are regarded as a, a trustful um, partner, but if you are not registered in the system, then it might um, indicate that there are certain areas that require further strengthening, for example, the compliance with Money Laundering Control Act. And for the government authority, um, if we identify um, companies as such, then banks or the government authority might view you as some party with risk, and there might not be further collaboration um, with a payment service provider as such. Also, on October 24th, the government, the president, will be announcing in public um, this new effort in using dedicated short URLs for government agencies. We know there are many online frauds nowadays. It's a huge challenge for countries around the world and um, the messages here. A lot of these fraud um, companies, they're trying to use um, these fraudulent SMS messages um, to trick the customers. So on October 24th, we will be making public this exclusive short code SMS platform. So when um, our citizens receive uh, messages from the government agencies. They will see a very short code like 111. It is very easy to identify. So if you see such code, you know um, it's from the government agency. And if it doesn't have that short, short, co short code, then it indicates that it might not be from the government agency. So these are um, verified messages. This SMS platform will be shared among six ministries. We will be launching it at the end of October. We will continue to modify it. And starting from next year, we will be inviting all of the government ministries to be part of this platform to provide um, better service to all of our citizens. So the concept of public code is what we want to um, share with the public. The Insurance Industry Association is also in discussion with us. We would also um, hope to authorize such a short code SMS platform to more um, companies in the telecommunication industry, in the insurance industry. Um, they're able to utilize certain short codes. So in the future, um, our insurance um, companies, for example, they can also have one shared um, number and the public can know um, very easily where these messages are from. Another very important area here online, there's a lot of advertisement, the business advertisements, um, many of them, they're counterfeits, and they um, might be selling these fraudulent products. So we are working um, together across ministries to identify these fraud websites. 
We also work with the police, with the investigation bureaus on many of these practices. We have TW Nick. So TW Nick. Um, is actively working um, with the other ministries so that we can block access to these websites suspected of engaging in fraud and counterfeiting. In the recent two years, we also have a new mechanism. And in this mechanism, we have these videos. We want to help the public better identify many of these um, fraud websites. The numbers are rapidly increasing. We are able to identify more and more of these. Um, there's actually a very um, huge prevalence of these practices. It is very easy to generate a um, fraud um, website nowadays or a web link. So here we are working on using um, different technologies. We're working on international organizations um, to work with other countries to identify a lot of these suspicious devices and frauds. We hope to um, build up a stronger network so that we can notify each other. For example, within 72 hours, we can block access to certain websites. A lot of these are um, cross-border um, frauds, so we might be able to include this in our international dialogues as well. Another very important area is the protection of personal private information. We have an independent authority on the personal information committee that handles all of this. But for my ministry, we also want to explore um, different tools, for example, um, public government information or public-private partnerships to better utilize a lot of the digital information to also ensure the flow of information. So here, um, a lot of the information, we um, try to segment it. If it does not contain any information that identifies personal information or if it is encrypted, we would like to um, have these information that are not able to identify, um, that are not able to link to any personal identity. And now the first step, we have um, one of our departments. We are then um, facilitating the utilization of government information by the private sector to ensure information flow. This will also allow more government agencies to enhance their efficiency and flexibility um, in sharing their information with the society. Another important area is e-commerce. We've invested in a lot of resources. We help the e-commerce businesses in Taiwan. If you shop online, you probably um, know um, who they are. We have close cooperation with many of them. First of all, um, we provide them subsidy to conduct e-commerce cybersecurity as assessments, for example, to identify um, their weak areas, to conduct regular audits. We also provide subsidies for them to make these protection measures. In addition, we provide them with um, these new technologies. We help the e-commerce businesses protect the um, customer information. Currently, we are already working with seven e-commerce businesses. They are already implementing this technology, or they are already verifying their system and technology. So the basic idea is that um, on these e-commerce platforms, we will be inputting our personal information. One of the most important um, piece of information is contact information. And now um, the system um, can conceal these um, contact information. So the logistic companies, they won't be able to see the full telephone number of the customers. They will only see a certain code. And through this recognition technologies, they can call each other without um, having the leakage of personal phone numbers. So this is a hidden code protection mechanism. 
it prevents any leakage of the personal phone numbers. Another area where we work with the e-commerce businesses is to build a more um, responsive system. If there are any um, problems, we're able to prevent, to block um, many of these fraud businesses. Recently, for the C2C e-commerce businesses, we've also provided another technology. We have this anti-fraud radar. This is an anti-fraud tool that assists these e-commerce C2C businesses in identifying fraudulent prod products um, on their websites. We want to understand whether um, there are any fraudulent products involved, um, and this is conducted through AI models. We are currently working um, with a number of e-commerce businesses, and we see that this helps them shorten their product listing time, their um, personnel examination time, and it is um, of higher accuracy as well. So my ministry, um, we will try to use these different technologies to address the issues from source. Security goes from trust for us as well. Moda has two aspects. First is, for, sorry, infrastructure. I know infrastructure is one of the most important things of concern to you all. And then that would be gas, water, electricity, and finance. These are services that would impact our society greatly. Data security is managed by Moda. And we try to protect important financial, medical, and transportation infrastructure. We hope to protect their data security. We also help to grow the data security industry in Taiwan. We hope to match make and provide business opportunities to them. Not only for medical and also uh, dining industry, all of these industries need data security. And so we encourage this cybersecurity industry to collaborate with other industries. We also assess which companies have technology up to standards and release the information to the public. The next thing is semiconductor data security. Now, semiconductors is not our forte, so we work with the MOEA and Semi Taiwan. We had a very important discussion with these organizations, and we came out with a framework to protect data security in semiconductors. These safety regulations uh, concern semiconductor supply chains, online cybersecurity, and end-to-end -end, uh, data protection. There are specific regulations and guidelines and procedures. And I'm very happy to say that TSMC has adopted our standards. This has become one of their standard protocols. N the other thing that we are promoting is the Zero Trust Architecture, ZTA. This is something that we're promoting not only in government agencies. We also help hope that our industries can adopt these systems through these systems through promoting the systems we hope to ensure data security and also help consumers understand how to use this architecture in the future now because there are many details to promoting these frameworks but um, 
Due to time restrictions, I won't go into the details. If you're interested, however, the details can be found on the Moda website. So I, and also I will be here as well. So you're welcome to come talk to me. But I just like to say that I think a fair environment for competition is very important. In the future, we will help SMEs uh, trans conduct the digital transformation. And also, the US-Taiwan initiative in the 21st century trade, we hope to, on this basis, um, to promote digital trade on the basis of reciprocity. And we also want to align with international trade uh, standards. Through promoting digital trade, we hope to solidify uh, bilateral ties between us. So I'd like to thank the organizers again for this opportunity. This is my presentation. Thank you all. And we ask the um, deputy minister to stay on stage because we are going to in we would like to uh, invite Ms. Jenny Yang to please join us on stage, Ms. Erin Murphy, Mr. Jing Xian Ye, Dr. Amy C. Wright, please join us on stage, Mr. or Ambassador Derek Mitchell, Dr. Blake Wang, Dr. Hui Xin Yan, Mr. S.T. Liu, Mr. Patrick Wilson, Dr. Jack Zhang, Dr. Bonnie Ling, Dr. Jing E. Li and Dr. Ming Ming Yang. So please join us on stage for the group photo. All right, so we will have two roles. All right, so uh, let's see. All right. So please look at our photographer right in the middle and with a big smile, thank you. Big smile. One more. All right, please look at our photographer with a big smile. Thank you. Should we have a thumbs up? This is a very classic gesture here. So <laughs> thumbs up uh, and please look at the photographer. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please be seated. Thank you for joining us today. We will now take a short break and uh, refreshment is served at the back of the room. Please help yourselves. Our next session will begin at 10 o'clock. So please take your seats by 10 o'clock. Thank you. We will see you in 10 minutes.
啊，这样 ，Hello， 测试一二三，一，一二三，一二三。嘿嘿嘿嘿。好好好好，一二三，一二三，一二三，一二三。一二三，一二三，一二三。
Ladies and gentlemen, our next session will begin in about one minute. So we would like to invite everyone to please take your seat. Thank you very much. 各位现场的贵宾，我们下一个场次在一分钟后马上就要开始了。我们邀请大家可以开始就坐，谢谢。Ladies and gentlemen, our next session will begin very shortly, so please kindly take your seat. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to our seminar. There are three panels in today's seminar focusing on digital trade, supply chains, and economic security, respectively. We will now proceed to the first panel on enhancing the digital economy. In particular, we will look into how Taiwan and the US can work closer under the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework and the US-Taiwan Initiative on 21st Century Trade. The moderator for this session is Ms. Erin Murphy, Deputy Director at CSIS. I will now invite the moderator, Ms. Murphy, to introduce the panelists for us. So please welcome Ms. Murphy. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for sticking with us. Uh, this is the first panel entitled Enhancing the Digital Economy, Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, and the U.S.-Taiwan Initiative on 21st century trade. So this panel, uh, what we're looking at is globally, governments, partners, and allies are trying to tackle digital trade and economies of the future, but they haven't quite kept up. But this is all the efforts that they're doing are rooted in economic security. So first we have US and Taiwan have inked the US-Taiwan initiative on the 21st century trade, which includes trade facilitation, regulatory practices, agriculture, anti-corruption, supporting SMEs, labor standards, and digital trade. Um, then there's also CPTPP, Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for the Trans-Pacific Partnership, something that Taiwan is aspiring to, but something that the US is not a part of. Um, there's prohibitions on data localization, protections for data movement, and it somewhat covers digital services. So we're starting to look at an evolution of how these agreements are starting to cover digital trade. Um, and then there's IPEF, the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, which we're looking to see uh, be concluded, or at least most of the framework concluded in the upcoming APEC Summit in November, where they're looking at cross-border data flows, data localization, and source code. Um, and the ministerial text on IPEF is really looking at building an environment of trust in the digital economy. But also, and I think that you'll hear this from US policymakers the most on IPEF, especially when it comes to criticism of lack of market access, is that it's focusing on standards. And that idea of trying to build a foundation for rapidly evolving, a rapidly evolving digital economy. It's really a security angle. So we have brought together a panel of experts to start discussing the various aspects of what these trade agreements look at, from the really micro side of the digital trade, to the policy side, to the security side, but also to what these trade agreements really mean more broadly, not just on the digital trade side, but also what it just means in terms of action for the governments that are involved. So how this panel will work is that we'll have each panelist come up one at a time to present for five to seven minutes. Um, and then we will come up on stage for a moderated Q&A and then open it up to the audience for your questions. So I hope that you have a lot of questions at the ready. 
But our first speaker will be Jenny Yang, our Deputy Trade Representative from the Office of Trade Negotiations. She will be followed by Dr. Amy C. Wright, a non-resident senior fellow for the Indo-Pacific Security Initiative at the Atlantic Council. She will be followed by Blake C.Y. Wang, a professor of the Department of Law at National Taipei University. And he will be followed by Ambassador Derek Mitchell, a non-resident senior advisor at CSIS. So with that, I'd like to introduce Jenny Wei Yang. Sorry. Thank you, Deputy Director Erin Yemina Frog. Uh, good morning to all the participants and um, good evening to the most participants online in the in US. Uh, first, uh, I would like to thank WTO RTA Center of the CIEA and uh, CSIS for hosting such meaningful and very important uh, seminar for us. Um, I'm pleased to be here to share with uh, you how uh, we conduct this kind of negotiations with the United States. And probably in the future, we also need to negotiate with the UK in this uh, area. Uh, as all you are fully aware, after the pandemic, technology advancement, and geopolitical tension, all accelerate the development or globalization of the uh, in digital transformation. Here, uh, for Taiwan, is also very important. That is why Deputy, uh, Deputy Minister Li clearly indicated internally what we have done. I think his message is quite clear. He done, we done, already done a very solid foundations for our future negotiation externally. Internally, we see the starting in 2017, our president's uh, initiative, the DIGI, the PLUS plan, which symbolizes uh, development, innovation, governance is inclusion. The purpose is enhancing the productivity, innovation, employment, and economic growth. And later on, we also applied the digital uh, technology to di uh, disaster resilient digital infrastructure. The most important, we need to cover the policy of the inclusiveness. Now, Taiwan, uh, as uh, uh, externally, for us, we found that it's an urgency. We need to engage digital trade negotiation with our trading partner. The purpose is set up legally binding and trusted framework with our major trading partner. So far, we have the e-commerce chapter covering the, our FTA with Singapore and New Zealand, but we didn't have this kind of full-fledged digital trade negotiations with our trading partner. So we are eager to quickly launch the negotiations with the United States and probably uh, where, uh, sooner with the UK. For Taiwan, why we see is the important uh, digital trade because Taiwan uh, highly depends on the trade. You see the previous slide, export and import account for the DGP more than 100%. That is why we need it set, set up healthy, sound infrastructure, uh, digital infrastructure connectivity with our major trading partner. The next slide I would just want to show you uh, with the government efforts in coordination with private sectors, we showed to the world Taiwan the strength in the digital areas. We can see certain the international academic institution uh, publish some documents demonstrate how our uh, how our digital trade uh, economic has, uh, has the competitiveness in the world. For example, the IMD, the World Digital Competitiveness Ranking in 2022, he just announced that Taiwan uh, was 11th most digitally competitive nations among the 63 major countries. Secondly, at the same time, Taiwan secured nice positions in government cybersecurity capacity, which is so important related to how to protect national security, economic security with our major trading partner. Moreover, the Heritage Foundation Index of Economic Freedom in the 2023 this year, 
it just announced Taiwan is the second freest country in Asia and fourth freest country's economic in the world. That is with based on this foundation. I think we are we are uh, we are have these strengths negotiated with the United States in digital trade. But I need to say so far we are still not yet officially negotiated with the United States. But I just share with you those background or later on from the QA, I will share with you our preparations work. Taiwan and US uh, talking about the trade, it's not a new issue. If we look back in the last years, we have so many corporations uh, in digital trade bilaterally last year. And then our Ministry of the uh, Digital Affairs they joined the have the declaration with the United States regarding the future of the internet of the openness and transparency, which means we need to keep the data flow, data secrecy cross border. And also uh, before the pandemic, Taiwan US had uh, three times of Taiwan US digital econo economy in the forums focus on discuss 5G, uh, digital, di uh, digital connect and safety and open data and privacy issues. In the multilaterally, I think that in APEC, uh, our government uh, work uh, very closely with the United States in the digital economic steering group. Moreover, the most important is we joined the APEC cross-border privacy rules, which is important to uh, uh, safeguard our business to the cross-border businesses. The most important is last year, US just initiated Global Cross-Border Privacy Rules Forum uh, would like extended to the other countries outside the APEC. Taiwan joined this forum. And we also uh, initiated by our private sector, how we work together on the APEC regarding the cybersecurity corporations is so important uh, for the national security issues. In the WTO, because WTO since 2019, uh, MC11, they just uh, launched the joint uh, statement initiative in WTO. Taiwan and US uh, very closely uh, participate negotiations. It was mentioned with US coordinations. Taiwan chair uh, one small group is titled uh, Source Code and Algorithm. Uh, because it's so important that we just uh, 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 strongly uphold uh, not requiring the transfer of the assets to source code and algorithm software of the product importing countries. I think of which the purpose is protecting the sales exportation of ICT products. The next one, so come back to the uh, la and the last Oster, we launched the, this initiation, initiation on 21st century trade. Because based on the, I just mentioned, we have so many similarity, and we also have so many the uh, uh, like-minded in all the areas. So last year, uh, because our government uh, are willing to accept the international standard on agricultural products, and most of your Congress bipartisan support Taiwan US should start to negotiate the bilateral trade agreement. Therefore, in last year, we launched this 21st century uh, uh, initiative uh, negotiations. Just like the Erin just mentioned, they cover the terror issues, but not limited to, to this scope. In the future, you both sides get a consensus, we can expand to other areas. Among the those, uh, Twelve areas. There is one regarding the digital trade. The digital trade we launched in go negotiations. The purpose is to advance the outcomes in digital trade will benefit workers because it's the worker centric parties with the United States. But for us, it's important. So we need to protect the consumers, business, and include the SME. And the core principle we are cover under these negotiations. We cover building consumer trust in digital economy, promote access to information, facilitate use of digital technology, 
and then the promote the resilient and secure digital infrastructure. Now, and then the most important, we need to address the uh, discriminatory practice in the digital economy. And last one is quite a new one, is promote the cooperation is com competition policy. I think the, we are, I just mentioned, we are not officially uh, negotiate this agreement with the United States. However, we firmly uh, believe the outcome of negotiations of the digital trade, we would like to see we can create a modern liberal trading environment supporting the innovation and open market and the global the rural based trading system. So I just uh, uh, stop here and later on uh, I uh, ask the last uh, questions from moderators. I will uh, deliver more messages regarding the first phase of the agreement of the under the 21st century negotiations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Yang. Ms. Yang, please take your seat. And next, we would like to go to the podium, Dr. Amy C. Wright, non-resident senior fellow at the Indo-Pacific Security Initiative of the El Atlantic Council. I want to hand the floor to Dr. C. Wright. Thank you. Um, good morning. Thank you, Aaron and CSIS and CIER for inviting me here to Taiwan. It's very nice to visit during this lovely season, very nice weather and food. Um, I'm going to say, uh, I'm going to focus a lot of my remarks on U.S. trade policy and um, U.S. Taiwan, the U.S. Taiwan initiative that's already been mentioned a few times. But let me first start by talking about Taiwan's dilemma. Um, which may be very fairly obvious to many of you in this room, but you know Taiwan has is really left outside of a lot of the regional trade architecture, uh, really kind of isolating it in some ways economically. It is not a member of RCEP. Um, it is not a member of uh, CPTPP, although it has applied for membership. Um, it does have a handful of small trade agreements, which were just mentioned for some agreements with some smaller economies like New Zealand and Singapore, um, but not too many of those to date. Um, it is a member of APEC, uh, but unfortunately APEC, although it can be useful, it still is useful in terms of uh, American negotiators like to talk about APEC as an incubator for good ideas, and that is true. But APEC, when it was launched several decades ago, had very high aspirations for really promoting trade integration and liberalization. And I think in many ways it has failed to meet its promise. It's sort of been declining in relevance um, over time. Um, but one bright spot in this trade landscape for Taiwan is the newly launched U.S.-Taiwan Initiative for Trade in the 21st Century. I'll call it USTI. Um, I think it's a big opportunity for Taiwan and for the United States. And um, I'll come back at, at the end of my remarks and say a few more words about perhaps how Taiwan can think about seizing this opportunity. Um, but let me first talk a little bit about US trade policy. Um, because there's been a real radical sort of reorientation and transition in trade policy over the last eight years. For decades, the United States really exercised global leadership in terms of building the multilateral trade architecture, uh, that much of which we have today, and, and pursuing plurilateral, multilateral, and bilateral trade agreements through which it would offer the carrot of market access to the large US market as a way to incentivize countries to come on board and negotiate with the United States. And in return, the United States would often seek to get not only reciprocal market access, but get buy-in and agreement to rules um, and standards um, and, and other kinds of non-tariff tariff, issue, uh, tariff barriers that uh, prohibit trade and investment. So really trying to sort of raise the, the kind of trade and investment environment in its partner countries through these negotiations in legally binding ways. Um, but there's been a sharp departure from this in the, over the last two administrations. First, we had the Trump administration with its America First trade policies, which started with the withdrawal from the Trans-Pacific Partnership that the United States had led its partners in negotiating. And then with the Biden administration, we see them uh, working to define a worker-centric 
trade policy, um, which I think they're still struggling a little bit to articulate what that means in concrete terms, uh, but what it clearly means is that they, t in many ways, share the skepticism that the Trump administration had about free trade, specifically about using market access negotiations uh, to seek mutual liberalization and legally binding uh, rules and standards. So notably, the, the Biden administration has not asked Congress for trade promotion authority, which is the traditional way that administrations seek to get flexibility from Congress, which is constitutionally mandated. Congress is constitutionally mandated to regulate all commerce, which includes trade agreements, but it uh, sometimes through trade promotion authority allows the executive branch to take the lead in that. But the Biden administration has not asked for TP TPA. So um, this has clearly created a problem for the United States and its strategic interests in the Indo-Pacific. So to try to bridge the gap between you know, withdrawing from TPP and not negotiating, not, not launching new trade agreements, the Biden administration launched IPEF, which has already been mentioned, 14 nations, four different pillars, uh, one on trade, including digital trade and other areas, one on supply chains, one on the clean economy or the green economy, and one on the fair economy with, with anti-corruption and taxes. But the substance, the IPEF is notable in that it's very different in both substance and process from the way the United States has conducted trade uh, talks in the past. On substance, it is seeking to, it, it is seeking to have uh, standards and norms and um, information exchange uh, coordination, but in a voluntary, non-binding kind of way, for the most part, because it is not seeking congressional ratification for these agreements, which would then entail a more uh, legally binding kind of approach. And even though it's seeking very high standards in areas like labor and environment, it is not offering the incentive, the traditional market incentive of market access agreements. Um, and then in terms of process, it's being negotiated by the executive branch, um, specifically by USTR for the digital trade and other trade, the trade pillar, which includes digital trade, and the other pillars led by commerce. But without uh, trans, uh, TPA, uh, trade, trade Promotion Authority, from, from Congress. So without any plans to submit this for congressional approval. So this raises some questions both about the impact and the durability about what emerges ultimately with the IPEF agreements. In terms of impact, it's, it's an open question. We haven't seen all of the text yet of the different pillars, but it's an open question, I think, of how much incentives they will be able to build into these agreements that will really shape uh, um, trade and investment decisions by exporters and investors. Um, and then in terms of durability, there's the question of will these agreements be lasting if they are not ratified by Congress, they are an executive branch um, uh, agreement that a subsequent administration may decide they're not that interested in and could pay less attention to or even walk away from. Since Taiwan was not included in the IPEF talks, the IPEF grouping, I think the United States was motivated to seek another channel for talking to Taiwan and hence it launched the USTI, the US Taiwan Initiative for Trade in the 21st Century, which is really notable because it's the first official agreement between Taiwan and the United States rather than through an agreement between a a e AIT and TECRO. Um, and there was, a, there was a rapid discussion about some areas of common interest that led to an agreement that was signed in June with four areas that were relatively easy to agree on. So these are often called sort of early harvest types of agreements. So there was an agreement on customs and trade facilitation, some regulatory practices, some anti-corruption, and small and medium enterprises. And it's important to note that in the customs and trade facilitation part of the agreement, there were some, uh, there were some areas that, that I think are relevant for our discussions about digital because there was an agreement to adopt paperless practices in such things as digital filing and electronic payments and e-invoicing. But the next round of, uh, of talks in this, the second round uh, may be a little more difficult because they're going to include issues, I believe, including things like agriculture, which has had a long history of back and forth between the United States and Taiwan on some difficult issues. Um, and then it's not clear when digital trade will really be fully incorporated into the negotiations. It sounds like it's not going to be in the next round, the second round, but perhaps in the, th 
the third round. And, um, and there are a lot of interesting questions there, but I'm running short on time. So I just want to move quickly to a few points about this early harvest deal. Notably, soon after the deal was signed in June, Congress got very involved and asserted itself and its traditional constitutional authority on trade by passing, in both the House and the Senate, passed a bill to authorize the trade agreement, give congressional approval for this. But also, interestingly, Congress uh, made very clear in this bill that it was going to be involved on, on current and future negotiations with Taiwan. So this bill that Congress passed, usually called the Taiwan Initiative Act, was passed with very strong bipartisan support in both the House and the Senate. And so it set requirements for USTR's upcoming interactions with Taiwan, specifically precluding USTR from sharing any negotiating text with Taiwan without first submitting the text for review and consultation to Congress. So Congress is asserting its traditional role in, in but even more, in a more stringent way, a more interventionist way than the way it usually was done in traditional trade promotion authority. So this is a mixed blessing, because on the one hand, it shows that Congress is very invested in a trade agreement with Taiwan. There's a lot of strong support for Taiwan in Congress on both sides of the aisle. And there's a lot of strong support for doing trade agreements with Taiwan. But by asserting so much in interventionist authority, it will make negotiations more difficult. Because anytime you always have a, a trade-off with negotiations between flexibility, the ability of the negotiators to table texts quietly and find agreement among trade partners before bringing the whole deal back to Congress and then letting it go on an up or down vote. If everything is scrutinized, then all the different, different interests with, that are represented in Congress will start to fight it out and it makes it much more difficult in many ways to, to find agreement. But it is precedent setting in that it's, such a, it's a bipartisan agreement. It is a, a country specific agreement, a, a country specific bill on how USTR should promote a trade agreement. Namely, it's focused on Taiwan, which is very interesting. And as I said, it will complicate USTR's efforts in some ways to negotiate. But because of the strong support in Congress for Taiwan, and in many, in many cases, strong support for doing more with trade uh, with Taiwan, and actually to pursue, many would support a full-fledged kind of FTA, free trade agreement with Taiwan in Congress. Um, this actually, I think, offers a real opportunity for Taiwan uh, because it, you know, there's a lot of reports about how pe members of Congress are actually quietly pushing the Biden administration to do more than what it was planning to do with Taiwan through the USTI, to, to put more things on the table, to go further, to actually move towards something that would be more like a traditional FTA, including sort of market access agreements, legally binding agreements. So what should Taiwan do? If Taiwan wants to have a free trade agreement with the United States, I would say focus on Congress. Because the Biden administration, I think, is very ambivalent right now about trade in lots of ways. But Congress is a real opportunity. Uh, and the way to get Congress really invested in supporting and even pushing the administration to do more uh, to, towards accelerating trade talks with Taiwan is to make it clear that at the highest political levels, there's a real commitment to doing what it takes to get an agreement with the United States that could pass Congress. So kind of public statements that really clearly signal with some specificity that Taiwan is willing to tackle some of the more difficult, you know, these things are always difficult domestically to, uh, to promise, especially prior to negotiations, but find ways to signal that Taiwan really is ready to tackle some of some difficult issues, I think would be a very interesting strategy for Taiwan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Seawright, for your remarks. Dr. Seawright, please take your seats. And next, we would like to invite Professor Blake Wong from the Department of Law, National Taipei University. Please welcome Professor Wong. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, everyone. Uh, and I'm very glad to uh, invite my um, C. CIER and CSIS uh, to have uh, this opportunity to share some experience uh, from my um, academic point. And 
um, it's, I think it's a very important uh, for digital trade, uh, especially for uh, Taiwan and US side. And um, I will begin the presentation with uh, uh, proposed questions provided by the uh, agenda and um, my uh, uh, panel uh, moderator. And uh, I will focusing on some uh, legal perspective, especially some uh, legal framework in uh, the Digital Economic Partnership Agreement, we call DEPA. Uh, and this is, I, I think this is a very uh, uh, beginning uh, for both sides, both government can uh, join in the, the digital trade uh, dialogue. So um, we, we see that uh, um, uh, US-Taiwan uh, trade initiative, uh, because uh, both of us uh, sharing the, the same value and uh, uh, high quality standards. So I think the free and fair trade policies for war uh, will be uh, in the second agreement issues uh, for the uh, USTI. I think maybe the digital trade, environment, standard, and labor, agriculture, if the digital trade was not put it in the uh, agenda in the second agreement, maybe it can separate, separate uh, for the separate agreement for the uh, Taiwan and US, especially with a digital economic agreement between Taiwan and US, or uh, the further, maybe the, the third round or the fourth round, uh, that's okay. But, but the important thing is that uh, the two sides can begin to uh, dialogue with the digital trade issues. And I think that Taiwan is already uh, ready for, um, for these kind of issues. And also for the IPAF, I think at IPAF, uh, they have uh, lots of pillars. And the pillar one is that the trade, supply, uh, chain uh, resistance and e and especially inclusion inclusion uh, it, it set up that especially for the e-commerce sector so it's digital trade in in that ipad i think they have some uh, idea to to begin the the dialogue but it's not very s sustainable uh, uh, agreement or, or any other uh, document so I will say uh, this is a good uh, beginning for the both sides. And for Taiwan's perspective, I think digital cooperation for IPAF will be based on three ways or three references. Uh, the first one is uh, e-commerce e and digital technology trade related chapters already set up in, in, uh, in Taiwan because 10 years ago we signed a uh, uh, Taiwan, Singapore, and Taiwan, New Zealand, a uh, future agreement. They include uh, e-commerce e e chapters. It, it already set up uh, a few um, regulations uh, inside that agreement. Uh, for example, custom duties and internal tax, non-discriminatory treatment, e-signatures, paperless trade administration is set up in the uh, Taiwan, Singapore, uh, free trade agreements. And the second reference was CPTPP related chapters, especially uh, in the e-commerce chapter. But I will not deeply in the uh, CPTPP privilege uh, today because this is a very whole package of Amiga of FTA, uh, not uh, our concern today. So uh, CPTPP will be uh, a good reference uh, in the chapter 14, e-commerce. They set up a very complete and important regulations fully indicate the high quality of the digital trade. And the last one uh, reference is Digital Economic Partnership Agreement, we call DEPA. The DEPA has set up lots of uh, modules uh, for non-binding principles and best practice for members, voluntary cooperate and enforce. We can uh, just uh, shopping around with the uh, modules uh, and what uh, the common interest between uh, US and Taiwan, and, and I will uh, go further with the uh, modules uh, later. Okay, so uh, in uh, Indo-Pacific or Asia-Pacific, the Digital Economic Partnership Agreement was set up a, a very good framework for the, the, uh, the members to, to negotiate bilaterally, uh, like, uh, 
uh, Singapore and Australia, they just signed a digital economy agreement. The United Kingdom and Singapore signed out the, the economic uh, agreement. I think that this all focusing on digital trade and there's a separate agreement, just like, like I said. It's not included in the whole package of FTA, but the separate uh, digital economic agreement. So uh, if we are using the DPAS approach, US and Taiwan the governments would address and discuss new issues very quickly. So let's uh, just a quick look uh, at the modules uh, set up in DPA. I will, I will not uh, go into very deep details for this, but uh, just, just looking around. Uh, like a module two, a business uh, trade facilitation is including like a, a paperless trading, uh, e-payments, e-voice, e e-records. And uh, uh, module three uh, is treatment of digital products and related issues. It's very uh, easy because it's a uh, non-application of custom duties and non-discriminatory discriminatory uh, treatment like MFNs. And the module four is the data issues. It's including a uh, cross-border transfer of information, localization of computing uh, facilitations. And module five was wild trust environment. It's what uh, we, we uh, discussed today uh, more with the cybersecurity and ensure safe, secure, and trust online environments. And module six is business and customer trust. Uh, it's including the personal information, online customer uh, protection issues, which uh, we are focusing on the, um, the customer, uh, co consumer protection, uh, more uh, focusing on that issue. And the digital identities. I think the module uh, seven digital identities will be more difficult for uh, to, to, to governments because it's including some uh, biometrics uh, identification systems like a uh, face, voice, or fingerprints, something. And uh, uh, module eight was emerging trends and technologies. This is uh, we can uh, join the uh, the dialogue or, or some. Uh, uh, bilateral uh, research because like a FinTech and AI, uh, especially for the trust and safe and progressive use of AI. I think this, uh, uh, the two governments were, were, were uh, very interesting about these issues for the uh, technologies. And also module night, innovation and the digital economies. It's like a regulatory uh, data sandbox. And module 10, it's uh, SMEs corporations. Uh, it's better to help SMEs to, uh, can connect with their target market quickly and easily. So this is uh, the uh, SMEs corporation. I think is in the uh, first agreement with the uh, uh, Taiwan US uh, trade initiative uh, for 20th century. So uh, the both side can can begin with this uh, corporations very quickly. And digital inclusion, uh, this is in the IPAF, uh, IPAF uh, uh, pillars one. So uh, this is including the digital economy opportunities to the benefit of uh, all peoples and enhancing, enacting the culture and people to people link, especially in the uh, post paramedic era. And in the last two, uh, modules is like just an administrative uh, issues like joint committee, contact points uh, set up for the two governments and uh, uh, transparency for uh, some public documents. So um, I would say that uh, it's it's a good idea for uh, uh, US and Taiwan to uh, have some dialogue um, in the APEC forum, uh, initiate uh, for digital trade issues, especially there's a lot of uh, uh, members for uh, Indo-Pacific, uh, the Asia-Pacific, and, and a lot of the members like uh, Singapore, New Zealand, Chile, they, they already have some D, uh, DPA. Huh? Uh, they will know this, uh, the issues more, so we can just uh, sharing some experience and also the uh, joint committee for uh, digital trade dialogue for the future. So uh, the 
this is my uh, presentation, just roughly uh, going for some legal basis and legal framework for the two governments. And uh, I will leave some time uh, for the second round questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Wang. Professor Wang, please take your seat. Thank you. And next, we would like to go to the podium, Ambassador Derek Mitchell, Senior Advisor at CSIS. I will now hand the floor to Ambassador Mitchell, please. Well, thank you all very much. Good to see many old friends here in the audience and um, good to be back in Taiwan. Um, I want to thank CIER. I want to thank my friends at CSIS for the invitation. Uh, and I want to thank my co-panelists for their comments, which I thought were all quite, quite fascinating. My background uh, is I worked many years in the Pentagon. I have a national security background. I've done a lot on US-Taiwan relations, US-Asia relations over the years, recently on democracy and such. So I was trying to think about what is my angle to this question of the digital economy. But I want to associate myself first with what was said right at the top, which is that economic development, uh, economic security is national security, and no more so than in Taiwan. Because certainly what China wants to do is to make Taiwan weak, want to make them isolated, want to make them dependent on, on China, and therefore undermine will to resist, undermine the will to be, uh, have its own sovereignty. So it is very important in terms of national security, in security terms. So when the United States thinks about regional security, uh, we must think about Taiwan economic security as part of that mix. And I think we heard a lot about that uh, in the, the agenda this morning uh, along those lines. Typically when we think of Taiwan, there's sort of the three Ds of Taiwan, uh, those of us who care about it. Uh, there's deterrence, there's defense, and there's dignity. <laughs> so a lot of times we think, how do we make sure that there's deterrent against China taking action, whether it's military action or coercive action or uh, whatever, you know, in the broad terms what, that, what, uh, what deterrence means. I think economic uh, integration with the region, more Taiwan uh, profile uh, internationally and more countries recognizing what Taiwan has to offer is a deterrent. And the more that that can be uh, bridged and, um, and affirmed, the better. Defense, again, economic development is defense. I think hard security is defense. I don't want to put you know, the work that I did in the Pentagon uh, aside. That is absolutely front and center for how uh, China thinks about things. And then dignity, which is about simply Taiwan needs to have some profile internationally. I would argue, though, that many of those are somewhat defensive, a little bit on the defensive side. And I think Taiwan can do more. And I just have a few minutes, and we can get into some of the other issues of IPEF um, and USTI uh, and other things like that and Q&A and Connected. But let me just, in very few minutes, provide that broader context for how Taiwan matters and why economics matter and why digital issues matter. Um, the defining challenge, and President Biden has talked about this, and I've talked about this for years and worked on this. The defining challenge of this century is what are the norms, what are the rules, what are the standards of the international system going to be? What kind of world are we shaping in the 21st century? We had the kind of world, at least the liberal order, best as it was. There are certain rules and institutions. We all know this that had been around for decades. That is under siege. That is under challenge. I think that Taiwan, beyond US-Taiwan relations, beyond cross-strait relations, Taiwan should be thinking about how it plays, very and US and Taiwan together, how we think together explicitly, branding, how does Taiwan, and we both contribute to that competition, to that challenge. The Chinese, the Russians, we see it as they stand side by side at the Belt and Road Forum, they are explicitly shaping a world according to their interest and their values. It's very important that we have these agreements and we and Taiwan think about that through these, these um, initiatives. But we should also be thinking about things beyond the trade realm, even, and the, and the digital economy. One, one thing I saw here, I just happened to see it today, that China has a new global AI governance initiative. And maybe you've all uh, read, but they say, and I say this as comic relief this morning, <laughs> this is what the Chinese language is, we oppose using AI technologies for the purposes of manipulating public opinion, spreading disinformation, 
intervening in other countries' internal affairs, social systems, and social order, as well as jeopardizing the sovereignty of other states. Now, that's all true except take, you know, take out oppose and put in, we, we support <laughs> all of that. They are actively working along those lines, on AI and otherwise. We have to be thinking about how we shape and how Taiwan is part of that explicit shaping. How do we ensure, for instance, not just on the trade or commerce side, again, very important, I'm taking this one step beyond. How do we ensure that, we can, that countries or peoples that are struggling uh, against autocratic regimes, and democracy is on the defensive, as we all know, or being, being attacked, um, how do we get people ability to breach firewalls? How do they get that access to information? How are they able to maybe d uh, determine what is true? We all have that struggle, of course, of what is true, what is false, every country do. But how do we work together on information integrity, on ensuring that we can breach those firewalls? Um, how do we counter disinformation? I think Taiwan does an amazing job. Those who are on the front lines of this are doing an incredible job. Estonia, Lithuania. What can we all learn from, from that? And a lot of the talk, I think, IPEF and such, are government to government. Taiwan has a vibrant civil society, an incredibly creative civil society. Many of those civil society leaders have joined the government here. Uh, we should be thinking about how does the United States civil society, Taiwan civil society, with civil societies throughout Asia and throughout the world, work together explicitly to look at what kind of world are we shaping in the digital, in the digital world. This is a new unregulated Wild West moment where shaping this will be a defining issue and what those rules, norms, values, and systems will be, the governance values are under, uh, are, are now being shaped. So I really think we ought to be thinking very practically, very explicitly, what specific initiatives do we want the US and Taiwan to be working on together and what other countries can we bring along to do that to really address what I would consider the defining challenge uh, of our time. So uh, maybe I'll, I will stop there and reserve the rest of the time, which is about 30 seconds because they keep putting it sign up. Uh, <laughs> but we can get to Q&A and discuss that or, or any other issues, but I want to at least put that on the table. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador Mitchell. Ambassador, please uh, be seated on the stage as we will move on to the panel discussion. So I will now invite our moderator and the panelists to please join us on stage for the panel. So please welcome Ms. Murphy as our moderator. And our panelists include Dr. C. Wright, Ms. Jenny Young, and Professor Blake Wong. Please take your seats, and um, I will now hand the floor to the moderator, Ms. Erin Murphy, please. All right, thank you everyone. Um, and thank you to the panelists for all of your comments and presentations. You know, I think one of the takeaways that we get from this is just the length of our relationship between our two economies, between the US and Taiwan, and how we've been able to work together and how we continue to find ways to work together uh, given the policy that the U.S. has towards China, but how we can make it work with Taiwan as well. It goes as far back as um, finding a way through the AIT agreement and with um, the Taiwan Economic and Cultural Representative Office, and it's been a good relationship. And finding these new ways through the U.S.-Taiwan uh, 21st Initiative on Trade. So these are new ways to find um, issues. And you know, for Professor Wang on, in talking about um, DEPA, and, and these, that's certainly a new interesting way where it's an IPEP as well of finding these non-traditional ways to find ways to work together um, that are non-binding, but are you know, issues of the economy of the future. So now to my favorite part of Q&A. And then audience, um, Please think of some questions. Um, this is an open forum as well. So for you, I'm sure that you have plenty as well. So um, Professor, I'll start with you um, since you are right next to me. <laughs> Very lucky. Um, you know, talked a lot about e-commerce and you know, in my remarks I mentioned um, you know, at the beginning that I think this is something that we have, that has touched us all. I mean, we obviously, prob well, I'm not gonna speak for everyone here, but we've all ordered online. Um, we know someone who has some sort of online business, I'm sure, but 
it's taken on a lot more significance in the economy, especially post-pandemic, during the pandemic, um, and in the recovery. So what are issues that you think that the U.S. and Taiwan policymakers need to consider in going forward? Um, what sort of po policies around e-commerce and digital trade should they think of going forward? Uh, uh, thank you, Erin. Uh, I think uh, the uh, two governments uh, can uh, think about um, uh, some, uh, like I just, my uh, presentation, uh, the uh, Vujos, uh, because there's a non-binding and volunteer, uh, and if, if the two sides have a common interest, then you can begin uh, very quickly. Uh, in my view, I, I just very quick, uh, I think there's uh, two uh, corporations uh, that uh, the government can consider. Uh, one is the general corporations, and other is cyber security corporations. Uh, in, in general uh, corporations, uh, including uh, SMEs, uh, uh, treatment, protection, uh, facilitation, and technologies. Uh, it's like, like I said that like the non-discriminatory treatment and protection for the uh, personal information and uh, online consumer protection uh, facilitation is like uh, all the, the the paper documents with the e uh, in the beginning like the uh, e signature e transfer record e payments e uh, versions of trade administration documents uh, technology like this. Um, uh, AI and and fintech, raytech, five uh, G ICTs is all can uh, uh, the Taiwan and and US can uh, cooperations and the cybersecurity cooperations including the capacity capacity building and ident identify and uh, mitigate from uh, malicious in instruments and this uh, seminars of a uh, uh, malicious code that affect the e-networks. Uh, I think this uh, this kind of issue is very, very large, and uh, we can uh, just uh, begin with, with like a three or four, or, or even more with, with the coming year, I think. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Seawright, over to you. Um, next month is the APEC Summit. Um, it's a fairly big deal for the United States as we're hosting it. Mm -hmm. um, and what's also a big deal is that IPEF is notionally supposed to be negotiated, or at least most of the framework. Mm. Um, what do you expect that we're going to see coming out of APEC around IPEF? And that's a lot of acronyms for folks, but um, that's, that's what happens when you talk about economics. So it'll be interesting to see what comes out. It's pretty clear that the three pillars of IPEF that are led by commerce so, so the supply chain pillar, which I'm sure we'll talk about um, in the next session, uh, the uh, clean environment pillar, the decarbonization and green energy pillar, and the fair economy pillar on kind of anti-corruption and taxes. Um, those appear to be pretty well wrapped up uh, in negotiations, so we expect to see those agreements. I mean, to say wrapped up just means that there is substantial agreement um, for the pillars to be announced and text to be released. The, I, the notion is that these will be ongoing pillars of conversations, that IPEF will be a living document, it will be kind of con a forum that where ne negotiations will continue, but we do expect to see you know, concrete um, pillars announced. The f but the first pillar on trade, which includes digital trade, but also areas of competition policy and other regulations, labor and environment, um, and other things, led by USTR. That one appears to be um, in a lot more um, process, a lot more difficulty in some ways. Um, and it sounds like there are some areas of the pillar that have been, uh, where, it's where they, they, they have come to some agreement around text, or I think they're furiously trying now to wrap some of those things up before November. So we do expect to see some agreements around, for example, um, uh, 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 tr trade facilitation, um, perhaps labor and environment uh, kinds of things, um, some, some other, other things related to uh, norms for regulatory policies and transparency. Um, but there are kind of two difficulties uh, to point to. One is most relevant to this conference, 
the digital part of the digital trade pillar of, of the of the trade pillar appears to be um, uh, held up by the United States. Ironically, um, the USTR is really kind of in some ways negotiating with itself, or the U.S. is negotiating with itself because back in Washington. Um, there's a lot of different views about digital trade policy right now. The United States has long supported cross-border liberalization, um, uh, you know, pr preventing restrictions on on um, on data localization and and other things like that. But um, and also restrictions on on on, um, on source code or revealing, you know, being forced to reveal and manipulate source code. Those have been the building blocks of U.S. digital trade policy, and they've been encapsulated to some degree in the TPP negotiations, the digital trade pillar in the, in the TPP, now CPTPP, that the United States had really led on until it withdrew, and the USMCA, the U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement, which is the new, you know, the upgraded NAFTA agreement, um, have the, that kind of template. With, the, with some of those principles. So the original thought was these are all very important to, to U.S. Uh, interests, uh, you know, and, and, and corporate interests, um, but the free flow of information and other values that the United States has long stood for, um, uh, and the inability of countries like China and other governments to manipulate things in the digital space that, that can be very problematic. However, at the same time, there's a big domestic debate about big tech going on. And a lot of progressive Democrats, which have a lot of sway with the Biden administration and in Congress, are really concerned about writing into trade rules things that would inhibit the U.S. government from regulating big tech at home. And so I think there's some confusion on those issues, frankly, in my view. But in any case, it's really paralyzed USTR because they're being criticized for not being ambitious enough by many in Congress that support the traditional interests of the United States on digital, and they're being criticized by progressive in Congress saying you're going too far without consulting with us and thinking of all the ramifications. So USDR has, has, has basically been <laughs> prevented from really putting text on the table to negotiate. So we don't expect to see much at all on digital at APEC. But, but uh, USTR Tsai has made it clear that she wants to have some tangible results to announce in November. So I think they will come up with some other parts of that pillar to announce. I, I like how we s we are saying that um, it's USTR is part of the problem, but Congress is like the more active part of this. So anyway, as I have a speaker, that's OK. I'll leave my personal <laughs> problems about the US government at home. Um, <laughs> so Ms. Yang, um, the US Taiwan 21st Century Trade Agreement. How can the U.S. and Taiwan work closer together on the next phases of this agreement? Where do you see areas of cooperation going forward? Thank you. Thank you, Erin. Um, give me the floor. I think um, the digital trade, just like uh, the MS the Derek mentioned, is the backbone of the resilience of the supply chain. It's the policy of the not the economic policy security, but it's the national security. That is why when you raise the question to our professor, Wang, just mention whether in the future is we can start from the non-binding uh, discussion. But for us, because the first phase of first agreement uh, already approved by the, our Congress, our parliament, and also by your Congress as a congressional executive agreement. His high importance in the bilateral trade in the history. Therefore, we have the high ambitions how to enhance the digital trade and the economic cooperation under the 21st century. We are ready. We are like immediately, sooner or later, to negotiate this agreement with the US. I know the, uh, uh, that uh, Dr. Amy just mentioned they have the, some you are internal the discussion on the digital trade, but we still keep the high expectations on these talks. So I will deliver several messages to all of you. Um, we are ready because before uh, we uh, uh, starting from the 2015, when we want to join the TPP, we conduct a comprehensive legal review, the analysis measure the FTA and cover the digital trade. Later, after the thorough stock taking, we found 
our domestic legal regime that meets the traditional digital principles in the CPTPP, as well as the emergency issues such as the USMCA and US-Japan digital, such as cybersecurity, open government data, uh, localization of financial services, computing facilities. All these the emerging issues just uh, echoed what our deputy minister just mentioned. He already uh, put uh, so many efforts for, for example, the govern, open government data. So uh, we have a full confidence we can launch this negotiation with the United States to enhance the bilateral relation. I know that in the process, the ancient the English year also gave us a policy recommendation regarding our innovation in the digital infrastructure, cultivating digital talent, and promoting digital data services in the both the public and private sectors. We are listen. We are committed to overcome those challenges. We would like to continue the talk with the ancient members in Taiwan. But the purpose we need to strike the balance between your recommendation and our national legitimate policy. Regarding the competition policy, uh, coordination with the United States or cover in the mandate, I think Taiwan, we recognize the importance of digital inclusiveness. Our Fair Trade Commission has started taking notice of the competition policy on the digital economy since last year. He just uh, published uh, some case in their annual the white paper. So we would like to continue to engage closely with the United States and stand ready to start negotiating on digital trade. Second message I would like to share with you. Regarding the first agreement, we can see the digital trade relating the concept is the centric of the first agreement. Usually, the paperless trading is covered negotiated under the, the digital trade chapter. However, after the pandemic, uh, the both sides uh, just think we need to streamline our customer clearance, reduce the cost. So we launch the trade facilitations, here, which cover the paperless trading. For example, uh, we have uh, mentioned the legal validity of the administrative document in electronic format is the same as the paper documents, such as the bill lading. And we also uh, designate a single window and the short and the middle and long term that we will discuss e vital agricultural products and e invoicing. And the most important is what's mentioned the trader can request the administrative review or appear through the digital form. And the first agreement, they covered the uh, five topics, just the Dr. Mamin mentioned. But these five topics, the central principle of those the five chapter is upgraded governance and efficiency through the digitalization, so as to help SME to enhance the, their competence in the internal international market. And the coming discussion on the, on the labor and environment, we will try to, to think about how to use these chapters, whether we need to incorporate, use the digital technology to address the labor environmental challenges. Why I say that? Because I would like to highlight, Taiwan, US digital trade deal is so important. I can from three points. From a global level, we are able to demonstrate, share the common interest in establishing high standard principle in digital trade. From a regional level, we can lay a foundation for hosting digital trade governance, which can set an example for other countries in this region. Lastly, for business prosperity, we can work together to advance economic prosperity and enhance consumer business trust because Taiwan and US, um, we can work together for, in, uh, for the uh, national security. <coughs> we can work together on cybersecurity and in the Indo-Pacific regions, secure resilience supply chain to maintain the prosperity. Thank you. Thank you for that.
Ambassador Mitchell, we talk about economic security, and you and I talked about the importance of having this conference here in Taiwan mm -hmm. and the importance of showing that what Taiwan has to offer. Uh, Taiwan has few friends, it has a uh, few FTAs with countries and other economies. But it has, again, a lot to offer, and a lot to offer in terms of economic security, enhancing economic security throughout the region. So what kind of advice, or, or what would you tell a Taiwan, what could it do in terms of enhancing its own economic security and coordinating with other regional governments mm -hmm. in terms of, of making its own case? Well, first, I think Taiwan has a lot of friends. I just think a lot of folks are quietly. I didn't mean to make it seem like it was friendless. Sorry yeah, no, about that. Just, just to clarify what, what friends means, of course, we know what you mean, that, that countries can't be so obvious in official terms about being close to Taiwan. They are afraid of the coercive effect of, of China, which we'll hear more about this afternoon on the economic coercion panel. So you're absolutely right that Taiwan has a very difficult strategic environment in that case. But... Um, Taiwan has so much to offer in terms of public goods, and I think it has demonstrated new southbound strategy at, at, you know, in, in the outreach to India, to Southeast Asia, to the Pacific, to Australia, New Zealand, made a concerted effort to build those ties, there's more openness to immigration. So building that, those connections, showing that at an unofficial level, um, Taiwan matters deeply. And as I had said in my opening comments, I think at an unofficial level, there is an enormous amount that Taiwan can do. And I, in fact, would, I know there's a, a real push to be focused on the official stuff. Again, that's Taiwan dignity, and Taiwan dignity matters. But ultimately, Taiwan defense probably matters equally, if not a bit more uh, than that, in deterrence. So I think working at the people-to-people -people NGO level um, of demonstrating uh, that, that Taiwan's values are the values that work for people throughout this region. Now, it may not work for every government in this region, but we forget that. We just focus on the fact that governments are more uh, autocratic or there's more autocracy in the world. But look at the people in Thailand. Look at the people in my old haunts of Myanmar, Burma. Look at the people of Cambodia or look at in, in elsewhere. And of course, you put Japan, Korea, Australia, India. There's a lot of sympathy for the values that Taiwan represents um, uh, and the value generally that Taiwan brings. So I think it's a matter of appealing to that, of again, being out there on the offensive um, with the United States, with partners in Japan, talking strategically about these things. Um, the reason, you know, we have these agreements that are not binding, but it doesn't matter if it goes through a parliament or a diet, that, that's an expression of national will. That's an expression of national interest, whether it's officially stamped or not. It could have problems being implemented domestically, but at least at an official level, transparency, clean, good governance, anti-corruption, uh, data privacy, all these things that are in these agreements, that's represented by Taiwan. And I think we just need to be doing a much better and, again, a very conscious job in the United States, of not just being on the defensive or focusing on just on the military stuff, but really being focused on the offensive of making Taiwan a player in the mix of the region and, frankly, of the globe. And you're seeing more and more in Europe waking up to this as well. Uh, the rising Europe, not the old Europe, the new Europe <laughs> that is, has made its case and has proven uh, that they are the future because of how they looked at Russia and how they uh, acted on Ukraine. So I think there's a lot there to work on. There's a big agenda. I just don't think we're being creative and aggressive uh, and, and whether it's high profile, higher profile, I would say enough to make this work. Thank you. So we have about 10 minutes left, and I'd like to open it up to the audience for questions. Um, so please raise your hand, and we'll pass a mic to you. Um, if you don't have questions, then my reign of terror continues up here. Bonnie? And please state your name and affiliation. Hi, thank you. Uh, Bonnie Lin, CSIS. Uh, this question is mainly for Deputy Trade Representative Young, but also for all the any of the panelists. Uh, I'm interested in um, actually following up with what uh, Ambassador Mitchell mentioned in terms of un really understanding specific initiatives that either the Taiwan side or the U.S. side might want. So I want to ask you, from the Taiwan side, what specifically might you ask more of from the United States? 
And a related question is, we've been talking quite a bit about uh, USTI and, and how that's not a trade agreement, but a trade initiative. To what extent, from your perspective, this could provide a model for Taiwan to also have similar um, trade initiatives with other countries to further uh, increase Taiwan's economic resilience and economic security? Thank you. And thank you, thank you for your questions. Uh, because I already mentioned clearly well, why if US and Taiwan can conclude the digital trade, we can commit a high standard, cover not only the traditional the elements in the TPP, but we also cover those US and the new elements, like the cybersecurity, open government data, paper trading, and the data flow. Therefore, if we can conclude this agreement, then we can deliver a message to our side. The U.S. stand with us. They will like support us, show how we can commit the high standard. Secondly, it's very important that we will like we committed to work with the United States in the, uh, our, our, our New South Wales policy areas because those implementing our New South Wales policy, those countries were overlapping with the IPEF. That is why we can also demonstrate uh, the high standard as example for those countries. Probably it can facilitate the U.S. conclude the digital trade under the, the, the IPEF trade, trade pillars. Uh, that is why I, uh, we would like to have uh, more expectation uh, sooner or later start negotiate this digital trade with, with the U.S. Okay, any other questions? Please raise your hand. Um, my name is Jackson Rice, a graduate student at UC San Diego. Uh, my question is for Dr. Seawright. Um, so you mentioned that y your advice to Taiwan, be, Taiwan would be to focus on Congress uh, if it wanted to secure a free trade agreement. Um, I'm curious, um, any, do you have any specific types of concessions that Congress is looking for? And um, could this type of thing be used by other countries seeking free trade agreements with the US, or is it limited to this specific context? strategically? Good questions. Um, well, first of all, I'm not sure exactly what, um, I don't work on the Hill, and I'm not sure what all, uh, what I would do is, I, I, would, I would target the people that are strongly in support of stronger U.S.-Taiwan relations, including trade. Um, I mean, there are a lot of advocates for the U.S. pursuing uh, a more kind of traditional trade agreement with Taiwan. And uh, look at what they look at what kind of other interests on the trade front they care about. Agriculture is certainly an issue that is definitely going to be uh, of interest in Congress. So you know, um, I mean, Taiwan is and the United States have made a lot of progress on some of their agricultural issues, but they're you know really trying to target particular issues that might be. Um, that might be of, of strong interest in Congress would, would be one area to focus on. Um, and then I don't know what the other difficult issues would be for Taiwan, but um, but yeah, I, would, I would just try to figure out what, what's really, what matters to, to Congress and try to think of how to, how to really frame <coughs> politi you know, uh, statements of political will on those things. And the digital areas are, are of interest, too. I mean, right now, as I said, the United States is sort of negotiating with itself on what, what it wants for digital trade policy. But hopefully that will be sorted out in some fashion over the, next, over the coming months or year or so. And uh, what will emerge is a more coherent, clear set of priorities for digital trade policy. And once that is enacted in some form within IPEF, um, Assuming that it wouldn't be too difficult for Taiwan to signal that it was, you know, immediately ready to sign on to something like that, I would certainly seek to try to persuade powerful members of Congress that that should be a next area of negotiation. As far as whether other countries, that that's good advice for other countries. Right now, I'm not sure because trade is very difficult in Congress. There is this perception now that trade is politically uh, doing free trade agreements is is politically toxic or very difficult. I, I still happen to believe that there is a free trade coalition that could be built, but it would require a lot of political leadership that we don't have right now in Congress or in 
the White House or leading contenders for the White House that I can see. But wh why I say that is, if you, we were talking about this last night at dinner, but if you look at all of the big public opinion surveys that have surveyed American, the American public for years on trade, globalization, you still see very strong support for free trade, trade with Asia, globalization, among, especially among certain parts of the population, which actually happen to be heavily democratic, but, um, but it's not showing up in the politics right now for lots of reasons having to do with the way you know, parties are listening to different interests. But that doesn't mean that it can't be recreated um, in the future, but right now it's very difficult. So ta it, Taiwan has sort of a unique opportunity because Congress got so involved in, uh, in passing this legislation that was Taiwan specific on the US-Taiwan initiative so it's, it's kind of interesting. I actually can see it more likely, in some ways, more probable that the United States will pursue a trade agreement with Taiwan than almost any other country, except maybe great, you know, U the UK, which is already being discussed, and there's a lot of support for that as well, because you know, the UK is our strongest ally. But even that is hitting a lot of um, concerns in Congress. So I, that's why I made that advice, because it's just sort of an interesting lens through which to look at trade politics right now. Thank you. Any other questions? Please raise your hand. Okay. One in the back and then one up front. Hi, good morning. Um, I'm Sarah Lin from HP, uh, representing Government Affairs. Thank you so much for the panelists' um, very insightful comments. Uh, this question is directed to uh, Dr. C. Wright as well. Uh, we're very interested in knowing um, how I know that you said that the, the digital pillar for IPEF is still, you know, have experiencing difficulty within the USTR. But is there a timeline or like a wish, um, expected target of when that might be concluded? I know that may not happen during APEC, but is there like something, you know, some uh, a, a timeline that people are are trying to work on? And secondly, how can Taiwan? Uh, be part of the IPEF um, as a non-member, as in like how can we um, uh, work uh, along the side to, to, to support or, be, or part participate through or mm, in these regulations? Thank you. So as far as the timeline goes, uh, I, I think it is unclear because I, I think that, um, you know, the wonderful thing about summits like APEC, where they do really matter is, you know, we call them action forcing events because leaders, you know, if the United States is hosting and President Biden is going to be there, he wants to announce as much as possible uh, to, you know, to show U.S. leadership and to show the American public that he's getting things done and sh show on the world stage he's getting things done. So that's why they're eager to announce as much as possible. But they will not make the deadline for the dig for digital trade part of the trade pillar. And then it is, a, I think, a very open question of, of what the next deadline or timeline will be because I'm not sure there's any other action forcing events and we're heading into an election year and people get distracted and you know we don't know exactly what's going to happen in 2024 in the election. So there are a lot of, um, there are a lot of wild cards there and so I'm not really sure if, if, if USTR has a clear idea or not. I think uh, it also it also is a little hard to predict how these domestic discussions, you know, the, the progressives versus the pro uh, digital trade people, I guess I'll call it, um, how how that's going to resolve itself. Um, to some degree, it's going to have to resolve itself within uh, within Congress and how the Biden administration is going to choose to adjudicate these these conflicting priorities. And, and I I don't really know how to predict that. As far as how uh, um, Taiwan can participate in IPEF as it does, hopefully, move forward on the, on the digital trade pillar, the trade pillar and the digital side of it. Um, I don't know, I think, some, I think our Taiwan uh, panelists actually had some, some creative ideas for how they can sort of associate themselves with some IPEF negotiations. It's hard to think very specifically. I mean, I don't think in the near term it's realistic to think that Taiwan could be admitted to IPEF because the other negotiating members are going to have a lot of concerns, sensitivities about that. Um, but in an informal way, I mean, it certainly doesn't prevent Taiwan from adopting, or, you know, uh, uh, the, the kinds of standards and agreements that, that, that come out of the digital pillar. And then, again, if really, if, if, it, if, it, if it pushes and it finds advocates for doing this in Congress and in the White House, then 
uh, it, it can at least take what IPEF comes up with and perhaps improve on it, maybe go a little further and put it into a next round of the USTI um, so that there's a harmonization there and then perhaps on the sidelines of APEC or other fora, you know, Taiwan can have some, some consultations with the other members. But in some of the mechanisms that are being set up, like on the supply chain, which we're not talking about in this panel so much, but this idea that there's going to be these, these committees that are going to exchange information on a regular basis and consult and cooperate and coordinate, it's hard to see how Taiwan can really sort of be in the room on those things um, right now anyway. I think we have time for one more. I think I saw a hand raised up over here. Yep. No. Yes. Um, my name is Ola Kozłowska. I'm the head of economic uh, section here uh, at the European Union mission in Taiwan. I have a question to Ambassador uh, Mitchell because you started with a very high a, that the economic security is, is national security. This is something that everybody wants to, uh, to hear today and very, very pleased to, to hear. But the concept is not new. The concept has been sitting in, 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 the, in, in, the, uh, in the Article 21 of GATT for, for many decades. And I, I, I'm sure you remember that when, when, when Xi Jinping in 2014 revealed this comprehensive national security uh, strategy, we all globally lamented, oh my God, this is gonna change the, the, the notion of national security. Now, uh, on, on a more, more, more general note, where is this taking us that everybody now is using the notion of national security, economic security, to be on the borderline of, um, of um, or being or not by the international rules. So uh, should we leave it to the wild and then everybody uh, 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 take uh, a stance as, as they wish? Or should we maybe assign this to an existing uh, body to set up the boundaries of national security? There has been already a number of WTO cases when, when the issue was, was, was discussed, but, but you know, for decades, uh, nobody wanted to touch it for good reasons, because for all of us, national security means something different. So where do we take it now? Um, I mean, that's a very good question. I, the first answer to your question about China, because they're absolutely right that comprehensive national security should include political, economic, military, et cetera. And they're right about that. Just, But what they're doing generally is they take these correct notions and that are in documents or in historic documents, global documents, and they redefine it for their interests, again, with, with their values and their norms. Uh, so they redefine it. So now they talk about the value of democracy, that democracy is a paramount value. And then they go off and they define it with the Russians in a way that where you can't even recognize what they're talking about, <laughs> that that's democracy. And I think we, at our peril, we leave these terms out there to be defined by others, or we assume people understand what we mean which is why I'm talking about shaping as being absolutely essential. I do not believe that we can um, just leave that out there to the wild. I think there, when a vacuum, I mean, nature and the global system abhors a vacuum. It will be filled, and right now you have some very powerful players that are actively seeking to take advantage of opportunities and openings to, to shape things according to their own national interest, their own narrow interest, um, and it's, Blinken has said in all about China, they have the most resources, the most reach, um, and the most ambition of any country globally to do that in competition with normal liberal norms. So I, we absolutely have to be thinking about this. We have to be defining that together. We cannot be complacent. We have to go back to first principles, define our terms, compete. And I think if we compete openly with countries around, uh, bringing countries around the world, the global south, into that conversation, about why transparency, true transparency, accountability, inclusion, representative governance under law, why those values work for everybody, that that defends sovereignty, that that, you know, if you have transparency, you have less corruption, or more accountability attacks corruption. These are things that are practical. They happen to be democratic values. You don't have to use the term democracy, which sometimes gets toxic, but those values are very, very important, defining why a transparent system a system of accountability, of rule of law, uh, that's inclusive, uh, truly, and that has some, you know, some law around it, is important, and build on that basis. Where those lines are, 
when it comes to WTO and sovereignty and trade, that's, those lines are going to have to be debated. But I think there's some broad, we, get, we have a long way to go even before we get to those lines in defining what do we mean by uh, the liberal international order, as it were, which is a vague term that I think people are starting to wonder what we all mean by that. We need to really discuss this in practical terms about what we are seeking to shape in this 21st century um, and, and by rule, by standard, by agreement. Uh, otherwise, the Chinese are now out there somewhat successfully saying, we're the ones who succeed. You know, look what they've done. They've made a mess of everything. We have the answers, and these are the norms, and I think we, we leave that vacuum at our peril. Thank you so much for your great questions, and if you could join me in thanking our panelists for their comments. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Murphy, for moderating the session, and thank you to all panelists. We would like to invite our panelists and the moderator to please uh, take one step forward. We would like to have a group photo. Thank you. Yes, down the stage, yes. Thank you very much. Please look at our photographer with a big smile. Thank you very much. Thank you. And ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our first panel. Once again, we want to thank all panelists for a lively panel. We will now take a very short break. Refreshment is served at the back of the room. Please help yourselves. Our next session will start at 11.35. So please be back at your seats by 11.35. Thank you.
ladies and gentlemen, our next session will begin in about one minute. We would like to invite everyone to please take your seats. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, our second panel will start very shortly. We would like to invite everyone to please be seated. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. We will now proceed to the second panel today, which focuses on diversifying and building Brazilians, uh, resilient supply chains. In this panel, we are going to discuss how Taiwan can further contribute to the global supply chain. The moderator for the session is Dr. Hui Xing Yan, Senior Deputy Executive Director at Taiwan WTO and RTA Center of CIER. We would now like to invite the moderator onto the stage. Please welcome Dr. Yen. Hi, uh, everyone. Uh, I'm Huixin Yen, and I'm, it's a great pleasure to uh, serve as the moderator of this session. In this session, we will be addressing the impact, I mean, the important issue of uh, the supply chain configuration, and uh, I, they have become a very uh, important topic for Taiwan, the United States, and all, also the, uh, the world. In the last three years, we have uh, witnessed the impact of the uh, COVID-19, the impact of supply chain disruption uh, because of the COVID-19 pandemic and uh, the Russia invasion of Ukraine, and also the uh, geopolitical tension. But it is also true that the uh, CHIPS Act, Inflation Reduction Act, and many other policy initiatives introduced by Biden administration may will also uh, create new dynamics to the supply chain reconfiguration process. So I believe there is no disagreement that uh, Taiwan play a key. Taiwan is a key uh, key stakeholders in this new and changing environment. So today we have invite, uh, invited uh, four distinguished speakers to share their views on the impact and also the direction of the de development of supply chain uh, reforms. Uh, process and uh, among other issues, I will also learn from their perspective of on Taiwan's role and Taiwan's uh, contribution in this global supply chain uh, process. And we also like to hear from them about the strategy about to deepen Taiwan and the U.S. Co collaborations, as well as outlook for Taiwan's participation in the um, in. Uh, iPad 
supply chain uh, agreement. But before I invite them to deliver their remarks, let me briefly introduce each of the speaker first. Uh, the first one is Mr. Chen Zhenqi, Deputy Minister of Ministry of e Economic Affairs. Uh, Mr. Chen had extensive experience in public service in the area of economic policy. Before appointed as a, a Deputy Minister of MOEA, he served as Director General of Bureau of Foreign Trade of MOEA, Deputy Representative of TECRO in the United States, and Negotiator of Office of Trade Negotiations. And next will be, I will invite Mr. S.T. Liu, uh, he's Vice President of uh, Qualcomm Technology and President of Qualcomm's business in Taiwan and Southeast Asia. Before joining Qualcomm, Mr. Liu was President of Asia Smart Product Business Group, group he also spent many years in Motorola, including leading Motorola's design centers. And next, I would like to invite speakers from E3, Dr. Zhang Chaoqun, Jack Chen, S Senior Strategy Ex Executive Director, Sustainability Industry, Science and Te Technology International Strategy Center of E3. Uh, Dr. Chang has great experience in technology forecast and foresight, markets, industry analysis, government policy formula formulation. Last but not least, uh, Mr. Patrick Wilson, Corporate Vice President, Government Affairs for MediaTek. MediaTek is Taiwan's second largest pub public company. Before joining MediaTek, uh, Mr. Wilson had experience in leading corporate government relationship for U.S. headquarters manufacturing companies, Cumus, uh, Cumus uh, Inco Incorporated, Barco, and Wilcox Company, and for seven years, the Semiconductor Industry Association. Then, uh, Thank you for all your particip participation today. Then I will like to give the floor to our first speaker, Deputy Minister Chen. Okay. Thank you, Hui Xin. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let me start by giving you a very short snapshot of the so. Uh, which mentioned a lot about Taiwanese supply chain. So let's take a peep of uh, how the supply chain. Uh, oh, maybe I think I messed it up. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. Uh, Taiwan economy started from an investment-driven uh, business model where you have, uh, there, there's a saying about flying geese starting from the U.S. and Europe, multinationals, and then uh, Japan, and uh, the four tigers of uh, Asia, then uh, now they flew into uh, China and elsewhere. So that's how we started. Actually, uh, in the early time, uh, like in the 1960s, the 70s, Taiwan enacted a very important law. He called the Foreign Investment Incentive Act. That is to attract a foreign direct investment in Taiwan. And then this law, gradually, we upgrade the law into, uh, amend the law into a industrial upgrading act, which we give incentive to help our industry to upgrade. And then uh, the law was further invent, uh, amended to be the uh, Industrial Innovation Act. Then we only give incentive to research and development and innovation business models. So uh, you will see from here that uh, uh, we have an investment-driven uh, development. Then the, Taiwan, the Taiwanese uh, entrepreneurs uh, using the foreign direct investment to work, work with, collaborate with, and then integrate it into the, uh, international supply chains, mostly from United States, uh, Europe, and Japan. Then uh, when in the 1980s, China started its Kaifang, open and reform, so uh, many of international supply chain, they started to invest in China. So Taiwanese entrepreneur, invest, uh, industrialists were requested by their supply chain leaders to also 
go to uh, mainland China to invest and start the industry there. Uh, so that's how the Taiwanese investment in mainland China started. And during the same time, the government of Taiwan also promote uh, the first wave of southbound policy just to hedge the risk. If we invest too much, all ch put all our chickens, chicken eggs in the one basket will be uh, uh, not good to our national security. So, but that first, first wave of uh, southbound policy uh, was stored by the investment in mainland China. So that was uh, how Taiwanese started to invest in mainland China. And now, since they started uh, their investment in, in China, they were able to work with international supply chain. And also, they were able to scale up, and then they were able to help the Chinese export. So now, uh, the top 10 of the Chinese exporters, six are Taiwan-based companies. So now, Taiwan's uh, age is on reliability and technology. As I said earlier, we uh, amended our law to become Industrial Innovation Act. So we give incentive. We try to use Taiwan as a research and development base to continue our uh, development, uh, recent development to have uh, the most reliable technology. And most importantly, the business model is based on a trust business model because of a decades of working with the international supply chain and because of a government uh, initiated the intellectual property reform. So we have a very good uh, intellectual property protection regime. And also because of a democratization uh, was pushed uh, during the 90s. So the rule of law, the protection of intellectual property, and the business culture of uh, working with international supply chain to provide reliability. We work for AMD and Qualcomm and Broadcom at the same time. We work for Adidas, Puma, and other sports uh, companies at the same time. We all earn the trust of the international supply chain. And now, uh, because of the geopolitical situations, uh, Taiwanese companies, they are moving toward the risk and to increase the resilience. So that is the nature of uh, when we call about a uh, Taiwanese supply chain, the footprint of their supply chain. So now is uh, some of the uh, 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 Taiwanese supply chain in terms of investment. So recently, we have seen a movement of Taiwanese investment moving. Uh, first of all, uh, they moved to, that's uh, along the line with the government policy of a new southbound policy. Second wave uh, goes going southbound, which is uh, primarily focusing on ASEAN countries, the Southeast Asian countries, and India. Well, uh, compared to 2016, when the current government took office, uh, our investment of, uh, into mainland China, there was a peak in 2010. That was about 80% of uh, Taiwan's outbound investment was focused on mainland China. And now it's down to uh, about 35%. And during the uh, 2010, around the years, the investment into China is about 14, 14 billion. And now it's about four to five billion. Uh, on, the re, uh, on the other side, on the other hand, our investment into Southeast Asian countries uh, used to be about $2.5 billion, and recently has increased to 4 to $5 billion uh, US dollars. So there is a cross. And in this year, the, up, the uh, up half, the first half of this year, the investment into uh, ASEAN countries uh, about 5.5 billion US dollars, and to China is about 5.4, so there's a cross. So the investment pattern has uh, shifted from China to the region. And uh, another very interesting picture is the investment into United States. It surged in recent years. Uh, our investment into United States was increased uh, dramatically, especially starting 2019. Actually, the investment uh, shifted shifting uh, started uh, after U.S. started the trade uh, dispute with China. The Section 301 tariff was imposed in 2018. So our company started to move in 2019. I always, uh, I think it's always interesting to watch Taiwanese supply chain movement because Taiwanese supply chain, they are most agile and most sensitive to the uh, overall investment environment. And they are, uh, part of the international supply chain. They occupy key position. They are the one uh, 
and uh, frankly, we have uh, less political protection for our overseas investment. So they, they move very fast. And also India's uh, growth is also very dramatic. Our uh, India investment is starting from uh, about uh, 50,000 US, 50, uh, 500,000 US dollars, and now, uh, 50 million, I should say 50 million, now it's about 1.6, uh, 160 million. So it's about 100% uh, uh, growth into India. So uh, next one is, uh, now you can see from the trade flow, uh, it's also uh, evidenced the supply chains moving. Uh, our export to China started from 40, uh, more than 40% now down to 35%. Uh, because China still produces almost one third of the global uh, manufacturing output. So I think this, uh, there's a, about a line uh, we can see, we can watch. If we drop below 30%, that will be uh, very, very dramatic. And also, uh, our export to ASEAN, uh, the US, ASEAN, and European country increased uh, by 16%, 17%, and 10%, respectively. So if we compare to 2016, our export to India and Mexico grew by 89% and 137%. So we are uh, monitoring our investment in uh, North American market, uh, we will spot on Mexico. For the uh, ASEAN area, we spot on Vietnam and Thailand. Uh, and to Europe and, and US, so those are the new market for Taiwanese supply chain uh, shipping. So the last one is uh, in uh, facing this uh, international supply chain uh, uh, reconfiguration, the government policy. First one, we try to exercise prudence and non-provocation to maintain stability. That's the most important because in terms of all the business efficiency, national security trump everything. So that's most important. We try to stabilize and to maintain stability uh, for our relations with the mainland China. And also, uh, we starting uh, in the 90s when we liberalize our trade and investment with mainland China, we have some guardrails in place. Those are some trade restrictions, some uh, investment restrictions. We still maintain those mechanisms. And we are hopeful since um, uh, China and Taiwan both are WTO members, we can use WTO uh, platform for nego negotiations, for uh, further liberalization and normalization. But we have not yet to uh, hear a positive response from the Chinese side. However, government will maintain the status quo uh, in terms of the measures in place. Uh, and then uh, we try to connect with allies, so like-minded partners are more, very important. Taiwan is too small to dictate the trend and the way to forward, but we must work with our international uh, uh, supply chain leaders and also with our like-minded partners to deepen and enhance our collaborations. And the last mm -hmm. is try to have a established structural integration with the international supply chain. That is why the government policy pursue the join of CPTPP. And uh, why she mentioned about IPEP, of course, uh, there's some political uh, hurdles that uh, Taiwan cannot join the uh, IPEP at the very beginning stage. But we have uh, uh, under the uh, leadership of uh, Office of Trade Negotiations now, we have concluded the first page of the 21st Century Trade Initiative with the USTR. That is a parallel to IPEP uh, trade agenda. We are hopeful we can join the so-called International Trade Rules 2.0 and then to establish a structured way of integration integrated into international supply chain. I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deputy Minister Chen. Please be seated. Thank you. Our next uh, speaker is Mr. S.D. Liu, Vice President at Qualcomm Technologies and President of Qualcomm Taiwan, Southeast Asia, Australia, and New Zealand. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Liu. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's always difficult to follow after uh, Deputy Minister Chen's speech. Um, but um, I'm very happy to be able to, um, to share some of the experience from Qualcomm perspective in today's uh, forum. Um, like you were introduced, my name is Estilu. I have the benefit of staying in many places in the world, but I've chosen to stay in Taiwan the longest time now, uh, after my native country in Malaysia and Singapore. And after 12 years here in, in, uh, in Taiwan, um, I've seen a lot and learned a lot from my Taiwanese partners, and hopefully, you know, these will come to uh, to uh, show some of the comments and uh, inputs I will give here. 
my remarks is going to center around Qualcomm, um, because Qualcomm being the, uh, the largest fabulous semiconductor company in the world, um, serves the very good examples on the views and the strategy we adopt in this very, uh, very uh, urgent questions that we are, we, are, we are discussing today. Qualcomm is a leading company in developing revolutionary technologies and also design semiconductors to realize these technologies into commercialization and, and, and the widespread usage of these technologies. 5G being a very good example, it's a foundation of technologies that has been widely adopted. In fact, most of the communication now and going forward wirelessly or even non-wirelessly will, uh, will be using the 5G technologies. It will be the engine that drives AI, it will be the engine that drives automotive, it will be the engine that drives a lot of the new uh, ideas and innovation you see going forward. Um, just to give you an example, 5G, the economic scale of 5G, if you uh, look at some estimate up to 2035, considering everything that 5G will bring, is about uh, $13.2 trillion up to 2035. And according to some estimate, uh, in the United States, between 21 and 25 will create up to 15, 16 million jobs. This is the kind of impact technologies bring to the world economy. Now, as I said, Qualcomm is a large, uh, you know, fabulous semiconductor company. We are the second largest semiconductor company in the United States by uh, revenue and by the amount of investment in R&D and by global works, uh, workforce. The fourth in the world and the largest uh, fabulous uh, in, in the world uh, in terms of semiconductors. So we ship billions of chips every year. So this is a testament to the kind of scale and the impact to the economy of the global economy that one company can bring. Now, in how did Qualcomm get to where we are today? And sem uh, several other semiconductors company you know, will do, uh, are doing the same thing as well. We have s focused a lot on R&D. Uh, research and development has always been the centerpiece and the passion for Qualcomm uh, right from the founding. If you look at the semiconductor industry over the last, uh, since the year 2000 till now, the investment of percentage of share of sales in R&D has dwarfed the previous four decades before 2000, of which is about which was about 14% uh, average per year. And Qualcomm alone, we have invested more than 85 billion dollars in R&D since the founding of the company. And just in FY22, we invested about eight billion dollars in R&D. So, our innovation and inventions in technologies and the design of these semiconductors uh, will compel and make, us, make it necessary for us to work very closely with the manufacturers of semiconductors. So we in Qualcomm is very much part of the integral process of the manufacturing of semiconductors throughout uh, from, 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 from the very beginning to the end. The designs that is done by us and other semiconductor companies drive, enable, and accelerate the innovation necessary for the manufacturing process so that you know, the whole ecosystem progress as, you know, as fast as possible, as, as seamless as possible. The world economy going forward is so centered on, on, on technology, and semiconductor is at the centerpiece of it. I'll just to give you an example, the mobile industry still drive the still is the is still the main driver in terms of pushing the leading edge semiconductor technologies. And if you look at the foundries, most of the foundries in the world, the mobile industries are still the largest customer that they have. So mobile industries, together with companies like Qualcomm, continuously provide critical information and knowledge to the foundry and to the supply chain of the semiconductor industry to keep improving and you know, do better than, uh, do better in everything we need to do. So I, I don't need to tell this audience here how complex the whole supply chain situation is. It's just an example of a smartphone. An average smartphone has about 165 semiconductors of varying degree 
of complexity, different, you know, different nodes, different source, and so on and so forth. It's very, very complex. So the way Qualcomm has approached these issues has always been, you know, Qualcomm is probably the most diverse in terms of uh, supply chain in semiconductors. We work very closely with uh, companies in the United States, in Korea, and of course in Taiwan. And over the years, we have prioritized the development of Taiwan as a close partner in supply, in, in supply of uh, semiconductors from, uh, from, from, from foundry to OSAT and so on and so forth. That, that, that collaboration, in my mind, is extremely important and it bears fruits to, you know, so where do we go from here? So Qualcomm absolutely welcome and are supportive of the various government uh, prioritization of semiconductors as an as a important um, uh, industry and then the incentives they're given to the semiconductor industry. Qualcomm is very supportive of that. And the second thing I will say before I end is uh, that we also believe that the industry should be very participative in uh, the conversation on supply chain discussions and agreement, because I think the industry, the semiconductor industry, have seen the very characteristic of the semiconductor industry, which is uh, growth and decline, growth and decline. That industry is very well trained and a lot of experience and should participate very fully and very passionately with any uh, discussions from the supply chain uh, agreement and so on and so forth, so that the agreement can be relevant to all of us uh, when it gets uh, gets uh, uh, get carried out carried out. So with that said, I'll leave the I'll leave the stage now, and maybe we'll answer some questions later. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Liu. Mr. Liu, please be seated. Thank you. And our next speaker is Dr. Jack Zhang, Senior Strategy Executive Director of the. Sustainability, Industry, Science, and Technology International Strategy Center at ITRI. I will now hand the floor to our next speaker, Dr. Zhang. Okay, uh, good morning and good night for all the other audience on site all over the internet. So first I'd like to thank uh, CSIS and CIER to invite me to join the forum. And uh, I'm Jack Chen uh, from, from ITRI. So I believe I'm the only chemical engineer in the room right now. <laughs> so I think I will uh, share my view about the diversify and building a resilient supply chain uh, from an industrial perspective. I think uh, Vice Minister Chair has given a broad view about the trade and our government policy. So that's my agenda for today for your reference. I think we have been talking about, uh, I think, through this forum that there are some dri major trend or driving force, okay, okay, to try to uh, change or to reconfigure the global supply chain. As you can see, for example, the lockdown from the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, the, uh, the U.S.-China uh, uh, trade and uh, technology dispute, also, as well as, for example, uh, in the nowadays, uh, through the uh, uh, COP26, 2050 net zero uh, uh, emission has become an important issue, and we need the whole supply chain efforts okay, to deal with the, the net zero uh, target emission. Also, uh, there are more regional uh, uh, free trade agreement, for example, the uh, CPTPP, the RCEP, or the USMCA. All those uh, free trade agreements have increased attractiveness okay, for companies to invest in ASEAN or in Mexico or in some other parts of the world. And, uh, and, least and not, last and not least, I think lots of countries have used uh, incentive uh, programs to try to attract companies to reshoring or French shoring. And to all, I think all this driving force has uh, make effect to decentralize the uh, global manufacturing base and all the companies will try to uh, use some kind of their new strategies, try to relocate their, their production base uh, around the world. So Taiwan 
is a major partners uh, for the uh, global manufacturing industry. Actually, we are the key okay, intermediate goods suppliers to almost all the major uh, industrial sectors in the world nowadays. So our manufacturing sectors also facing a lot of challenge according to the trend I presented in the previous slide. For example, US and China technology war. They say after that, I can see China will try to, to use the so-called whole nation efforts, try to increase their self-sufficiency in semiconductors, in AI, or in other areas. Okay? They think they'll be vital for their future uh, economic development. And there will be, we are joking, that nowadays, maybe from 10 years from now, there'll be one worse, one Earth and two okay, standard system, one from the US and like-minded country, and one from the China and their partners. So for, uh, for, for, for all the companies, no matter it's from Taiwan or from US, from Europe, I think they are all knows about the importance of the, the, the Chinese market. But so we need to think about how we're going to, to play okay, our roles in those two different separate systems. And also like uh, from the uh, advancement of the AI, the climate change issues, or the pandemic control has caused the, 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 for example, in 2021, I think the old global automobile industry has facing a shortage of, uh, of, of chips okay, to make a car. So in that years, I think a lot of government come to Taiwan, try to persuade TSMC okay, to give them some capabilities okay, to produce extra chips for them. Otherwise, okay, they, will be, they won't be able to ship out new cars. I, I think for some of the, the audience from the US, I, you, I think you remember when we, we used to buy cars from the, from, from in the US, we see the manufacturing suggested price from the, from the windshield and we cut down from that, okay, 10%, 5%, 10% down. But in 2021, it's 10% up or 20% up. You need to pay more than that to get your new car. So all those shows, okay, there is a trend okay, to try to build a more resilient a more transparent and trustworthy supply chain. Also, the purpose for that is if something happened to disrupt the supply chain, then the partners okay, inside the supply chain, they could communicate and try to figure out a way okay, to, to, to correct or to, 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 to handle the disruptions and go back to business as usual as soon as possible. So for from the, the, that perspective, I think first, uh, be, between, between for, for China, I think uh, the EU pres uh, president, uh, uh, Ms. von der Leyen, used the word de-risking to replace the decoupling, okay? Frankly speaking, I don't know what's the difference between those two. I think maybe de-risking is a more polite way talking, <laughs> talking about decoupling. <laughs> That's my personal definition. But anyway, we see a lot of countries, okay? They do have policy being initiated, okay, to, to to improve their supply chain resilience, especially after the COVID-19 pandemic. As you can see, we are talking about, for example, I think one of the earliest uh, presidential order from President Biden's administration is to, to review the, the, the supply chain, okay? For those key materials, okay, pharmaceuticals, uh, uh, batteries, semiconductors, and et cetera. Also, as we have been mentioned, we have U.S. Uh, Chips Act, uh, uh, IRA, uh, Inflation Reduction Act, et cetera. And EU, EU and all the other countries alike, they also review the supply of their uh, key raw materials, as well as they try to build up, for example, they pass different kinds of Chips Act, try to attract okay, investment okay, for more advanced mode of semiconductor manufacturing capabilities. And TSMC is one of the companies they've been talking for. TSMC already announced they will invest in Arizona for two fabs for 50, 40 billion US dollars, one in Japan, also recently one in, 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 in Dresden, Germany. All those I think ha has been the outcome for all the different government policies and recommendations. But from an uh, industrial point of view, I'd like to show you what's Taiwan's role in the global uh, uh, supply chain right now. Taiwan is a very small island. Okay, if you go uh, use the high speed rail against from north and south, okay, it took about one and a half hours. And we all focus on different uh, uh, software park or, or science park. So we have a very strong cluster effect in Taiwan. Also, I think 
Taiwan has a very complete high-tech supply chain. As you can see, from semiconductors to printed circuit boards and to different components and modules. Usually, uh, lots of international buyers, they come to Taiwan to join, for example, the Taiwan Compute Tax. Okay? They say they can do a one-stop shopping. They can buy everything they want, and, and, and then they can receive the product and sell to their customers. So in that sense, I think it's a listing about the different kind of product. Taiwan has ranked number one. I think those, those, those are made by Taiwanese companies. Some of the factories are not in Taiwan, maybe in China, in Asia, or other part of the world. But Taiwan occupies a very important role. For example, if you buy a computers, notebook computers in, in, in America, no matter if it's the Apple or the HP or so Dell, it's all made by a okay, Taiwanese company somewhere in the world. So that's sure, okay, Taiwan is a vital okay, player okay, for all of those companies involved in the global supply chain. So in that sense, as you can see, we are a good partners for the well-known international brand in different industries. Those are in ICTs, but also we are I think, the major, uh, 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 old major supplier, for, for example, to Nike, to Adidas, to Puma, even to Lemon Lulu, if you are doing, <laughs> doing, <laughs> doing other kind of uh, 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 exercise, okay? So we have been very strong, okay? be a, a, a key partners okay, in, in the global supply chain. So in conclusion, I think for, for us to build a more resilient industrial supply chain, okay, I think uh, supply chains, if you view them as a human beings, okay, we need to have brand, we can make smart decisions, we need to have strong bodies to have uninterrupted operations, we need to have our hands and feet to, to decentralize our manufacturing, and also, also most importantly, we have some kind of immunity. To, to avoid the, some kind of breakdown like the pandemic has been brought to us. So in that sense, I think for a good resilient supply chain, we need to be, have to be high survival, we need to have resilience, we have agility. Also, we need to create value, not for ourselves, but also for our customers. Okay. So in that sense, I think uh, we propose that Taiwan can be a major player in the global collaboration to build a resilient industrial supply chain. For example, uh, we have all know uh, semiconductors, AI, 5G, and some other uh, next generation semiconductors that play the backbone, okay? Not only for the products that we mentioned, but also for the communication service or for the for AI, all the other new service or products have been, we are going to be developed okay, in the world. So in that sense, I think Taiwan can be a trusted partners, okay? to build a new global resilient supply chain. So for the IPATH uh, supply chain agreement, they say they want to uh, uh, join with their member um, countries to build a more transparent, a more resilient, more efficient, more diversified, more inclusive uh, supply chain. I think Taiwan can play a good role in there. So from my personal pers perspective, I think Taiwan should be invited uh, to be a valuable contributor to the IPATH uh, supply chain agreement. So I will stop in here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Zhang. Dr. Zhang, please be seated. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mr. Patrick Wilson, Corporate Vice President of Government Affairs at MediaTek. So please welcome Mr. Patrick Wilson. Thank you uh, very much. And uh, thank you, Dr. Because. Eatry is uh, one of MediaTek's, you know, real important partners for more than 26 years. So it's a delight to hear those insights uh, on the market. And you know, you were billed, you imported uh, uh, a quote-unquote political expert from D.C. to come and weigh in on the commentary this morning. And so I thought, really, what I would do with the few minutes I have uh, to be with you is first to introduce MediaTek. Uh, obviously, most of my colleagues in Taiwan know MediaTek well, but perhaps not everyone does. Uh, the second thing is I want to talk about uh, Taiwan's unique contribution to the global technology ecosystem and how Taiwan uh, sees itself or how Taiwan has positioned itself to be essential to all of their partners around the world. And then the third thing I want to talk to you about, which may be the only controversial thing you hear, business people are not particularly good at being controversial in public settings, but I will say something about 
the new drivers of innovation in the world. And that is un uh, MediaTek's very, very intense focus on people, both our thousands of customers, large and small across the world, but I think most importantly, the people that we hire and recruit to be a part of our innovation engine, which is really what we see ourselves. So with that little uh, projection about what I'm gonna talk about, I'm gonna go back to the very beginning and say, well, who is MediaTek? So um, many of my colleagues here will know that MediaTek was founded in the shadow of TSMC and UMC in the Shinju Science Park, probably the most important science park in the world, not just because they birthed companies like UMC and TSMC, but because it's an incredibly innovative place uh, that really has uh, had a tremendously outsized impact on the global supply chain. And I point out that Shinju Science Park not only last year did it just celebrate its 40th anniversary, but think about if you were the politician 40 years ago who had a really good idea to create a unique, novel, greenfield space where innovation could happen. And I want to give uh, credit uh, to what Taiwan has built, right? They created a place to do innovation and then put all of the sustaining resources uh, in place to make it happen. Most of it has to do with higher education and research. The, the Taiwan government did something when every other political jurisdiction in the world had kind of lost the thread a bit, right? Taiwan doubled down on uh, technology leadership. And this was in a position of weakness. For those of you who know or maybe have read many of uh, the books about Morris Chang, the, the, the founding inspiration of TSMC, he will tell you very frankly that where Taiwan was 40 years ago was not a strong player in technology, quite the opposite, right? Taiwan had kind of built itself as, you know, almost as good but half the price, right? And that is where a lot of emerging markets were. And uh, part, I thought it was incredibly humble, and, and Morris Chang is an, an inspiring figure, but at his origin, he said, you know, we got into manufacturing semiconductors because I didn't think we could do anything else, which is pretty controversial for a beloved national figure to say that about his own country's history. But I thought it reflects a tremendous humility that is the heart uh, of, of Taiwan culture. And I say this as an outsider. Um, I, I have been coming to Taiwan and working in Taiwan for more than 23 years. Um, I came as a young congressional staffer, but the one thing that I've been very impressed is, is this humility um, at its core. And, and, and so MediaTek's story really picks up 26 years ago. Uh, the, the country of Taiwan was so pleased with the success of building a semiconductor supply chain, but the part that was missing is that TSMC and USMC, they were making chips for other people. And like a lot of developing countries, they were like, why don't we have a Taiwanese fabulous design company making products to go into our own factories. And uh, that's how our company was created. And it took a long time, a five year valley of death, no profits uh, for five years to get to a point where uh, uh, MediaTek had a winning product and design. And again, embedded in our culture is this idea is that people are the difference. Right? As much as we love government and we don't want to hurt any of our government friends and uh, deputy minister, we don't want to hurt your feelings. But ultimately, we're all about these brilliant men and women, young people, engineers, many of them, who resolve to solve problems, right? real world problems for their small business or large business customers. And how exciting is that? And it has transformed certainly our company as we have evolved over the years to solve ever more complex problems. But we've never lost sight of the fact that it's really the people, right? Not just our customers, but the engineers themselves and creating a culture where really, really creative people wanna take risks. And that is something I'm gonna come back to at the end of this little talk about why that's a great advantage for Taiwan to be an open and successful economy because it's a place where people from all over the world who are brilliant and wanna take risks want to be. And that is the new world that, that we've entered. So I'm gonna talk a bit about where MediaTek is today. Um, I appreciated uh, my, my colleague uh, from Qualcomm introducing their company. Uh, Qualcomm has been in, in uh, Taiwan for uh, more than a decade as a US company investing in Taiwan. But I think even a lot of Taiwanese people don't realize how MediaTek has grown over the last decade. In 2015, MediaTek was a $6.5 billion company. Last year, we were over $18 billion. 
uh, just in that brief period. During that time, MediaTek's growth has been intensely tied to our cultivation of our workforce. Uh, just in the last 20 years, MediaTek has spent 1.5 billion US dollars in our partnerships with the three major research universities in Taiwan. And we have had thousands of co-ops, graduate students and uh, PhD candidates who are working in these research enterprises within universities and then coming to work for MediaTek. We've always seen that as the model that mattered, developing people, even if they don't ultimately end up working for us, they're gonna work in our industry and we feel like that's a very good investment. And you won't be surprised to hear that in the 50 countries where we operate around the world, nine um, major uh, I I enterprises, we follow exactly the same model. Everywhere we are, including in the US, we're partnering with universities, we're training up a next generation of young engineers to solve problems for customers. And it's that sort of human-centered nature of our business that has really resulted in our success. Last year, we shipped $2 billion, excuse me, two, two billion uh, devices worldwide. And those are in products that you know, things like uh, Amazon devices, Microsoft, um, and other uh, handsets. About uh, half of our revenue comes from the handset business. The largest handset vendors in China, the largest handset vendors in the world, really rely on us for solutions. So that's who MediaTek is. I want to uh, switch now quickly to this global independence model. So we heard a bit from our academic partners, and you'll hear more on the panel from me about this. But there's been a real change in the drivers of our industry. Remember I said that our history, that almost is good, but half the price, what has changed, and I think part of it is global politics since you know, uh, you know, global politics has changed, but certainly COVID has fundamentally changed the way men and women around the world approach technology. And instead of it just being driven by price and function, right, we see that there's a new entrant in consumer demand, and that entrant is trust. It is not listed on the bill of goods. When you go to buy your cell phone, you see all the various components that are in your cell phone, and there's not like a trust line, right? But consumers are out there, and they're demanding it, and they're thinking about it in a new way. And again, we were talking about Taiwan's unique role in the world. One of the right things is that Taiwan is on the right side of history, I would, I would posit, because as consumers are beginning to demand trust as a feature in their products, Taiwan is well positioned to answer that call from consumers that we are a trusted supplier and that open, transparent, and I will say here, democratic ally of other democ democratic allies in the region, that is the formation of that trust and that investors know they can trust Taiwan um, and that's uh, evidence of global investment in Taiwan, but partners know they can trust uh, Taiwanese companies. And that is a really key component, and it's not just because it's a nice talking point, it's because consumers demand it. And I don't just mean individual consumers, like me buying a cell phone, but what I mean is our partners, the largest technology companies in the world, they demand that you follow through with what you said, and that's an important component. The second thing, and this is where I really want to wrap up today about what has changed so fundamentally about humans, right? The demand for trust and the willingness to pay for it, and we're still arguing about that. What is the price that people are willing to pay for supply chains that you know are, are, are um, more trusted? But the second part of that is the engineering talent that makes all innovation possible. Guess what? If you have an advanced degree in engineering, you're a very hot commodity. We have an incredible, crushing demand for talent all across the world. Everybody wants more engineers. And guess what? They get to decide what not just their compensation package is, but where they'll live and what kind of quality of life they will have. And again, I would say, as an American standing in Taiwan, this is a great advantage for Taiwan because it's a free, open, vibrant place to live. And engineers who can live anywhere see that. And it's, a, it's a, a thing that I have to take back to our US government when we talk to them about, because I said it's all a drive for talent. Customers demand trust, but talent, people, they demand that you have a respectful quality of life, that it's dependable, that there's lower risk, that there's opportunity and excitement. Those are things that drive this people-focused um, a worldview that really is gonna bring technology to the market because even if you come up with the coolest thing in the world like AI and other products, if people don't trust it, 
it won't be monetizable. You won't be able to make a profit if trust is not at the core of these technologies. Um, people don't want to feel like that they're being acted on by technology. They want to feel like it's a tool. And that for MediaTek is really at the core of what we're doing is we're trying to be aligned with our customers and their demand for trusted, top of the line technology, but also ultimately to reassure governments everywhere we work, right? That we're gonna do what we said we're gonna do, we're gonna follow the rules, but more importantly, we're gonna take care of our people because we, there is no other you know, method to attract the best and brightest. You have to take care of the talent you have. So with that, I guess as an introduction, I'm really looking forward to the di discussion. So thanks very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson, please take your seat on the stage as we're going to move on to the panel. And now we would also like to invite a moderator and a panelist to please join us on stage for the panel discussion. The moderator is Dr. Yen and the panelists include Mr. Liu, Mr. Wilson, Deputy Minister Chen and Dr. Zhang. I will now hand the floor to the moderator, Dr. Yen. Uh, thank you. I think, uh, as expected, this uh, topic is very hot topic that interests all of uh, audience concerned. Because even though we have had, uh, has not finished our presentation. Uh, there are uh, like two or three questions already raised by our uh, audience online. But uh, I think, but I have to say I am quite impressed by uh, the, uh, Mr. Patrick Wilson. For whatever you say, I think uh, I would suggest our government should recruit you as our uh, <laughs> advisor to do the government uh, di diplomacy affairs. You make me really want to move into Taipei already, although I already, <laughs> live in Taiwan. <laughs> but I, I think uh, actually we uh, for our uh, distinguished guests make their remarkable and also insightful uh, presentation. But uh, I think there are a couple of questions I think uh, I would like to raise for our uh, in, uh, first round uh, discussions. Then, then I will go to the questions that come from uh, our audience. And for the I think uh, I would like to uh, raise my question to uh, Deputy Minister Chen. Uh, you mentioned uh, uh, quite a few uh, uh, structural reform for Taiwan's, uh, uh, in terms of trade or in terms of uh, investment, that uh, the structure between Taiwan and also with the uh, global supply chain. But uh, and you also mentioned that there is some uh, legal uh, framework that uh, government has done or established to uh, to remain our uh, Taiwan's competitiveness uh, in this uh, global supply chain. But I would like to ask you: um, Can you uh, ex elaborate more that what Taiwan uh, company? I mean, what key action you believe that uh, we should be focused on by the government? to facilitate? Uh, yeah, yeah, thank you, this is a great question. As Patrick mentioned, uh, the talents is the core. And the connecting to the, from the government's perspective, the connecting to the international supply chain is essential. So uh, these are the most important, as I uh, presented in my slide. The technology and reliability is the, the value of Taiwan, and we want to maintain the value. And on the other hand, uh, a stable relations with men in China is also necessary. So without a an, an stable business environment, uh, there will be uh, much more difficult to do business. So we, we have to figure out uh, the uh, international environment and to increase our resilience. How to increase Taiwanese in, in, uh, resilience? The core direction is make Taiwan necessary for the world. So it's not like uh, when China becomes the global factory, they have a China plus one, but Taiwan never been the global factory. Taiwan always been the key position in terms of research and development, in terms of management, in terms of the regime where people can trust, in terms of where talent will come, and in terms of the government is easy to deal with and keep, can be trustable. So that's the way we will move forward. And 
in, uh, with respect to the legal and structural reform, of course, we have amended our, our, our Industrial Innovation Act to increase our incentive for innovation research development in Taiwan. We also institute some programs and incentive for uh, international companies to set up research and development center in Taiwan. But uh, it's not a, a government policy to increase companies to uh, integrate and become a conglomerate and compete in the international market. So, uh, the government policy is to, uh, uh, to encourage our companies to integrate into international supply chain and become a key player and a trusted partner uh, for the global supply chain. Yeah. Great, thank you. Uh, I want to raise the same question to Jack Chen. What do you think, uh, uh, do you think from your, your private sector or uh, from the uh, academy uh, view, do you think anything that government can do more to uh, faci facilitate Taiwan to uh, to be confronted with this uh, supply chain uh, reform? I think, uh, as the uh, deputy minister has mentioned, since we do have some government uh, uh, policy or uh, uh, subsidy programs. Okay, try to to encourage. For example, we have a specific program for the bio biotechnology and pharmaceutical uh, industry. We also have another. Uh, program, I think, for for companies can can have a uh, tax credit or, or tax reduction if they invest in, for example, in semiconductor, in 5G, or in automation, or in, in cybersecurity related uh, uh, investment. So the government already established and set up a good environment for that. But I think we need to think about the issues not only for companies to have a good uh, investment environment in Taiwan, but also to assist Taiwanese company to relocate uh, their, some of their productions are overseas, okay, to meet different different demands or, or to Taiwanese company to take advantage of the special uh, condition, for example, uh, raw material, their market, or their talent, okay, to, to, to building a manufacturing base in there. But, 98% of Taiwanese company are small, small medium-sized company. So we believe, okay, for, for the best way for Taiwanese company to go invest overseas, we see some good examples before is a leading company bring their supply chain together, okay, to build a new cluster overseas. It may take time, but in the long run, it will pay off. But in during that kind of operation, I think they need the government to negotiate with their destination companies, for example, for possible uh, investment incentives to to find a good piece of uh, industrial park or industrial land for for them to build their their factories. Also, to recruit the talent and to to build up communication with the local communities and to avoid uh, unnecessary disruptions. Okay, if if something happened. So I think all those things we need our, our government assistance. Of course, I think uh, we through the new southbound policy, government al already in doing that. And the MOE already established some kind of investment desk in, in for example, in, in Indonesia and different countries try to facilitate Taiwanese companies to, to do that. So, but as companies always say, they always want more from the government, is that right? So I think there's a, I think there's some, some area I think we can, we, can, we can improve on that and to, to facilitate our companies for their relocation uh, according to their customers demand. Yeah, thank you for uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Jack Chen. But I, I won't force Deputy Minister Chen to respond to that <laughs> suggestion <laughs> because I think probably uh, that is a suggestion that I, uh, I'm not sure it is because we, we might have policy that we uh, we want to encourage more overseas uh, Thai uh, Taiwanese company back to Taiwan rather than to uh, encourage them to invest uh, in uh, overseas. I mean, in other in other place when they move out of their uh, production from China. So, but, but I think that is a good suggestion that I also uh, used to hear from our industry. Do you want to make? Oh, yes, uh, very briefly. Uh, it's a government policy not only to invite the Taiwanese companies to come back to Taiwan, but also encourage them to invest in the region and in U.S. and EU. Uh, the evidence you can see, the uh, investment in the European Union countries, 45.5% uh, of the investment was done in the recent five years. 
accumulated 45.5%. For the United States, 36% is done in the recent five years for the accumulated investment. For the Southeast Asian and India, of course, that's a New South Wales policy. So we set up the Invest Taiwan office in the Asia, ASEAN countries and India to help our companies to uh, resolve any dispute or investment issues there and also use our bilateral vice minister level dialogue platform to try to help companies to relocate the investment in the region. That, that's the government policy. Not only come back to Taiwan, we understand there is a very much strong demand for Taiwanese companies to deploy it globally. Great, we, we have a very open-minded government. <laughs> 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 then uh, I want to address uh, questions for our uh, uh, partic participant from uh, US side. Uh, what is the implication of the de-risking uh, strategy for your sector? I mean, particularly uh, facing this kind of uh, supply chain re uh, reform or what kind of model you will suggest for future collabor collaboration for Taiwan and the United States in your uh, specific sector? Uh, may I ask uh, ST Lee, Mr. Yeah, ST Lee, first? Well, first of all, I think um, I think I want to also comment on one thing about the uh, the uh, the specialities that we observe here in Taiwan. One of the things I'm specifically impressed with is the number of small and medium-sized enterprises we have in this country. And I think the small and medium-sized enterprises in this country, you know, semiconductor is a hot topic, but at the same time, semi the semiconductor has to go into something. And Taiwan companies make a lot of these end products. And a lot of these things, you know, I always make a joke that the space shuttle cannot go up to space if the screw doesn't get shipped from, from Taiwan, as an example. I don't know how true that is, but but the power of small and medium-sized enterprises in Taiwan is just so powerful. Uh, and then, of course, the semiconductors industry. I think these industries carry themselves with uniqueness that compel conversations and they compel very attractive you know, liaison that countries and companies other than you know, outside, of the country, outside of Taiwan would like to have with us. So I'll park that aside and I'll address what you just talked about. In, in specific semiconductor, you know, I've mentioned earlier, semiconductors is characterized by growth and buzz and growth and buzz. This is the DNA of semiconductor industry. Um, we have seen that. Uh, certainly other semiconductor companies have seen that as well. Um, there is, um, if you look at since, uh, since the last 20 years, in 2010, and I, I remember 2017, these two years, had some of the largest growth in semiconductor uh, business these two years. But just, just before these two years, uh, especially in 2008 and 2009, the semiconductor industry saw a huge decline. It was also coinciding with the global uh, downturn at that time. And since the 2017, we saw the pandemic, we saw the chip shortages which drive growth, and then now we're recovering from uh, a decline. It's, um, it's difficult to identify the unique characteristic of each of this cycle. But I think the role the government can play is actually to, you know, you, you can't nail down to just one thing, but the, the government can play is def definitely addressing the topics we are talking about today. But incentivize research and development. I, in my speech earlier, I keep talking about research and development. Research and development will change many, many things. It will it will improve the manufacturing process. It will bring technologies to bear and drive a lot of talents that, you know, Mr. Uh, Patrick Wilson was talking about. And that will change many, many things and, and also will derive the uniqueness and differentiation that Taiwan can bring. So if you look at the investment in, like, in the last 10 years in Taiwan, in this sector, $750 billion invested in Taiwan, mostly in you know, uh, computers and electronic manufacturing, including semiconductor industry. Um, I think that, you know, if you look at this, the U.S. semiconductor company like ourselves have benefited by, by being able to outsource the manufacturing process of it, the part of it to, to Taiwan. And then U.S. company invested in uh, development, in, in R&D. I think this, uh, this represents a very good relationship between 
the United States and, and Taiwan, I would call it the comparative advantages. Um, you know, complementing this, if I were to say that what the two countries can do going forward will be, number one, you know, we need to keep navigating through present and future supply issues by, by sharing information of the ecosystem so that the flexibility is there for us to, to, uh, to mutually manage the, 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 the problem or the issues or the challenges. And at the same time, keep incentivizing R&D, 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 so that we, we keep ahead of the curve in terms of the manufacturing process, in terms of developing the tools, the, 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 the advanced design of chips, et cetera, et cetera. The second thing I would suggest would be, given the relationship, the two parties should, should exchange policies ideas, you know, spectrum management, for instance, drive foundational technologies. Foundational technologies are different from, you know, just put an R chip into another device that another 10 countries can do. Qual uh, Qualcomm and, you know, uh, and many of our cohorts uh, in the same industry has the capability to work with many of our small and medium-sized uh, enterprises here in Taiwan to do that. But foundational industry, foundational technologies, 5G, CV2X, AI at the edge, et cetera, et cetera, are things that compel people to come talk to us about. You know, that's what I think the US company can do, the US government together with Taiwan can do. The third thing I would say is that as the parties continue to have dialogues on you know, export control and investment screen, um, it should be done from a first principle of, uh, from a starting principle of a very targeted, very multi multilateral, and uh, very narrowly applied uh, basis. And then finally, again, go back to my central message is about R&D, is that we need to, and we should convene working parties that look into critical and emerging technologies that both countries, with the talents that Mr. Patrick Wilson was talking about th that Taiwan have, and the more, also at the same time, a lot of talents throughout the world in the United States and elsewhere, but specifically in these two countries, put together a working team that can look at what are the emerging critical technologies that two, two entities, two countries can devote and go do something about that. That would be how I see you know, how we, can, we should and can navigate through. Otherwise, there's no one solution for a very complex problem. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for uh, Mr. Uh, Liu. I think I want to echo for your suggestion that we should, uh, we should build up a dialogue and a more collaboration about a discussion that what is our, uh, how, what is our common interest about the critical sectors or emerging uh, technology uh, foundation or uh, foundation uh, sector. And I think that is also the reason that why uh, we want to urge that uh, there should be some substantial participation, opportunity for substantial participation for Taiwan to join IPEF supply chain uh, agreement because we know there is uh, ongoing discussions about uh, critical sectors, uh, key goods and related essential services that are ongoing among IPEF members. And that is actually the information that Taiwan needs to uh, gather, and that we also want to uh, keep uh, in the same line that we we will uh, we will in the same line with all those like-minded partners like uh, IPF members. And okay, and I will uh, drop the, the same question over to uh, Mr. Uh, Patrick Wilson. I mean, about what what do you think that uh, what kind of a uh, uh, future col collaboration that we can do? for our future uh, US and Taiwan? Uh, well, thank you, uh, Dr. Yu. Um, I, I guess uh, one of the things I mentioned in my, my opening comments, right, about there's a fundamental humility about Taiwan innovators and Taiwan founders that is so uh, awesome, really. And so the one pull that I would give you for today is that you know Taiwan's really great superpower, right, is collaboration. They want to partner with people, whether that's uh, SMEs or partner countries. They see themselves not as dictating to anybody, right? But that superpower of collaboration is really imbued in their policy. So with that said, I'm going to transition, and I guess to say to my government friends who are here, 
um, you'll get to hear what I tell every government around the world, right? In uh, technology, there are only two uh, dials, right? Every government in the world, particularly coming out of, and I was going to correct uh, um, ST about this, I never say that we had a chip shortage that didn't exist. We had a demand surge, right? Because <laughs> the, U the world production of semiconductors had never been higher. So it wasn't a shortage, it was a surge in demand that industry had to respond to. So that's a tick that I have. But uh, going back to the two dials, right? If you're sitting in any government office anywhere in the world, this is what your palette is. You have talent and you have capital deployment. That's it. You don't have anything else. So everything that governments do, they control those two factors. And I say to uh, members of Congress, I would say to members of parliament or any mayors or governors around the world, I always say on the, the capital side, whatever you want, whatever comes in when somebody comes to lobby you about something they want, right? The question is, does it make it more or less likely capital will be deployed here? You tell me. <laughs> Force every person who wants to achieve some policy outcome to say, does this drive capital deployment here? If not, I'm very skeptical about it. <laughs> That's the first dial, right? The second one is talent. And that is a tougher one, but the cr same uh, sort of binary choice, which engineers love, right, is exactly the same situation. Does it mean it's more or less likely that brilliant innovation will happen here or somewhere else, right? And so getting the policies right that drive the workforce, the people to want to do innovation where you are, that really should be the focus of government. And I tell this to the US government, to the European government, everywhere that we operate around the world, <coughs> if you want more innovation, you have to make this an attractive place to deploy capital, and you have to make it an awesome place for brilliant people to work. That's it, right? Everything else is just a subset of that. And Taiwan has done so many of the right things, right? Helping to, to incentivize young people to choose careers in engineering, right? And providing the research collaboration like from Itri and all the, the noble leading universities in Taiwan, they have been committed to creating you know, these careers for young people. And that's why Taiwan is the leader. And I just wish that from a policy perspective, maybe every politician should have like those two charts on the wall, right? And when people come in to lobby them, they should point at it and say, which one are you helping me with? I wanna make capital deployed here and I want more talented people here and then go, right? Do your pitch uh, from there. And you know, one last point, um, uh, Dr. Du, is that uh, I, the fundamental humility of Taiwan, right, about their countries and the sensitivity of urging Taiwanese companies to go and invest other places for resiliency. And I know that's a difficult subject politically, but I think it's something about which that Taiwan, as their industry has matured, Taiwan is essential. It's the leader of the world. And like these global leading companies, you want them to go out and conquer, right? And expand their fiefdom and be a real leader in the world. And I think that's where Taiwan is right now, is that maybe, you know, in the past they were more humble, they were a contributor, but now they're the leader. And what do leaders do? They lead. They go and lead. And that's certainly the generation of entrepreneurs, small business people from Taiwan today. They're going out doing world leading things. They're creating new technologies, new software, new innovations in AI and other things that lead. And you know, that's the coolest thing, basically, is seeing leaders lead. Yeah. Thank you very much. I really strongly recommend. <laughs> 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 I, I, I think uh, Patrick's uh, suggestion of the uh, two dials are very impressive and uh, very uh, precise and uh, concise. But uh, for the government perspective, I think uh, we also have to look at the economic security, yeah. uh, national security, and also, of course, of course, like a disaster prevention and treatment. Uh, that's why we have a climate policy. That's why we have energy policies. So uh, I think it's, it's a bit more complex for the government to manage. <laughs> but I do take your point. That, that's a very. <laughs> okay, so I think uh, it is about time to check our uh, questions from our audience. And I think, Deputy Minister, you are the hotspot today. <laughs> so, so there are three questions that 
uh, directly addressed to you. Uh, the, the, the first one that he like to ask that about, uh, about the uh, increasing um, strategic competition between, between the US and China. Uh, would that be, would that be a, uh, would Taiwan will provide some subsidy to help our uh, multilateral uh, company to, to uh, get used to or to get, to maintain our uh, uh, advantage? in this global supply chain regime? Uh, let me be very brief because in the interest of time. Uh, for the strategic competition between the United States and the uh, People's Republic of China, we should look at the, uh, the respective policy. Uh, both claim they will promote a trade agenda based on multilateral trade rules. However, there are different approaches. For the US, uh, now is featuring uh, small yard high fence. For China, it's dual circulation, which is aimed at uh, uh, self-sufficiency. So obviously there will be a clash. For Taiwanese companies, because we, as I said, we work with international supply chain. So we will follow the international trade rules and try to integrate into it. Uh, for government to provide subsidies for companies, I, I am a bit baffled uh, what does that will entail. Uh, any kind of uh, uh, subsidies. But as Patrick said very well, we incentivize companies to uh, invest in research development and to collaborate uh, with international companies to do research and development in Taiwan, and we provide incentive. We think that will help companies to have their resilience and their age. When they are needed, they are strong. So that, that's a yeah, very uh, simple point. Okay, uh, the next two questions is uh, addressed to uh, about the uh, re trade relationship between Taiwan and India, uh, particularly about the uh, uh, India Middle East Europe Economic uh, Corridor Initiative. Uh, to would like to ask your comments on this initiative. Initiative that is any possible that we can we can uh, uh, repeat to follow this kind or the, the same model of this kind of uh, initiative? That's a fairly recent phenomenon when President Joe Biden visited India and then he, he uh, called out this picture. Well, it's what is now going on. It's what is happening. If you look at the map uh, from US to Europe, then to India, and there is a Middle East. So we need to just to connect in the dot. For Taiwan's deployment, uh, I, I have said that our investment into the North America surge these days, our investment to India uh, increased a lot. I think that would increase furthermore in the, in the uh, coming years. And our relations with uh, uh, Central and Middle East of the Europe now is very, very uh, warming up. Like our relations with Czech, with Slovak, with uh, Poland, with Lithuania, so uh, you will see it's almost on the news every week. Uh, we have some uh, uh, mutual visit. We have collaboration project. We have uh, research development project. Where because these countries they have a very sound and deep uh, industrial base, which fit into Taiwan's business model, where is the technology led uh, manufacturing supported development model. So so we are working very uh, closely, and now the uh, the gap is in the Arabic, the uh, the Asia part, where uh, we have a less relations. But we we will follow the uh, the international development. I think uh, the government is open to that development. Right. I was I was just going to comment uh, actually uh, to commend uh, the government of the day right for their focus on building relationships with India, very important uh, to MediaTek. But I wanted to underscore too about the search for talent, right? Uh, you know, whether it's uh, in mainland China, right, for MediaTek, we want to go and find the most talented engineers in the world, wherever they are. And sometimes that's Europe, sometimes that's India, maybe that's mainland, uh, certainly in, in Taiwan. But it is that search for talent that is at the core of a lot of these uh, innovation partnerships um, to get to those really talented folks. Great. I think, yes, because time will. Uh, Interest, I would think we'll open one question for audience. Um, I'm afraid it's going to be three questions because oh, my questions. neighbor okay. who sadly had to leave the head of the trade section of the ETO also asked me to ask her a question. Thank you very much for the really interesting uh, speeches. 
Um, building on to what uh, Deputy Minister Chen also mentioned, next to the two dials, we have economic security and national security. Uh, my name is Yiki Verlare. I'm the coordinator for economic resilience in the Dutch representative office in Taiwan. And one of the similarities between Taiwan and the Netherlands is that both of us don't have our own critical raw materials to mine, but they are an enabling factor to keep our supply chains secure. So I'm very interested to hear uh, from ITRI and MOEA what the Taiwan government is thinking about their critical raw material policies. Um, the second question, very briefly, is because I know this news just broke, but uh, do Qualcomm or MediaTek expect to have any impacts on their supply chain security from the new export curbs uh, imposed by the US and from the ETO. Sorry for having so many questions, can be brief answers. She wanted to ask what the role of the Taiwanese government is in the CHIP4 alliance. Thank you very much. Probably, Jack, you can Responsible for the first one, critical material. I think uh, Taiwan's lack of uh, uh, key uh, raw materials, okay, like some other nations like Japan. So I think first we think uh, th those companies do is try to use the so-called the circular economy concept, okay. So for example, for most of the ICT products, if they are being uh, consumed in Taiwan, in the end of their their lives, okay, they there are some government uh, uh, regulations, okay, they need to go back to the for 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 reprocessing, or we can decompose the component and then to extract the the, the valuable minerals or raw materials from that. So we call them uh, 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 it's uh, some kind of circular economy. And for example, we have do a study. For example, for aluminum. Okay, if we use recycled aluminum, for example, all the coke. Okay, you drink, you drop the cans, and they go back to recycle. It only use about six percent of the energy compared to if you have to go to a, a, a virgin okay, uh, ore to, to extract the, the aluminum. So it's a very attractive way, not only from the cost perspective, but also from the, for example, for, for, for the greenhouse gas emission point of view. So I think for most of the Taiwanese companies, they are thinking about how could they circulate their, 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 their raw material to, 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 to enhance, okay, to secure the supply. Other than that, I think some companies have tried to, to, to go to overseas to work with other companies, try to uh, retain, okay, the, the raw material supply. I think the government will, will have some kind of policy to stipulate what kind of raw material is important. For example, we have doing project for the semiconductor industry to, to help them, okay, to, to recycle or, or, or to, to, to refurbish, okay, all the, all the minerals, all the acid, or, or different kind of chemicals using the process, okay, to try to enhance the competitiveness of, of the industry. Also to, to, to reduce the requirement, okay, to have virgin material to be used in, in, in the coming years. Okay. I think the, uh, you can have. For the uh, critical raw material, uh, Taiwan is the consumer rather than the supplier. Uh, the, the supply chain, you have to mine it, you have to process it, you have to purify it, you have put into some sort of product, then you can sell it, and we are the buyer. So we are talking to our supplier, primarily the US, Japan, uh, some European countries, and, and uh, Canada, Australia, we try to establish some sort of collaboration just to ensure the supply. So uh, I think Taiwan is willing to work with uh, our partners to ensure the supply of uh, critical raw materials. And the other things, like Jack just, uh, just mentioned, uh, Circular economy is, a, is another very important approach. So we are also reviewing our policies, whether we can increase our recycling capacities and to extract some of the critical raw material. And on the uh, uh, chip four, uh, because it's a, a very informal dialogue uh, forum among four countries, so uh, uh, I cannot speak on behalf of other partners, but in any, in any way, that is not a formal arrangement, it just means uh, exchange of information uh, because uh, uh, as uh, uh, Jack and uh, Dr. Liu uh, and, and also Patrick mentioned, this is a very complex supply chain. There is a need for uh, partners to exchange information. So, so uh, uh, just for the, uh, to prevent any supply chain disruption in the future. 
Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, I think it's about time, so I please join me to thank you our uh, uh, distinguished speakers uh, in this session. Thank you. Thank you very much to Dr. Yen for moderating the session, and thank you to all panelists. We would like to invite the panelists and moderator to have a group photo. So please uh, take one step forward. Let's have a, a group photo down the stage. Yes. <laughs> All right, please look at our photographer with a big smile. Thank you. Thumbs up for the photo. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much, thank you. And ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our morning session. We will now break for lunch and lunch is served at the Brasserie restaurant on the first floor. Uh, you can use the lunch voucher provided to you at the reception for lunch and our next session will start at two o'clock. So please be back by two, thank you very much. We提醒现场的贵宾，我们中午用餐的地点是在一楼的百利厅。您可以使用报道时提供给您的餐券入场。谢谢。
Ladies and gentlemen, our next session will start at 10 past 2, so we still have about 10 minutes. Thank you for your patience.
Ladies and gentlemen, our next session will begin in about one minute. So we would like to invite everyone to please take your seats. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, our next session will begin very shortly, so please kindly take your seats. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Welcome back to the seminar on digital trade, supply chains, and economic security. We will now proceed to the third panel today, and in this session, we're going to focus on how to respond to economic coercion and how can like-minded countries work together to alleviate the effects of economic coercion. Please welcome the moderator for the session, Dr. Bonnie Lane, Senior Fellow at CSIS. Welcome, Dr. Lane. Hi, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, so w I'm very excited. Uh, we this for this panel, we actually have two tasks. The first task is to discuss uh, Chinese economic coercion, and the second task, right after lunch, is to make sure that you all stay awake. Uh, so with that, let me introduce our four speakers. I will introduce them in the order that they will be presenting, and I'll also briefly discuss what I asked them to cover for this panel. So our first speaker will be Dr. Uh, Yang, Min, Yang Ming Min. Uh, he is a assistant research fellow at the Taiwan WTO and RTA Center of CIER. And I've asked Ming Min to focus on um, understanding and, and unpacking the types of economic coercion that China applies to Taiwan and how do, the, how do they differ from the types of coercion that China applies to other countries or regions. And I've also asked him to assess whether China has been successful in using economic coercion to achieve its goals vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan. The second speaker we will have for this panel is, Bethan is Bethany Allen Ibrahimian. She is a, rep a China reporter at Axios and author of a new book, Beijing Rules, How China Weaponized Its Economy to Confront the World. And it's been named, and her recent book has been named by the fin Financial Times as one of the top business books of the year. Um, and I've asked Brittany to cover, to, discu to discuss how to provide a larger perspective looking at overall Chinese economic coercion, not only against Taiwan, but globally. And of course, she will cover some of the main findings from her book. Our third speaker today is Dr. Li Junyi, from the, uh, and he is an associate research fellow at the Division of National Security Research at INDSR. I've asked Juni to cover look, looking at how China pairs economic coercion with other coercive instruments of power. So for example, how does China pair economic coercion with military instruments of power? And is China more or less willing to use economic coercion compared to other types of power? And finally, last but not least, is my colleague, uh, Matthew Reynolds from CSIS. He is a fellow with the economic pro economics program there. And I've asked Matthew to help close out the panel by discussing the various different perspectives on how the United States and our allies and partners can deal with economic coercion. That includes, for example, how we can work with our allies and partners and what discussions are happening in DC right now. So with that, um, let me just turn the floor to these panelists. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now our first panelist is Dr. Yang Ming Ming, Associate Research Fellow at CIER. I will now hand the floor to Dr. Yang. Um, thank you, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here and with all the distinguished uh, panelists and audience. Uh, let me have a brief introduction of China's economic coercion 
uh, applies to, to Taiwan. Basically, Thai, uh, Chinese economic coercion uh, against Taiwan, you can put it into three major tactics. The first one is about the uh, tourist restriction. The second one uh, is about uh, trade, uh, either import or export. And the third one um, will, be, or, um, will be Chinese uh, government try to single out certain uh, private entities, uh, either private firms or NGO as a target for economic coercion. Um, okay, so, the, so the for, for the first one, um, uh, tourist rest restriction. I think most of you are familiar with this topic. And because just right after uh, President Tsai Ing-wen got elected in 2016, and uh, we face, uh, Taiwan faced uh, some of the uh, cut down of uh, uh, two, uh, two group uh, from China, uh, about like 40% during that time. And right, er, right after that in 2019 and 2021, uh, China um, also did similar um, action on Taiwan after that. Um, okay, great. And for the second part about trade, um, Beijing also applies to multiple uh, restriction for the import from Taiwan, mostly about fruits, um, all kinds of fruits from um, wax apple, um, pineapple, uh, sugar apple, all kinds of apple can you think of, and all those fruits um, you can think of. By the way, it's actually a great list of uh, group, like great fruit in Taiwan. You should try all those fruits that get a comic origin from China. Okay, um, and other than that, in um, this year, uh, China also launched an investigation into Taiwan's trade barriers on uh, 2,455 Chinese products. So, so on and so forth, China is using uh, trade um, as economy coercion. Um, Okay, and the last one um, is just right after um, House Speaker uh, Nancy Pelosi visited Taiwan uh, last August, and uh, uh, Beijing uh, leased, black leased uh, four companies and also two NGO as the pro-independent uh, com uh, company. Okay, and, and this is actually not the first time Chinese are doing that. Um, just a year before this event, uh, Far East Group, uh, Yuandong Jituan, they're being targeted as economic coercion for the, the Chinese uh, government, saying they, like the Far East Group, is also pro-independent uh, company. Okay. So actually, this is the list um, made by CSIS, but uh, it's major, majorly target on, um, you can see, uh, from all these tools from the trade, uh, from the Beijing side, uh, Taiwan is an example, uh, almost cover all of it. Um, either it's multiple ways, like uh, Chinese is doing the economic coercion toward Taiwan. Other than that, um, sorry, oops. Oh, I just finished it, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, other than that, from travel um, restriction to propaganda, uh, you can see uh, Beijing is do, doing like quite similar thing uh, to Taiwan as if to other countries, all right? Um, so how does Taiwan government uh, re react or respond to this kind of economic coercion? And we can use fruits as an example. Uh, Department of Agriculture uh, in Taiwan uh, basically use, uh, it's a simple word, it's just diversification, uh, diversify, uh, trying to help uh, Taiwanese farmers to find the other uh, destination for export. Um, the way to do that is either using subsidies or um, invest into, say, storage and frozen technology or food processing technology helping those farmers to make the fruits products like make into another um, food uh, products and to export uh, to uh, the, all the other places other than China. Um, for example, um, during the time that we got economic coercion from China against the pineapple, 
the government is trying to help uh, those uh, pineapple farmers to shift their export toward mainly uh, Japan. And Japan during that time is trying to uh, help us quite a lot. Okay. And uh, so if you ask, so has China been successful in achieving its goals uh, uh, in Taiwan? I will say uh, in general, no. Um, let's put it into three main um, target for uh, Chinese government they try to coerce on. The first one, of course, is try to make sure the Ch Taiwanese government is changing the way of behavior. Okay, the first thing. The second thing, of course, is trying to make sure the public opinion is against Taiwanese government. And the third, third part is trying to make sure the ally is not helping Taiwan. And for these three aspects, I don't think um, any of them, uh, Chinese government is successful. Saying that, did Beijing successfully force Taipei to accept 92 consensus? The answer is no. Does CCP successfully present, prevent Taiwan from electing pro-independent party? This, the answer is still no. And does China prevent the US from helping Taiwan such as arms sales, military aid? The answer is still no. So I will say that um, maybe for certain tactics, it harmed Taiwan's uh, industry, um, but as like political goal for the Beijing side, it's not that helpful. Okay. And even that, sometimes this kind of strategy backfired. Um, you can see this is the survey um, from uh, a survey company in Taiwan and zero means dislike China, and 100 means like really like China, okay? So you can see like in, after all this year, in 2022, um, a lot of Taiwanese just um, dislike um, China quite a lot for those, all the either economic coercion or other policy uh, from the Beijing side. So I would say that, um, Beijing in general is kind of losing um, the kind of people in Taiwan basically losing face uh, in, in Beijing these days. Yeah, so basically this is my uh, presentation. Uh, thank you. Uh, hopefully that's uh, uh, helpful for discussion later. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Yang. Dr. Yang, please be seated. Thank you. And now we would like to invite our next panelist, Ms. Bethany Allen Ebrahimian. China reporter at Axios. Welcome. Thank you so much. I'm really delighted to be able to speak with you today on um, what is what I what what I think one of the the most important topics um, facing um, foreign policy today. And that is China's economic coercion. And um, I didn't bring this book, but this is Derek's book, and he said I should show it to you. I mean, it's my book, but it's Derek's copy of my book, uh, so that you can see that I, I just wrote a book on this topic, Beijing Rules. Uh, if you're interested, you can buy it on Amazon, um, <laughs> although it's not available yet in Taiwan. In any case, uh, the, a key concept in my book that I'm going to talk about today is what I call China's authoritarian economic statecraft. This is a, a slightly different way to refer to, a larger umbrella term to refer to China's economic coercion. And I refer to it that way because it, it's, you know, economic coercion is kind of the stick side of it, you know, punishing behavior that Beijing doesn't like, but there's also carrots to it as well. And, you know, economic statecraft as a term, of course, refers to the use of uh, a government's use of the economy that it sits over to achieve geopolitical purposes, not to achieve purely economic purposes. So we're not talking about trade wars here. Man, one of my least favorite things in the world is when like other journalists refer to the, the tariffs that China put on Australia back in 2020 as a trade spat. I can't stand that, it's not a trade spat. You know, this is, this is political pressure that China's putting on Australia. But, you know, I add the word authoritarian, authoritarian economic statecraft, because the way that the Chinese government uses its economic power is both to accomplish authoritarian goals and sometimes through authoritarian or illiberal means. So when I, I use that term, uh, authoritarian economic statecraft, I mean 
the quite innovative ways that Beijing uses the power, uses access and denial to its economy, its investments, and its capital to shape the behavior of governments, uh, multilateral organizations, companies, and individuals around the world. Now, in the beginning, this was something that um, was used uh, we, in the early days when we were first beginning to be aware of this. It was often referred to as extraterritorial censorship because uh, we often saw this, that you know, Beijing would do this to punish companies or whoever for something they said. But that's really just a very shallow understanding of the way that China uses its economy for political purposes to extend its power. It's really a, a comprehensive form of national power. And I argue in my book that it's actually China's primary form of power extension right now and will be for the next several decades. Uh, certainly, China is developing its military power. Certainly, China is uh, developing its diplomatic um, ties and alliances, but for now, the basis of much of its power extension is its economy. Now, I want to talk some about what I mean by this being a comprehensive form of national power that shapes decision, government decision-making, uh, defense decisions, uh, multilateral organizations, and, uh, and, and indeed is trying to reshape the, the whole world that we're, that we're in. But I'll start with, um, with some of the, the, the earliest known example that I, significant example that I can find, something that we're all familiar with. 1997, the two movies that came out that year about Tibet. Uh, seven years in Tibet and uh, um, Quin Dun about the Dalai Lama. So when those movies came out, the Chinese government barred the studios that made them from the Chinese market. And in the past 26 years, there has not been one, not one major Hollywood production that has crossed any of China's red lines. That's extraordinary because in 1997, the Chinese economy was about one-tenth the GDP of, uh, of the size of the US economy. And the box office, the Chinese box office, was negligible. It was, it was, there was no money to be made, more or less, in the Chinese box office. And yet, the Chinese government, w government was able to successfully neuter one of America's strongest forms of soft power projection merely with the promise of economic benefit or of wealth in the future, not even immediate wealth. And I give that as an example because it was incredibly powerful, it was incredibly successful, and it was only on the promise of future wealth. And that as a basis has been uh, what we've seen China build on for the past 26 years. Now that's, that's a speech kind of, that's, a, that's censorship if you will, but this also affects uh, very basic defense decisions. And there was recent news this week uh, that I think is a, a, a great example of how effective this kind of power can be. Reuters reported that last year, the South Korean government um, put out an arrest warrant for a South Korean uh, CEO, the executive director of a South Korean marine technology company, because that company was working with Taiwan on Taiwan's indigenous submarine uh, initiative. Of course, last month, Taiwan unveiled its first indigenous submarine, something that the Chinese government has long opposed. And in the affidavit that was issued for the arrest of this South Korean um, CEO, the police cited the THAAD uh, controversy back in 2016 as a reason that that company's behavior went against South Korea's own national security interests. So THAAD, of course, being when the South Korean government agreed or uh, installed a US-made missile defense system, um, uh, that known as THAAD, and the Chinese government had, you know, sweeping, uh, levied sweeping sanctions on various sectors of the South Korean economy. So we just now know this week how deeply that affected the South Korean government, so much so that they arrested one of their own citizens simply for working with Taiwan on their indigenous submarine project, which is not against South Korea's national interest. It's actually probably supports South Korea's national interest, except because of the fear of coercion from Beijing. Of course, Taiwan is ground zero for this kind of coercion. Taiwan is ground zero for any, f basically every form of Chinese government power projection, whether uh, in gray zone behavior, whether it is disinformation, election meddling, um, united front work, 
or uh, economic coercion. Uh, and Taiwan has been you know, the, the, first, the, the first target of that. What should we do about it? I'll just very briefly, and we'll get into to more of this in a moment, um, sort of three approaches. One of them is to have a, a larger uh, sort of official organization. Some people say, call it economic NATO. Uh, others call it an you know, economic mutual defense uh, mechanism of some kind to uh, um, immediately um, take punitive measures against China when it, when it uses economic coercion um, or to uh, provide emergency assistance to uh, the, the victims of that coercion. Of course, it's very difficult for the world and for the US right now to try to create new organizations. So doing this in an ad hoc way helps as well. There's also, uh, I have 14 recommendations in my book for domestic measures that countries can take to help shift the market incentives for their companies. When companies uh, bow to these demands from Beijing, it's really important to understand that these companies are not the agents of the CCP, they are acting logically according to the market uh, incentives and distortions that Beijing has placed on it. So if you want to shape the behavior of companies, you don't do it by naming and shaming them, although you can do that too, that's fine, but rather by changing their own market incentives. And I, I uh, lay out some specific ways to do that. And I think my time is up. Thank you very much for this very insightful <laughs> uh, sharing. Thank you. And next, our next panelist is Dr. Li Jingyi, Associate Research Fellow at the Institute for National Defense and Security Research, INDSR. So I will now hand the floor to Dr. Li. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me here. Um, I think my contribution here and uh, is to provide a security-oriented perspective, the perspective of hybrid threat to uh, answer the questions uh, Bonnie asked. Um, the idea of hybrid threat was developed mainly after uh, 2014, uh, after the Russian annexation of Crimea. And it has been developed most mostly in, in the European context. Briefly speaking, the idea suggests that, uh, that uh, a, a state will use uh, a combination of uh, national tools or instruments to create uh, synergy effect. With that in mind, sorry, uh, previous. With that in mind, I think we can visualize uh, the instrument uh, China launched uh, against Taiwan in this uh, diagram. Um, we can see that uh, there are many, many tools China uses against Taiwan. Uh, but and, and in the political domain, for instance, there are uh, diplomatic and, and political pressure uh, isolation, in isolating Taiwan in international arena. In the military domain, there are PLA uh, incursions into our ADIZ and gray zone activities uh, around Taiwan's outlying islands and so on. And in the economic uh, domain, there are uh, economic coercion, limiting uh, the people-to-people -people exchanges. And uh, in the social and economic uh, uh, domain, there are also uh, inter uh, creating internal division, or so-called the United Front work, and also uh, espionage in both these domains. And I think uh, uh, I don't have to emphasize how uh, much we have experienced uh, Chinese disinformation and misinformation uh, um, uh, operations in Taiwan. And I think uh, this diagram also shows that um, in terms of hybrid threat, nowadays we're still at the stage of discussing, of addressing individual Chinese uh, uh, threat. That is to say, uh, with only one possible uh, exception, which I'll cover later, uh, the Chinese threats to Taiwan uh, so far remains uh, uh, to rely on uh, uh, individual uh, instruments. There is no direct evidence supporting that it is trying to combine all this, one or um, uh, few or more of these instruments to create a bigger uh, effect. So, uh, uh, so uh, I think if we uh, take a look at the uh, economic coercion or economic co uh, statecraft. I think it is also important to note that uh, 
economic coercion also functions uh, to satisfy Chinese domestic domestic political needs, that is, to address uh, the, the rising Chinese nationalism and patriotism that have been uh, have uh, become a, a more important uh, sources for Ch the Chinese Communist Party to maintain to uh, to maintain its uh, legitimacy. And on Taiwan, uh, Chinese economic coercion uh, has these features. Uh, first, it tends to target selective sectors or business rather or instead of uh, the whole of the economy or the society. And the second is in so doing, uh, it tries to pit uh, the affected uh, sectors or business against the other. And this reflects the long-term uh, strategic thinking of China's uh, united framework, or uh, we can understand it as in terms of uh, the uh, divided and rural uh, strategy. And also, um, China's economic coercion uh, prefers to take an informal approach. That is, uh, usually uh, the government, the Chinese government, will not uh, specify the real cause or causes for the uh, uh, restrictive measures uh, I imposed on Taiwan. Rather, uh, it would use some technical problems um, um, to launch to justify the uh, restrictive measures. And so, I think. Uh, a Chinese economic coercion can also be char characterized as a uh, cautious bully, as Professor uh, Zhang Ketian uh, suggests. And I think uh, the perspective of hybrid threats also offers, uh, also uh, enable us to look closely at how uh, economic coercion works. I think, uh, especially in, in the context of Taiwan-China relations, any Chinese coercion functions to have to produce this um, second-order uh, second effects in the political domain. That is, uh, the ultimate objective is to, ch to put pressure on Taiwan's government or to change the, po uh, the people's uh, behavior, the people's uh, view of China or their national identity. So the ultimate goal is, uh, on the, uh, is in the political domain. But to achieve this objective, uh, economic coercion works by creating some first order effect. Uh, in this, uh, uh, this example shows that um, uh, when China uh, uh, limits uh, its tourists to come to Taiwan, uh, the kind of uh, instrument is uh, societal or uh, is in the civilian uh, um, domain. So. But, but in so doing, it creates uh, an, an economic and social effect. It, it harms our tourist, the, the tourist sector, and then it creates an, an impression that uh, the cross-strait economic relations are going down. But, uh, and, and here I ag agree very much with Dr. Yang. Uh, so far, the Chinese economic coercion isn't that effective because I think the problem is that from the first order effects, uh, for the first order effects to, 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 to have uh, a, a bigger effect to, to impact on the political, there must be some extra mechanism. That is, it has to uh, erode the people's trust in the establishment, in, in, the, in the government. So. Uh, I think so far, uh, Chinese economic coercion uh, hasn't shown a tendency uh, for, for, the, for the Chinese government to launch a large-scale uh, restrictive measures against Taiwan. And I think uh, a political explanation for that is that uh, this is a, a massive or a large-scale uh, economic coercion is against uh, the divide and rule uh, logic. And, and also, uh, the impact on Taiwan in terms of national identity and the view of China are uh, uh, is is quite limited or ineffective, because uh, so far, uh, I think uh, it is fair to say that the people's trust in the government is relatively stable or relatively high, and apart from uh, the efforts to diversify our economy or to increase our resilience. I think there are also s several uh, political reasons. One is that the current international political atmosphere, uh, the, 
the environment of uh, uh, U.S.-China strategic competition also helps to maintain a discourse that uh, puts China as an assertive, a revisionist power that seeks to alter the status quo. And also, uh, China's economic coercion elsewhere, its coercion against Australia and Lithuania in particular, uh, shaped uh, Taiwan's public understanding of Chinese economic statecraft. So uh, I think uh, the cause of Chinese uh, economic coercion in Taiwan is attributed to the CCP or, the, or Xi Jinping himself rather than the misbehavior or of the Taiwanese government. But having said that, even if economic, uh, Chinese ex economic coercion is ineffective, uh, China has few alternatives. As we all know that military exercises are costly and cannot, you know, cannot be launched any time uh, when, when the CCP leadership uh, decides. So, uh, in, and also it depends on the weather condition, for instance, uh, uh, in the Taiwan Strait area. And uh, political pressure and diplomatic isolation, uh, disinformation, and things like that has become a new normal to Taiwan. So uh, I think their impact on the society diminishes. So in this context, I think there are not many choices for, for, for the Chinese government. So two likely options, and they are not mutually exclusive. The first is to continue to use uh, economic coercion to put pressure on Taiwan, and regardless of its uh, effectiveness. As I just mentioned, uh, economic coercion in part addresses uh, the CCP's political need. So if Chinese the government has to do something anyway, I think uh, uh, economic coercion is one of the options. And, and second uh, is, to, is for the Chinese government to try something new, that is the hybrid threat. And uh, my time is up, but uh, I think it is, uh, my observation is that uh, if we compared uh, China's responses to um, Speaker Pelosi's visit to Taipei and uh, President Tsai's meeting with Speaker McCarthy, then there is there's a sharp difference in terms of um, the kind of instrument China used. And uh, within one week in this April, China used a gray zone activity in the Taiwan Strait and put uh, political uh, sanctions on, on Taiwan, Taiwanese uh, representative to the U.S. and two NGOs, and it, it launched um, uh, uh, military exercises around the Taiwan waters, and also uh, it launched an investigation of trade barriers. So this seems to me as an early attempt to develop a strategy of hybrid threat. We, we don't have uh, direct evidence supporting this notion, but uh, if it were, if ch the Chinese leadership really tries to develop uh, a hybrid threat strategy and becomes a new modus operandi, then I think uh, there are two possible implications. One is uh, that the Chinese government simply wants to send a stronger message. And, 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 and second is that uh, by seeking to create a synergy effect, uh, it may mean that the, the government, that the Chinese government now abandons uh, the divide and rule and, and, and the co uh, cautious bully approaches. So if this is the case, then it may extend the scale and scope of economic coercion and regardless of uh, its own uh, domestic economic trouble and the consequences. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Li, for your sharing. Dr. Li, please take your seats. Thank you. And our next panelist is Mr. Matthew Reynolds, a fellow with economic programs at CSIS. I will now hand the floor to our next panelist, Mr. Reynolds. Great. Um, thank you. Uh, and thank you all for taking time out of your uh, busy days to, to join us this afternoon. Um, it's a pleasure to be uh, a part of this distinguished uh, panel. As mentioned, my name is uh, Matthew Reynolds, and I'm a, a fellow uh, in the economics program at the Center for Strategic and international studies. I've been asked today to give um, a brief overview of sort of uh, the policy debate, the ongoing policy debate uh, in Washington about how best to respond or counter China's economic um, coercion. So uh, at risk of uh, vastly oversimplifying uh, the debate, uh, the way I see it is that there are uh, two uh, schools of thought about how to respond to China's economic uh, coercion. Uh, the first school, which I call the economic, and uh, Bethany, 
uh, briefly mentioned. I call it the economic uh, NATO or economic Article 5 uh, school of thought. Uh, so this school of thought is, is premised on a, a retaliatory response to China's economic coercion uh, that is uh, threatening to uh, retaliate against China if China engages in uh, economic coercion. Um, this strategy looks to build uh, a coalition of like-minded uh, government uh, countries that would uh, band together, much like uh, you know NATO's Article 5, um, recognize an attack on, on one of them as a, an attack on all, and all uh, together then retaliate against China. Uh, in doing so, this would increase the cost uh, for Beijing uh, in uh, using economic uh, coercion and, in theory, hopefully deter China from uh, coercing any countries in that coalition uh, in the first place. Um, you know, one aspect of this strategy is also that as you grow this coalition, uh, hypothetically, uh, that block of countries would uh, control items that uh, would be difficult for China to source uh, from elsewhere. So you could sort of leverage those, those choke points to uh, 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 inflict or, or make uh, China incur a greater cost for its use of, of economic coercion. So that's like the economic uh, NATO school of thought uh, that's going around Washington right now. Uh, and then the other school of thought um, is one that myself and Matthew Goodman, uh, the former uh, Senior Vice President for Economics at, at CSIS, uh, put forward in our report uh, on China's economic coercion, on how to counter China's economic coercion that we uh, published earlier this year. Uh, and that um, counter strategy looks at uh, countering China's economic coercion uh, through building resiliency uh, and providing relief to targeted countries. Uh, so on the resiliency side, this is a proactive side uh, of this counter strategy. Uh, some uh, of the policy tools that we uh, recommend are proactively looking uh, at vulnerabilities or possible vulnerabilities to China's economic coercion uh, and then seeking to mitigate those vulnerabilities. Um, a way to do that would be through uh, the sort of supply chain resiliency initiatives that we've seen uh, pop up in the wake of COVID-19, uh, but targeting those at uh, China's economic uh, coercion. Uh, another tool of resiliency that we put forward uh, would be the negotiation of uh, free trade agreements, uh, free trade agreements you know, not only uh, you know, tighten the, the economic uh, bonds between uh, the United States uh, and our allies and partners, um, but also can, uh, on a relative basis, uh, reduce the economic influence that China uh, has over our allies uh, and partners. And then on the other uh, side of that, that counter strategy, on the relief side, uh, this would be the reactive side of the strategy. Here we would look to provide targeted relief uh, to firms uh, or sectors that find themselves targeted by China's economic uh, coercion. Um, key here would be to provide that relief as quick uh, as possible. Some tools that we put forward uh, in our report um, are export financing, uh, tempor te temporary tariff reductions, uh, possibly a coercion uh, relief fund. And the goal of, of these relief policies wouldn't necessarily be to make uh, a targeted firm or affected firm whole again, but instead to sort of speed uh, the market adjustments that we already see uh, taking place naturally in response to China's economic coercion, and in doing so, reduce the pressure on the targeted governments uh, so they don't acquiesce to Beijing's um, demands. Uh, so that's uh, our second school of thought uh, in Washington. Um, and then uh, it's important to note that these two schools are not necessarily mutually exclusive. Uh, for example, um, uh, there's been legislation introduced in both the House and the Senate, uh, the Countering Economic Coercion Act of 2023. Uh, this bill would provide uh, the president uh, authorities to not only retaliate against China, uh, but also to provide uh, relief to allies and partners that find themselves uh, you know, subject to, to Beijing's economic uh, bullying. Um, those uh, bills follow on uh, last year's National Defense Authorization Act, which included uh, language setting up a task force um, that's assigned to uh, uh, come up with a counter strategy and report uh, that counter strategy to the executive branch on how to counter uh, China's economic coercion. I believe the interim report is due out uh, by the end of the year, and then uh, the final report is due out uh, next year. And then real quickly, uh, to conclude, before we go to Q&A, uh, at the international level, we are also seeing uh, uh, policy responses to China's economic uh, coercion. So the G7 earlier this year uh, put out a statement uh, condemning uh, the use of economic coercion and also created uh, a coordinating platform to share information uh, and to act as an uh, early warning uh, system. Uh, the EU, uh, in many ways, is actually sort of ahead of the curve on um, countering China's economic coercion. Uh, earlier this year, they uh, implemented or adopted uh, what they're calling the anti-coercion instrument. Uh, the anti-coercion instrument would provide Brussels with authority uh, to retaliate against uh, China if any EU member state finds themselves subject uh, to Beijing's economic 
coercion. So in that sense, the, the EU sort of counter strategy through the ACI uh, reflects much more of the economic NATO school of thought uh, that's popular in Washington uh, right now. Uh, so with that, I will uh, turn it back over to our host, uh, please if you may. Thank you very much, Mr. Reynolds. Mr. Reynolds, please uh, be seated on the stage as we are going to move on to the panel discussion. And I will now invite the moderator and the panelist for this panel to please take your seats on the stage. The moderator is Dr. Bonnie Ling, and the panelists include uh, Mr. Reynolds, uh, Ms. Alan Ebrigimian, Dr. Lee, and Dr. Young. Please take your seats on the stage. All right, I will now hand the floor to the moderator, Dr. Bonnie Ling. Great, thank you very much. Great, thank you very much. So I think there's a lot to unpack. I, uh, I have very specific questions for folks, but maybe um, it would be interesting to unpack some of the differences that were presented in the last hour or so. Uh, there we actually got a variety of positions. On one hand, for example, we had Bethany providing very clear examples of how effective Chinese economic coercion has been, both in a, a example from the United States as well as example from the ROK. And then we have two of our Taiwan speakers both saying that China's economic coercion against Taiwan has not been effective. Um, and then we, uh, we have, of course, Matthew showcasing to us the range of discussion within DC. Maybe just uh, zeroing first on the Taiwan case, and I wanna push our Taiwan speakers a little bit on this. Um, on one hand, you're both saying uh, that China's economic coercion against Taiwan is not effective, but on the other hand, you're also saying, and I think this is most clear in um, during your presentation, that China actually hasn't taken too much action against Taiwan, right? So is China's economic coercion against Taiwan not effective because it has been relatively restrained in some of its measures, or, or is it because, as you were mentioning, um, China, there are reasons why China may not want to use economic coercion because it actually may impact their economy. So I just wanted to get a better sense from our, our Taiwan speakers. And related to that is the fact that I think Bethany's example was about China's use of uh, coercion against targeted companies or individual actors, whereas the two of you focused on its, uh, the pressure of economic coercion against the Taiwan government. So if you were to look below the government level, would the impact of Chinese economic coercion be different when looking at Taiwan? So let me turn it to our two Taiwan speakers first, and then I definitely want you, Bethany, to also jump in here to see um, what you're seeing from there, particularly because you're also based in Taiwan. If you're seeing examples in Taiwan that you would actually say, this is a clear example of China's economic, uh, author sorry, authoritarian economic statecraft working in Taiwan. Um, yes, I think uh, if we think about economic coercion as, as, as a Chinese state instrument, and I think it is fair to say that China hasn't really uh, realized its full uh, potential. So theoretically, China can uh, launch a massive uh, economic, uh, or, or launch a massive scale of e uh, economic coercion against Taiwan. But I think it is equally important to think about the Chinese objective. I mean, the objective is not only to cause economic loss on the part of Taiwan, right? The, the objective is always political. So a massive uh, economic coercion may be counterproductive in terms of its pol achieving its political uh, objective. That is to say, um, if, in a, for instance, if China uh, decides to terminate the ECFA. Now, uh, we have, people may have different assessment of the, the economic impacts, but I think, I suppose, uh, the political and psychological uh, impacts in ta on, on, on Taiwanese people would be huge. But uh, in so doing, China risks uh, antagonizing the whole of the Taiwanese society. And then this is not uh, in, uh, in accordance with its political logic that is to achieve uh, national unification and achieving national unification by co-opting one sector or one part of the, the Taiwanese society gradually and to form a united front. So 
I think, uh, theoretically speaking, yes, uh, we, I, I do think it is always possible that uh, China put a, a, a more uh, stricter uh, economic coercion or, or uh, restrictive measures on Taiwan. But I think in, in as, uh, as long as, or in so far as the current uh, political atmosphere is uh, concerned, uh, this, is, this doesn't seem to be a reasonable uh, action for China to take. Um, <clears throat> I think for reaching, I just want to second uh, uh, Dr. Li. Um, talking about uh, to have the political goal for the CCP, you, you definitely you need sticks and carrots in the same time, right? And so, so for the Chinese side, they still want to make sure they still have the, if the day they still want to have peaceful unification in their agenda, and I don't think they will stop using like just, they, they won't use their all potential to um, kind of punish Taiwan, right? So as from that part, I don't see, yes, I think their goal is, is just put punishing Taiwan, but not to destroy Taiwan, yeah. So that's why I think their economic coercion um, is limited. As for the second question, um, I think you're right, uh, because for the for in, like each companies, for example, using the Far East um, companies, they are facing a huge problems in, in China, and dealing with kind of problem is it's like maybe it's like natural disaster, you know. It's like they try to contain everything. They want to be careful, but in the end, still be punished because. Um, we always say that sa ji jing ho, right? You're killing the, the chicken to scare those monkeys. Yeah, so in that sense, the, each individual's companies, it's, they're just a casualty, yeah, sadly. Uh, so Bethany, do you see this logic in Taiwan playing out? And do you, do you think uh, what, what um, uh, Junyi and uh, Mimi mentioned, highlighted, does that also play out in other countries? Yes, well, I, I completely agree um, with uh, what our two Taiwanese speakers have said. Um, and I think that, you know, uh, what I have looked at, I mean, they're, they're talking about the way that China has targeted Taiwan in Taiwan, targeted the Taiwanese government and Taiwanese companies and individuals with economic coercion. And if you look at the ways that, you know, you've, we've seen, um, you know, tariffs or import bans on, you know, Taiwanese beer and pineapples. And, you know, back in the, uh, you know, 2000s, sort of the, the first sort of, uh, you know, attempts at this with, you know, f targeting fruit farmers in a positive way, giving them, you know, beneficial um, trade policies. This is, you know, um, I if the question is, has it worked or not, if, if the answer to that is, is Taiwan still independent, then, then nothing that China has done has ever worked, ever, because Taiwan is still independent, right? And, and so that is correct. In fact, you know, the Taiwanese government um, is still sovereign. But on an international stage, when you look at the way that China uses economic coercion to defend its core interests to third parties, its economic coercion targeting Taiwan to third parties has been extraordinarily and I think undeniably successful. So economic coercion plus economic carrots uh, is a powerful way, what probably the top way that China has poached uh, Taiwan's remaining diplomatic partners, now we're down to about 13. And this kind of economic coercion has gotten harder and harder over time. And if you look, for example, at Lithuania, that's you know, the, the best example right now of the way that you know, Li Lithuania was looking to improve its unofficial relationship with Taiwan, not even official relationship. And China rolled out, probably for the first time, its own version of secondary sanctions to get at Lithuania, because Lithuania doesn't um, export very much directly to China, but rather export it, it has you know, its manufacturing comp components go to, for example, German companies. And they, German companies were finding that their um, products were being held up at customs, not being allowed into China. And so the German companies then talked to the German government about it, whatever. Now, in, in this example, Lithuania, also the Czech Republic, similar situation. These are small countries that have, ha that have very few direct e economic links with China. Uh, the goal, China's goal in doing this. Now, if Lithuania were to reverse its position on Taiwan, that would, you know, obviously Beijing would love that. But what's what's more important that's happening here, and really a, a, a more important concept for the way that China targets third parties, is by changing the decision-making environment. What China has done 
is that every time there's even negative press about its economic coercion, it is, in essence, the world's most successful PR campaign. Every single government of every country in the world um, knows that if it says or does certain things about Taiwan, they, have a, they are facing a high risk of having China do something bad. Everybody knows that, and that is very, very successful. It is, in essence, a deterrent. And you know, so when you see, like, how many countries right now that have close trade ties with China are like really, really trying to like really get close to Taiwan? That you know, are uh, opening new trade offices, um, are taking you know more than more than just sending a few officials here, are actually doing something. There's not, there's some movement there, but not a lot. Really, the trend is in the other direction. So from that sense, um, China's coercion has been very successful. Um, but I, I think, you know, looking at Taiwan, and, and I definitely would leave it to, to the experts about why that hasn't been directly successful here. Uh, but one point that I would just add is that what we see from this kind of, you can call it, you know, gray zone warfare, hybrid, hybrid threats, it is most effective in, in pushing China's core interests to third parties not to the, t the targets of the core interests themselves. So if, tai if the Taiwanese gover government were to submit, the price, you know, the potential price would be the end of Taiwan's existence. It's an existential threat to Taiwan. Economic coercion in the way that China currently uses it does not present an existential threat to anybody, which is what makes it effective to third parties. Thank you, Bethany. I d uh, Matthew, I did want to bring you into this conversation. So as you're looking at the discussion within DC, but also you're re you've done uh, quite a bit of research also on how China has used economic coercion against other countries, do you see a similar logic? Because what we're, 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 what we're portraying here is um, somewhat of a tension between how China uses economic coercion directly on Taiwan versus how China uses economic coercion to pressure third countries not to take various types of action or take position to support Taiwan. Do you see some of those tensions as you look at how China has used coercion against other countries? Or is this a singular or more exceptional case, rather? Um, yeah, happy to try to take a, a, a swing at that. I think one thing to start with is um, when we were looking at uh, China's use of economic coercion for our report that came out earlier uh, this year, one thing we noticed is there's kind of like really two categories of economic coercion I think you got to think about. Uh, one is the sort of coercion that's exercised, uh, you know, uh, in response to something that a government does, right? Uh, and firms or, or commercial actors are sort of the, the intermediary, the means through which China exercises this coercion to try to punish politically uh, country for taking an offending position on, on uh, a policy or implementing some sort of policy that Beijing does not like. There's a, the other category I think that we're kind of talking about here too would be the sort of economic coercion that's exercised at a firm in and of itself. So uh, to use an example that's perhaps relevant uh, here, so for in, in Taipei, uh, would be uh, you know if the gap doesn't include uh, you know Taiwan on a map of China on a shirt, then China retaliates against the gap. That's not something that a government did. That's something that a firm did. So in the latter case, the category of economic coercion, China's economic coercion is, is really quite effective. Firms almost always back down when China uh, courses them. On the other hand, um, the former case, exercise at the state, our report found that, that in most cases, or at least that, uh, in many of the cases that we looked at uh, in our report, uh, China had a mixed record at best of getting uh, the government to acquiesce on the specific issue that uh, uh, triggered the course of response. Uh, you know, that is because a, a firm could acquiesce, but then the government doesn't change uh, its position. And then uh, we kind of zoomed out and looked uh, and found that in the long term, uh, China's economic coercion also carries strategic costs uh, for China. So the Lithuania case is a good um, example of this, right? Uh, uh, the coercion was triggered by the opening of the Taiwanese representative office in, in Vilnius. Uh, you know, China responded with, as, as Bethany uh, just noted there, uh, a sort of a de facto uh, economic embargo on Lithuania, including these informal secondary sanctions. We saw them going after uh, German firms, but the TRO, the Taiwanese Representative Office, still bears, from Beijing's perspective, the offending uh, name on the door. Uh, and I would argue that uh, China's actions accelerated the EU's adoption of the anti-coercion instrument, uh, which ironically was a, a, a policy tool uh, whose origin could be found in, in sort of the uh, response to the Trump administration's trade uh, policy. So there, uh, China's coercion actually turned that uh, uh, sort of trade weapon against itself and away from uh, the United States. So I think that's a good example of sort of the strategic cost that China's economic uh, coercion carries. And then just a, a final point, and I think this is sort of the hardest sort of thing that, to quantify, would be what is the deterrent effect 
that China gets to its economic coercion. If we're debating, uh, you know, why does China keep doing this if it's not getting countries to acquiesce? And it, it, it comes down, I think, in a large part to deterrence. The problem is it's hard uh, to quantify that uh, deterrence. So, I mean, that's a, a report in and of it itself. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it back over to, to Bonnie. Thank you. I do want to do another uh, quick round of questions related to implications and the response to Chinese economic question. And Matthew, I actually want to start with you. So you differentiated between, um, and we actually were talking about earlier too, the difference between Chinese coercion against uh, governments versus coercion against companies or uh, non-government actors. So when you look at the discussion in DC about various measures to respond to that, how, how are companies brought in at all into this discussion? Or is, has most of the discussions in terms of dealing with Chinese economic origin, that has been at the government level in terms of what governments can do to help companies? Yeah, I, I think I'm, I'm off the top of my head. I, I believe that the, the task force set up in the NDAA, uh, they're supposed to engage with, with relevant stakeholders. So I would assume that that means bringing in uh, the private uh, sector. I think when we're, we're talking about uh, you know, the U.S. response, policy response, we're, we're looking more, the, the conversations in D.C. are more around uh, this coercion exercised at, uh, at governments, right, not the ones that's just targeted at firms in and of uh, themselves. I think, actually, when you're looking at coercion targeted just at, at firms, that raises a set of, of different policy questions and responses than the sort of coercion that's exercised at governments. Uh, you know, especially in, uh, you know, free market societies, you'd have to answer questions about the merits of, you know, government intervention uh, in the private, in the decision making of, of private companies. I think those would arise when you're looking to counter China's economic coercion at firms and of them, themselves. So I, I think, to answer your question, I think right now the conversation is more about uh, how can we help countries that find themselves targeted by China's economic coercion, but I, I agree that it's, it's an important question also to talk about the sort of coercion exercise at firms, uh, but that's going to raise a, a different set, I think, of, of policy questions. Sure. Uh, so now I want to turn to our Taiwan colleagues. Uh, um, maybe, uh, maybe since they're sitting next to me, <laughs> I'll direct this question at you first. I, I think you, both of you have talked a little bit about how the Taiwan government has responded to this. Um, have you seen, um, as, we, as you look forward, are you confident that as we're looking at a uh, next presidential election in Taiwan, that if the results of the election are not what Beijing desires, that, the, that your government would be ready to respond to whatever types of coercion uh, China may have in mind, particularly on the economic side? Um, just, just want to clarify, you say confident, right? Yeah, yeah okay. Um, so, confident or not, of course here I have to say I'm confident, <laughs> but uh, uh, I think the, the thing is, um, right now for our government, from my observation, it's still more like whatever happened, then we react. These days, majorly, we do two things. Uh, the first thing is, if anything happened, uh, it's like a firefighter, and we try to deal with that. The second thing is, we try to, these days, from our observation, the government is trying to review whether there is anything um, the kind of the weakness or vulnerability of Taiwan's uh, supply chain these days. And I, I just want to just go back to what Matthew mentioned. Uh, is there are multiple ways to dealing with the economic coercion, but the most important thing is still pre, to deal with the economic coercion before it happened. So the vulnerability is the first thing we, we have to deal with first, because in in Taiwan, if we want to, there's not a lot of weapons we can retaliate against China. And even if uh, we want to do it with another like collision and with other country, we still face a problem is in the future, we're still being the target, the first target of uh, economic coercion, right? So we don't want to kind of provoke China, right? So um, in that sense, um, Taiwan, I think, will be a little bit hesitate, at least from the the, um, the private sector side, saying that we want to like fight back, but to remedies and also check whether there's any problem with our supply chain resilience. That is what our government is doing these days, and I'm confident what our, what our government is doing these days. Thank you. 
Uh, yes, I think uh, first of all, I, I have to say that I will uh, discuss this I this issue in my own personal capacity, and it doesn't reflect the institute I, I'm affiliated with. Um, I think uh, it depends on. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised uh, to see Chinese uh, economic coercion after, uh, if the presidential election is not in favor, is not in China's favor. But I think uh, uh, the forms of economic coercion has to be uh, has depend uh, has to be uh, determined uh, on the uh, according to different scenarios. Uh, I think I, I can discuss two possible scenarios. The first is that uh, if if the uh, the next government, uh, the, I think, uh, if the current government, the, the DPP government, wins both the presidency and the majority of the of the legislature, then uh, I wouldn't be surprised to see uh, China to escalate its economic coercion because uh, the purpose of this uh, uh, of this kind of coercion is to set up the basic tone of uh, the cross-strait relations. That is to limit the scope uh, the next government can maneuver in terms of Taiwan's uh, foreign policy. And another scenario is that uh, uh, the, the, the DPP wins the presidency, but the opposition party or parties uh, wins uh, the majority of the legislature. and and. And this is, I think this is this is a possible scenario because uh, uh, we know that uh, the legislators, uh, once elected, they will assume their office in, in very soon. I think in in the in the end of next January, but the new president will only assume his uh, his or her office his office uh, in May. So there is a period of almost four months where uh, it is possible. It, it is likely that. Uh, Taiwanese people and politicians will discuss how to form the next government, the executive branch. And this may provide an opportunity for China to, to, to manipulate. And if this, if this is the case, then uh, economic coercion may be an ideal instrument for China. And here, I, I wouldn't expect uh, a massive, uh, uh, very harsh uh, economic coercion or restrictive measures because this can be counterproductive. Because if they are understood in Taiwan as uh, Chinese interference into in Taiwan's domestic politics, they will be counterproductive. But uh, some sort of mild uh, uh, economic uh, coercion like the, the uh, some part of our uh, agricultural products are not allowed to export to, ta to China, and then uh, this kind of sanctions are uh, cancelled uh, after some part of uh, after some uh, politicians uh, travel to China. I think this can also send a message that China wants to manipulate or want to shape uh, the political debate in Taiwan. Great, thank you. Uh, and just Bethany, last question for you before I open it up for a Q&A from the audience. Uh, so as you look at the situation, and I know you had a lot of uh, recommendations in your book on how to uh, uh, respond to Chinese um, authoritarian economic statecraft. As you look at the situation in Taiwan, as well as what we discussed internationally, what are recommendations that we haven't discussed so far that you want to highlight for our folks that are looking and trying to examine this issue? Uh, well, in, in my book, I talk about all the things that we that we have talked about today. Uh, but there's also a section in my book that um, it's tailored to the U.S. Uh, political um, environment, to our U.S. domestic environment, and really is looking at um, the, the structure of how we govern our economy. And one of the arguments I make in my book is that the, the reason that uh, China has been able to use economic coercion as a form of power extension. It's in part because of decisions that we in the West made 40 years ago, when we, uh, you know, kind of in the, the Reagan era, the Margaret Thatcher era, uh, embraced a much more lightly regulated capitalism, both domestically and internationally. And so the, the basic principle here, from, from a perspective of how this affects companies, and we can also talk about how it affects government decision making, is that when, uh, if, if the idea is that the primary regulator of social interests should be the marketplace, when a foreign authoritarian government is controlling profits in that marketplace, um, then it makes sense that companies would then respond to that. And so rather than simply coming up with band-aids to put on this, but uh, to actually re-embrace the idea that 
putting democratic guard, regulating the economy domestically to put democratic guardrails back on the economy and on trade behavior is a larger uh, goal that we should go towards. This isn't very like uh, inspiring to talk about it be because a lot of what my recommendations in my book are actually like actually impossible in the US current political system. For example, I say that we should overturn Citizens United, the Supreme Court decision that you know basically um, said that money is speech and give corporations a lot more power uh, in our political system. When corporations have more power in our political system and their profits are being shaped to some extent by Beijing's demands, you can see how this can affect policy making in Washington. Um, I also think we should have campaign finance reform, haha. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, but I have other recommendations as well that are much more feasible, um, such as having fairer registries on the state level in the US. So this is Foreign Agents Registration Act. Uh, there's a federal version of this that's a bit weak, but still useful and functional. There, are, there is no state that has it. And you know the Chinese government does a lot of subnational engagement. Chinese companies and Chinese state enterprises do a lot of state level and local level lobbying, and there's no uh, there's no tr there's very little trans there is no transparency around that. There's no FARA, um, you know, registration for that. Uh, I think we should have FARAs on the state level. I think we should strengthen unions, um, stuff like this. Um, but from a broader perspective, if you know, if we look at the effectiveness of China's economic coer economic coercion, it is about shaping future behavior, right? So if you look, for example, at Norway, the way that Norway's uh, you know, so salmon imports were shut off to China after the. The Nobel Peace Prize was awarded to Liu Xiaobo in 2010. Uh, chill in, in diplomatic relations, and that was finally lifted in 2016 when the Norwegian government publicly told China in public, we will no longer do anything to cross your red lines. Oops, oops, sorry, sorry. Or what the example I gave earlier of the South Korean government, in fact, reinterpreting its own trade law to say that um, you know, engaging with Taiwan's uh, submarine projects goes against South Korea's own national security interests. So that if, if China is, again, creating these sort of market distortions, if you will, that affect government decisions and government uh, decision making in the future, the goal then is to change the perceptions preemptively, to also let all of these governments know for democratic nations to have our own very effective PR campaign in advance, not just as a, ba a band-aid, but in advance to shift that decision making back to where we hope it would be. And you do that by having much more proactive messaging about China's economic coercion, but, but more importantly, about what governments, or what the US government or what democratic partners will do about it. So to say in advance, before anything happens, we commit to providing emergency assistance or making some examples by saying, ah, you know, Lithuania or, you know, some, some, you know, like an island nation has decided to return its diplomatic allegiance back to Taiwan. We will give them, you know, all this, all these extra benefits for doing that. Doing that in advance to help move, to shift that risk analysis uh, assess and assessment back to something closer to what we want. Great, thank you. I do want to open this up to Q&A. So um, for folks in the room first, as well as if there are, in, are any online questions. Uh, if there are no, uh, uh, sure, please go ahead. Uh, thank you for uh, the host. Uh, William Ting, quick question. Uh, this question relates to China's regulation of data. Okay, I think that that's a topic that's as important uh, 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 it's like to the pineapple to Taiwan. Um, data is very important for tech companies, okay, uh, both the hardware side and the software side. And China in recent years have ruled out various rules and regulation regulating data. Right now they're debating about cross data uh, transfer uh, rules, okay, sending data out of China. So long story short, what should be the policy response to address China's regulation of data that goes beyond global norms of data protection? Number one, because we, as we head into the age of AI, data is the pineapple of AI. Um, second question is uh, more relevant to cultural coercion. I, I think economic coercion ties with cultural coercion. Is China, is China effective there on that front? Question mark. Um, and has Tom Cruise done Taiwan a big favor by showing Taiwan's flag on his uh, bomber jacket in Top Gun 2? And um, thank you. 
So I'm going to take the moderator's prerogative and, and, and definitely open the floor to folks who want to answer any of your questions, but also note that your questions are slightly different than the expertise that we've assembled on this panel. Um, and maybe I could add a question to that and then open the floor, open this to any of our experts who may want to jump in on one or, or, or more of the questions. A question that we haven't addressed on this panel is, why is it so difficult to get countries to make progress on one of the two different ways to deal with China's economic coercion? So please, uh, f for f any of the experts on the panel, if you want to jump on any of the questions that William asked or the question I just posed. I'll take a stab at it. I'm sorry, I, the data regulation, cultural uh, coercion out of my uh, field a bit, but I'll take a swing at the why is it so difficult to build coalitions to push back against uh, China's economic coercion or respond to China's economic coercion. I think that is in, in part, right, like comes down to uh, the deterrent effect that you see with China's economic coercion. I think countries are, are worried about joining a coalition that could be seen as forcing them to choose between the United States and China. Um, I think I think this problem, at least from our report and, and why uh, in our report, our CSIS Economics Program report, came down on the side of, of building resilience and providing relief as, as a sort of strategy, uh, is because we felt that that strategy would be more easily multilateralizable uh, in the sense that if you are trying to build an economic NATO or an economic Article 5, you're, you're basically asking countries to sign up for uh, a coalition that would require them to retaliate against China a lot of these countries that are targeted by China uh, by its economic coercion are smaller um, U.S. allies and partners. China, although this is perhaps changing a bit recently, China has been hesitant to go after the United States itself with economic coercion. And, and uh, I think someone um, up here earlier brought up uh, John Katian's article, The Cautious Bully. Uh, you know, that's indicative China sees is, is risk averse in its economic coercion and, and prefers to target uh, smaller economies rather than the United um, the United States. So uh, this is why we feel uh, a strategy premised on providing relief is less directly challenging uh, uh, of China. It might be easier to get countries to sign on onto that sort of uh, uh, counter strategy. I, I'll say one, one other thing I think also when you're looking at retaliating versus providing relief, you have to keep in mind the preference of the countries that's being targeted themselves. So uh, in the course of our um, our research, we uh, engage in some interviews under Chatham House rule with uh, officials from uh, the countries that have experienced China's economic uh, coercion, and, and most of them said that you know if if while they were being coerced, the United States came in and, and, and retaliated against China, that would most likely make uh, the problem worse and escalate. And they instead preferred a strategy that would lead to de-escalation, uh, which again is why we came back down on, on relief there. I'll just add add one completely agree and just add one more point is that you know the the global economy is very complex and a lot of people and markets are competing with each other and so in let's talk about the case of Australia so you know China's um, very steep tariffs on Australian wine that was a great opportunity for other wine producers to then uh, you know have their wine um, imported into the Chinese market instead so like US wine producers were like great you know we now there's you know more demand from China for wine that isn't Australian but that is also foreign wine and so you have this sense of competition when you know when when one industry is losing out it's you know it's a uh, it, it's great for other ones and it's it's hard to push back against that dynamic it takes a lot of trust it takes a lot of um, persuasion um, you know, from, from government officials, and, like, people are busy. And I think in the U.S., you know, kind of a larger problem here is that, you know, D.C. is so military-industrial complex-focused that trying to kind of siphon off some of that energy and some of that money um, and some of that, you know, um, the energy to, to do something like that, it's, it's just so difficult. And it also taps into... Uh, you know, U.S. domestic economic debates, which is, you know, if, if you can avoid that as much as possible, like, by all means do. It's why so much of our foreign policy is just done, like, you know, directly by the White House so they don't have to worry about that. Like, you know, if what, you know, what, what if, like, you're like, okay, we're going to provide aid to Australian wine producers, and then people in the U.S., you know, the people who represent U.S. wine uh, producers are going to be like, what about us? We're losing out on this Chinese market that we would have otherwise, and you could, you know, why, why, are, you, why are you putting our taxpayer dollars towards this? It just becomes this huge debacle. Um, I'll try to answer your second questions, but 
uh, just want to make your second question in a little different way, is how successful is China to influence um, the, say that uh, uh, culture, West, Western culture, or say that Hollywood, right? Um, in certain way, and I think Bassanis, your, your book basically answered uh, his question because I just get it from Kindle the, the day before yesterday. I just glanced over it, sorry for that. But anyway, um, the point is, I think how successful it is for the Chinese to do that depends on, as Bassanis just mentioned, is the imagination of future market. The imagination of future market. It means that if China wants to open, or at least showing the other countries that you are getting more and more liberalized, and more and more open their market in the future, and there is a market chance for uh, op market opportunities for a lot of foreign countries, and they will have the power um, to ask the other countries to work with them, right? Because you know that, or oh, as a company in the future, if I say that Top Gun, I don't, I just remove the Taiwanese flag and in the future I can get um, the chance to put my um, movie, right, to get released in, in China, right? But if um, the otherwise, because Chinese are not doing that, they are not opening their market and the, the private firms and saying that maybe in the future I just cannot get in in the next 10 years, so why do I have to cooperate with you, right? And in that sense, I think these days Chinese are is losing a little bit their influence on that matters because they are not trying to open their cultural um, uh, market these days. They are trying to close it as Xi Jinping is getting in power these days. So to answer your question, um, I think um, the conclusion is I think they are losing a little bit cultural influence on that part. Thank you. Sorry, one second. I, I do. I want to go to a question from online, please. There's no. Question oh. No questions online? Okay, are there, um, sorry, one second, William. I wanna see if there are any other questions. If there aren't, aren't any, I will turn to one. I'm sorry, there's actually a couple of questions in the back. So if, if possible, let, can I collect the three questions and then I'll have the panelists answer uh, whatever question they have the bandwidth to do. So please, um, one back there first and then the middle and then the one in the back. Hi, Bill Wu, Wang uh, Xiu. Uh, we have a very, very exciting panel discussion on economic coercion today. I have two uh, simple questions. First, in Matthew's remark, the, uh, the EU's um, anti-coercion instrument is mentioned. So, um, so um, as Madame von der Leyen just arrived in the DC for the summit with the president, do you think about the, uh, how do you think the, uh, for the prospects for the transatlantic cooperation against the economic coercion against China? And second, uh, how do you see the feasibility of the NATO Article 5 in an economic sense uh, for the alliance to, against the China's economic coercion? Thank you. Sorry, let's collect the remaining two questions and then 30 seconds each for each of the panelists. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is David Ling and I'm affiliated with CIER and thank you for, uh, thank you for insightful perspective and I have a question um, about Bethany's new book, and sorry, it, um, I may be spoiler, but I'm curious about that. I saw there is an um, interesting heading is that chewing gum stuck to the button of the China's shoes. And I'm it makes me feel curious about that. What practical behavior can be the chewing gum stuck to the button of China's shoes? Thank you. Did you have a, did you have another question back there? If not, happy to just take these. Okay, please. Uh, um, if you don't mind, maybe since you're next to me, you'll go first, and then we'll just thirty seconds each on any question you want to uh, answer or any last thoughts from your end. You're good. Okay. Uh, just on on that. So that's a. I think it was it wasn't Hu Jintao who said that. It was was it Hu Jintao or was it the Chinese ambassador to Australia? I can't remember. After then Prime Minister of Australia Scott Morrison in April 2020 called for an independent inquiry into the origins of the coronavirus, that was a statement that either Hu Jintao or the Chinese ambassador made about Australia. So China, he was saying that Australia is chewing gum stuck to the bottom 
of uh, China's shoe. Not a very nice thing to say. Um, and uh, that was, I think, part of what later became the, the 14 demands or the, the 14 points that the Chinese government communicated to the Australian government, demanding essentially that the Australian government hand over a wide swaths of its sovereignty, uh, demanding that it stop media outlets from publishing so-called lies about Australia, uh, prevent think tanks from publishing uh, smears about China, um, sorry, yes, and, and other demands like that. So it's just, a, it was a reference to, uh, to, to that quote. Um, on the uh, US-EU uh, uh, cooperation on developing uh, something like ACI, I think uh, it remains to be to be seen whether this, this will take shape. But I think uh, the, uh, there will be a, a summit be between the US and, and the EU uh, next week, right? Yeah, and so I think uh, and one of possible uh, issues is to discuss uh, the joint action on uh, on China's uh, steel and aluminum. So I think uh, th this reflects a joint effort on the part of the US and, and the EU on Chin Chinese uh, economic uh, power or statecraft. And, and I think this is a, a, a very positive sign for us. And, and I would like to also go back to the previous question on cultural uh, uh, coercion. I think uh, the example you, you gave uh, is, is another, is in fact a, a kind of economic coercion at the firm level, that is the Chinese uh, firms using its market power to to uh, influence the decision of the an, an American uh, enterprise. And, I, and, and as, as Matthew mentioned, it is, I think it is more difficult to react, especially at the governmental level. But I think since you uh, uh, bring in the cultural the cultural element, I think it, maybe it is also uh, worth thinking about uh, a cultural response. I, I recall, uh, I think it's, it's Ambassador, Ambassador uh, Mitchell who, who uh, mentioned deterrence, defense, and dignity, right? And I think that the element of dignity is now playing a more and more important role in foreign policy, in, in policy making, especially in, the, uh, in Central and Eastern European context. And, and so uh, my counterparts in Lithuania and, and Czech Republic, for instance, they are saying that even if they are under Chinese economic and, and also political pressure or, or, or coercion, uh, what else can China, can China do against them? And I, I, I think uh, uh, in, the, in, in this part of the world, uh, dignity is, is now playing a more important role, and I think this is also a cultural uh, factor that can address uh, the issue of Chinese economic coercion. Thank you. Yeah, I'll just add real quickly on, on top of that. I think, you know, in the we go back, you know, five years ago or so. I think, going back that far, the EU has gone a long way with aligning its views on China with, with the U.S. and perhaps we would have thought of, uh, you know, with, with de-risking um, and the ACI. So I, I think, you know, you could be cautiously optimistic that there's could be more cooperation. But um, and right, if you look at the response to Lithuania uh, as a good example, the the U.S. did respond and, and send, I believe, a delegation. Uh, to Lithuania, and also I think there was some export financing that was uh, uh, discussed. So there's an, an example of like an ad hoc response from the U.S. to help an EU member state that is coursed uh, by China. But I'd go, I'd go back to like the the G7 statement. Uh, you know, there was in, in some ways it was good to see the the G7 uh, condemn economic coercion, but uh, I believe that statement did not include a direct reference to China. Uh, so and, it, and no binding commitments other than uh, coordinating. Uh, platform, so I think that sort of was disappointing for a lot of folks uh, who were expecting a bit more from that. Uh, so if that's any, uh, uh, if that you know could be a preview for EU US cooperation, I wouldn't be that optimistic. It, these are tough uh, problems, and it's tough to coordinate internationally. Uh, but I do think there is somewhat growing alignment anyway. So thank you, Matthew. I apologize we've gone over by two minutes, but I wanted to thank all four panelists for an excellent discussion, as well as some of the d debate and differences that we've highlighted. Thank you very much uh, to Dr. Lin for moderating this session, and thank you to all panelists. So let's put our hands together to thank our wonderful panel, and we would also like to invite the panelists to please come to the front for a group photo. So please, uh, let's take a photo down the stage. All right, yes. Just a second, and uh, when you are ready, please look at our photographer with a big smile. <laughs> Thank you.
thumbs up. <laughs> As always. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please take your seat. Thank you. And we want to thank all panelists in the three panels today, as well as the moderators for the very wonderful panels that we have. And to wrap up the discussions that we have today, uh, we would like to invite uh, Dr. Hui Xing Yan and Ms. Erin Murphy for concluding remarks. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome both Dr. Yan and Ms. Murphy. Well, good afternoon, everyone. And for folks online, good morning, good evening, wherever you are. So thank you so much for joining us today. Um, again, how I started this morning in my remarks, the topics that we covered today on digital trade, supply chains, and economic coercion, these aren't just issues that impact the US and Taiwan. These are issues that are top of mind for countries around the globe. And uh, what we discussed today is really primarily between the U.S. and Taiwan, but I think these are questions and issues that our uh, other countries are focused on as well. And when we say economic security is national security, uh, as our European colleagues pointed out, this is not a new idea, but this, this is a new mantra I think that we are hearing more often. Um, so we know it's the end of the day, um, so we're not going to try to repeat too much more about what's going on. Um, but I'll provide a little bit of an overview of uh, the first panel and then turn it over to my colleague to talk about the next panel and we'll just kind of go back and forth here. Um, and then of course do our thank yous to the various folks um, that have helped us today. But on digital trade, um, we talked a little bit about the agreements that are going forward, the 21st century, the US Taiwan 21st century trade agreement which builds on um, the agreements and the work that had been going on between the US and Taiwan since the AIT TECRO agreement in the 70s. Um, this is more binding agreement. This is a, there's going to be multiple phases of this agreement, but there were also other trade agreements and uh, uh, frameworks that have trade aspects, but um, don't have market access, a traditional trade agreement that either the US or Taiwan are not a part of. But that doesn't mean that these countries can't work together or that these economies can't work together and there can't be more regional cooperation. And I think our panelists provided some ideas that Taiwan and the United States and other partners in the region can work together on. Um, one option is DEPA, that there is non-binding principles there that economies can work together on, especially when it comes to digital trade, business and trade facilitation, data issues, building a wider trust environment, and that's certainly a, a part and parcel of what the 21st Century Trade Agreement is about, but also what IPEF is about as well, that the ministerial text is focusing on building a trusted environment to focus on the economies of the future and to have that built out digital identities, innovation in the digital economy, and SMEs. And I think one thing, um, if folks weren't aware of this before, but how strong and how massive Taiwan's SME um, community is, more than 90%, that, that's enormous. That's truly a backbone of this economy. And what a unique aspect is for Taiwan's SMEs is that it's not, they're not just located in Taiwan, that they're located overseas as well. And I think that that really is quite interesting, but also shows the importance of digital trade for Taiwan's economy, but also for its SMEs, cross-border payments, um, access to privacy. And as the digital, um, sorry, as the deputy minister mentioned in his comments, in protecting customer data and customer information that we need to be able to work both within economies, but also overseas to protect that type of data. Um, using APEC 
APEC is coming up next month. There's a lot to look out for. What are we going to see negotiated in uh, the IPEF framework? Uh, it's the digital trade piece, that pillar, that is the one that is least put together. And as Dr. Seawright pointed out, um, it's, it's the U.S. that's the problem. Well, big shock there, um, considering how our uh, whole political spectrum is looking at the moment. But APEC, um, from what we've heard from U.S. government officials and from APEC member countries and economies, they want APEC to actually stop coming up with roadmaps and lists and whatnot, but to actually function and implement what these roadmaps are and use it as a leverage. So this is one area that Taiwan can use as well um, to work. But basically, what a lot of these agreements are looking to do and what we can do on digital trade is to advance outcomes that benefit workers, and that's a huge policy and a goal for the United States, but given what Taiwan's SME community looks like, is a big goal for them as well. So I think that this is something that we can work on. Um, you know, also, a lot of discussion around Taiwan not being part of IPEF, and I think one of the solutions, or at least interim discussions that we talked about was that you don't have to be part of IPEF, but the language is out there in what it takes to be a member country. So Taiwan is already doing a lot of the steps that are already there. Its economy is already following the rules and regulations. Um, you're already taking the steps on CPTPP that also align with what IPEF requires as well um, to be a good steward, to be transparent. So these are the things that, we'll be, that IPEF will be looking for as well. But it's also building unofficial ties. You know, I think we discussed this more in the economic coercion panel, um, but building those economic ties, um, I think as we'll also see in the supply chain panel as well, Taiwan has a lot to offer. Um, it has a lot to offer in terms of, of workers, a skilled workforce, in its products, in its economy, um, but in soft power as well, and as our U.S. participants have uh, eagerly participated in since we have been here. Um, so anyway, I think there's a lot for us to build on from that discussion, and so I'll turn it over on the supply chain discussion. Okay, uh, I think, I hope you have enjoyed uh, this uh, seminar as much as I, I have. And uh, I, I believe we all have better understanding in those uh, important issues. Um, as for the uh, supply chain uh, session I moderated this morning, uh, I think, uh, of course, we learned a lot from our uh, panelists that uh, we need to invest more for our uh, uh, future, I mean, for our talents, for future, our engineering, and of course, and. Uh, uh, research and development that is the, the way to facilitate our uh, business that can remain competitiveness in the future in the uh, supply chain reconfiguration. But um, I think beyond that, I, I would like to uh, give some quick point that uh, we do not, uh, I, I want to uh, wrap up some uh, additional comments that about the supply chain issues that we did, we did not uh, touch upon a lot. That is uh, Taiwan's partic participation in the Indo-Pacific uh, economic framework. Uh, I think from, I know it appears that both uh, Washington and Taipei consider uh, Taiwan, U.S. Taiwan uh, 21st uh, trade initiative is kind of a bilateral version of IPF. But it is true that uh, parts of the issues, particularly for the pillar one of IPF, uh, it, it is in some way is identical for the it, uh, topics that are covered in U.S.-Taiwan trade initiatives. But the, the thing is that IPF ne negotiation move out of this uh, pillar one. They have uh, IPF, uh, I mean supply chain receiving agreement that is going on. And that is not covered in U.S.-Taiwan trade initiative negotiation. And I would think that particularly we found that um, there is, from the initial scope, 
of IPEF supply chain agreement, they agreed uh, there is a key mechanism regarding supply chain crisis response network. That is um, mainly an emergency uh, communication mechanism that to, uh, address, to prevent the risks of a future uh, supply chain disruption and also to provide some, some uh, uh, a mechanism or platform to exchange uh, information between all parties. And I think the important thing is if Taiwan is not part of this uh, emergency information sharing system, then after all, Taiwan is the world's leading hub of professional country manufacturing. We produce products ranging from ICT to uh, ma machinery and to full wares to uh, sports, sports uh, wares. So uh, simply put, without Taiwan, the supply chain emergency response mechanism will be showed off parts of information source. So uh, we would suggest that, or we, we encourage that uh, the United States could be, could play more a bridging role. We can, you, uh, we can start some thing, some agreement like uh, supply chain, supply chain agreement. I mean, according to the version of IPF supply chain agreement, and from this kind of uh, co collaboration, we can share information to the United States, and of course the other way around. So uh, I think Taiwan is ready to share information no matter regionally or bilaterally, if it is uh, reciprocal. So uh, I think that is the point I want to uh, make for this uh, uh, supply chain sessions. And finally on our economic coercion panel, um, I think that this is, again, top of mind for policymakers around the globe. And there's one point that I would like to pick up. I mean, the cultural coercion is obviously very interesting. I'm reminded of, I started off my career as a Japan hand and recall that uh, Hollywood was also very interested in ensuring that we capture the Japanese market. So you would see either product placement or some sort of Japanese references in movies. And you still sometimes see that. but. You know, after I lived in Japan, I'm like, oh, look, there's a reference, there's a reference. And now, you know, I see it quite a lot uh, with China and even some that are just so clumsily placed, it's almost comical. But, but this multilateralization in whether you're going to do one of the two schools of thoughts, whether it's the economic NATO or building resiliency um, and cooperation, it all sounds nice on paper. Coming from um, the formerly a development finance world, this idea of doing co-financing or joint financing so that we could uh, pool our capital to help finance infrastructure projects to combat or counter BRI, it all sounds good on paper, but what it also comes down to is competition. Because there are very few viable bankable projects in critical areas, including the Pacific Islands, in ASEAN, in any of these critical areas, I mean, I was mostly focused on Indo-Pacific, but this extends to Latin America and Africa as well. So it all sounds good, but Bethany made an excellent point when it comes to your constituencies. Of course, what's the first thing you're gonna see? Okay, Australian winemakers are suddenly at a disadvantage. If you are a US winemaker, you see a huge opportunity in a huge market with a growing consumer class that suddenly likes wine. So you could suddenly have you know, a small community of 50 million people who want to drink your Napa Valley wine. That's huge, so why would you say no to that? And so patriotism you know, looks different, um, but you, know, you could say Australia is our ally. Well, that only goes so far. Um, you know, I also appreciate the Australians in supporting our Japanese friends by eating Fukushima fish and whatnot, but again, it's, it's going to be difficult to try to enforce that. Um, it's very difficult in development finance. Um, it's, we all had different metrics of success. 
we also have very um, different policies that have been instituted for so long, it would almost take burning it down and building it up again and changing mindsets for some of this to work, whether it's campaign finance or other things. Um, so it's going to be challenging, especially on the competitive front, and there is going to have to either be an incentive structure for that or um, building up what national security also means for business, but that really, at least on the United States front, treads a fine line uh, between you know, separation of government. We don't want to have state-owned enterprises ourselves. We want businesses to be um, independent, but they also need support as well if we're going to have these types of policies. So it will be interesting to see how this develops, whether there's some sort of hybrid approach, whether there's some sort of fund that victims of economic coercion can, be, can tap going forward. Um, but it will be interesting to see how this goes because we don't expect it to ebb anytime soon. It will only grow, um, especially as China uh, gathers more confidence in what it can do. It's a mixed bag now as, again, I, I think we plugged this report multiple times. It's published in March. Go on the website, csis.org. Um, but you'll see it's been a mixed bag, but it won't always be. And so what are we going to do in the future? And I think that we've had several ideas. And again, as we do plugs, Bethany's book obviously has some recommendations as well. I wrote a book too, but it was about Burma, but you don't have to read that. Okay. Also on Amazon. Um, <laughs> anybody else written a book? Do you want me to make any plugs, good recipes or anything? Um, anyway. um, but so we have some ideas, but authoritarian economic statecraft, that's an interesting term for this, but these are ideas that we're going to have to think about more creatively and have to make some difficult decisions and have to change our policy and, and how we either approach governments, approach business, and vice versa. So that's the point I want to make there. May I also want to make a point about the yes. final Please. issue. Uh, as for the final topic uh, about economic coercion, I believe, I mean, from Taiwan's experience, I believe the risking approach is the likely to be the good solution to in responding, in responding to being target of uh, coercion. So for that, I think Taiwan uh, is a leader in economic de-risking against China. I will recap some uh, figures that probably have mentioned in uh, in our supply chain uh, uh, session. For in terms of investment, uh, you can see manufacturing investment from Taiwan to China. We used to have like 80% uh, of Taiwan's outbound investment to China in 2010. We, we have 80% of Taiwan's outbound investment went to China. But in 2022, we decrease that trend decreased to 33%. Only three, China only accounts for Taiwan's 33% uh, foreign direct investment, overall, overall uh, outbound uh, investment. The decreasing trend continues in this year. We only have, for January to August, China only accounts for 80%, one eight, 80% 80 of Taiwan's outbound investments. And in terms of trade, as my colleague, uh, Dr. Yang, just mentioned about our agricultural, uh, after China repeatedly usage of uh, coercion action ag against agricultural products, diversifying export uh, markets from China is the main strategy for Taiwan, Taiwanese government and also our uh, Taiwanese farmers. In 2022, until uh, July, China only accounts to 9.1% uh, of the average agricultural products exports from 23% and even for the uh, mango product that is recently uh, subject to the coercion, the, we only, we, uh, we used to sell uh, mangoes to China around around 10 million US dollars in 1918, uh, 19, uh, 2019. But we only have 1.75, uh, 
1.71 million this year, just before he take coercion on our mango. So I mean, that is all the truth that, uh, or the fact that how Taiwan responds to China's coercion by our, uh, by our way, by Taiwanese way. And we find a way to survive and to diversify our markets. And I think, looking to the future, uh, China may still be one of our main uh, exporting countries or uh, exporting, exporting partners. But uh, with, with the acceleration of the uh, global supply chain reform process, I think China's proportion of Taiwan's export market uh, is expected to decrease as China is kind of uh, losing more manufacturing and export dominates as world factory. So I think I will just stop here. All right, well, thank you everyone. Um, the first thanks, and I, I would like everyone to give a big round of applause to Dr. Yen and to her team at CIER. Um, they've been a wonderful co-organizer, really have brought together a great thank program. You. I have a great team here. That's all devoted to, to yeah. them. Um, her entire team has been fantastic. Uh, great MC, thank you for your work today. Um, uh, also, a big thanks to Coupang again for their generous support for supporting CSIS and helping us pull this together as well. So thank you to Coupang for supporting this program. Uh, we believe in the work that is being done here and the topics that we're covering. This work is only gonna get more important, so we're hoping to continue the coverage here. So thank you to Coupang as well. Um, also a big thank you to the US participants that we flew all the way here. Um, you're staying strong, you're still awake, uh, you look lively and well, so, well, most of us. Um, so thank you so much for coming. And of course, thank you to our Taiwan participants for joining us in this discussion and to our audience and online audience for staying with us. Thank you. Thank you very much to Ms. Murphy and Dr. Yan for your wonderful concluding remarks. Thank you. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our seminar on digital trade, supply chains, and economic security. Thank you very much once again for your participation. Just a few housekeeping items uh, before we officially close the session. For those who have borrowed interpretation devices, please remember to return it and get your ID back. And also, the organizer has prepared a snack box boxes for everyone, uh, which is at the uh, recep reception desk outside. So please remember to bring one with you before you leave. All right. Thank you once again for everyone's participation. We wish you all the best, and we wish our foreign friends here a wonderful stay during your visit in Taiwan. Thank you. Goodbye.